The Client by John Grisham Chapter 1 Mark was eleven and had been smoking off and on for two years, never trying to quit, but being careful not to get hooked. He preferred Cools, his ex-father's brand, but his mother smoked Virginia Slims at the rate of two packs a day, and he could, in an average week, pilfer ten or twelve from her. She was a busy woman with many problems, perhaps a little naive when it came to her boys, and she never dreamed her eldest would be smoking at the age of eleven. Occasionally, Kevin, the delinquent two streets over, would sell Mark a pack of stolen Marlboros for a dollar, but for the most part he had to rely on his mother's skinny cigarettes. He had four of them in his pocket this afternoon as he led his brother Ricky, age eight, down the path into the woods behind their trailer park. Ricky was nervous about this, his first smoke. He had caught Mark hiding the cigarettes in a shoebox under his bed yesterday and threatened to tell all if his big brother didn't show him how to do it. They sneaked along the wooded trail headed for one of Mark's secret spots where he'd spent many solitary hours trying to inhale and blow smoke rings. Most of the other kids in the neighborhood were into beer and pot, two vices Mark was determined to avoid. Their ex-father was an alcoholic who'd beaten both boys and their mother, and the beatings always followed his nasty bouts with beer. Mark had seen and felt the effects of alcohol. He was also afraid of drugs. "'Are you lost?' Ricky asked, just like a little brother, as they left the trail and waded through chest-high weeds. "'Just shut up,' Mark said without slowing." The only time their father had spent at home was to drink and sleep and abuse them. He was gone now, thank heavens. For five years Mark had been in charge of Ricky. He felt like an eleven-year-old father. He taught him how to throw a football and ride a bike. He'd explained what he knew about sex. He'd warned him about drugs and protected him from bullies. And he felt terrible about this introduction to vice, but it was just a cigarette. It could be much worse. The weeds stopped, and they were under a large tree with a rope hanging from a thick branch. A row of bushes yielded to a small clearing, and beyond it an overgrown dirt road disappeared over a hill. A highway could be heard in the distance. Mark stopped and pointed to a log near the rope. "'Sit there,' he instructed. And Ricky obediently backed onto the log and glanced around anxiously, as if the police might be watching." Mark eyed him like a drill sergeant while picking a cigarette from his shirt pocket. He held it with his right thumb and index finger and tried to be casual about it. "'You know the rules,' he said, looking down at Ricky. There were only two rules, and they had discussed them a dozen times during the day, and Ricky was frustrated at being treated like a child. He rolled his eyes away and said, "'Yeah, if I tell anyone you'll beat me up. That's right.' Ricky folded his arms. "'And I can smoke only one a day.' "'That's right. "'If I catch you smoking more than that, then you're in trouble. "'And if I find out you're drinking beer or messing with drugs, "'then I know, I know you'll beat me up again.' "'Right. "'How many do you smoke a day?' "'Only one,' Mark lied. "'Some days only one. "'Some days three or four, depending on supply.' "'He stuck the filter between his lips like a gangster. "'Will one a day kill me?' Ricky asked. Mark removed the cigarette from his lips. Not any time soon. One a day is pretty safe. More than that, you could be in trouble. How many does Mom smoke a day? Two packs. How many is that? Forty. Wow, then she's in big trouble. Mom's got all kinds of troubles. I don't think she's worried about cigarettes. How many does Dad smoke a day? Four or five packs. A hundred a day. Ricky grinned slightly. And he's going to die soon, right? I hope so. Between staying drunk and chain smoking, he'll be dead in a few years. What's chain smoking? It's when you light the new one with the old one. I wish he'd smoke ten packs a day. Me too. Ricky glanced toward the small clearing in the dirt road. It was shady and cool under the tree, but beyond the limbs, the sun was bright. Mark pinched the filter with his thumb and index finger and sort of waved it before his mouth. "'Are you scared?' he sneered, as only big brothers can. "'No, I think you are. "'Look, hold it like this, okay?' 
He waved it closer, then with great drama withdrew it and stuck it between his lips. Ricky watched intently. Mark lit the cigarette, puffed a tiny cloud of smoke, then held it and admired it. Don't try to swallow the smoke. You're not ready for that yet. Just suck a little, then blow the smoke out. Are you ready? Will it make me sick? It will if you swallow the smoke. He took two quick drags and puffed for effect. See, it's really easy. I'll teach you how to inhale later. Okay. Ricky nervously reached out with his thumb and index finger, and Mark placed the cigarette carefully between them. Go ahead. Ricky eased the wet filter to his lips. His hand shook, and he took a short drag and blew smoke. Another short drag. The smoke never got past his front teeth. Another drag. Mark watched carefully, hoping he would choke and cough and turn blue, then get sick and never smoke again. It's easy, Ricky said proudly as he held a cigarette and admired it. His hand was shaking. It's no big deal. Tastes kind of funny. Yeah, yeah. Mark sat next to him on the log and picked another one from his pocket. Ricky puffed rapidly. Mark lit his, and they sat in silence under the tree, enjoying a quiet smoke. This is fun, Ricky said, nibbling at the filter. Great. Then why are your hands shaking? They're not sure. Ricky ignored this. He leaned forward with his elbows on his knees, took a longer drag, then spat in the dirt like he'd seen Kevin and the big boys do behind the trailer park. This was easy. Mark opened his mouth into a perfect circle and attempted a smoke ring. He thought this would really impress his little brother, but the ring failed to form and the gray smoke dissipated. I think you're too young to smoke, he said. Ricky was busy puffing and spitting and thoroughly enjoying this giant step toward manhood. How old were you when you started, he asked. Nine, but I was more mature than you. You always say that. That's because it's always true. They sat next to each other on the log under the tree, smoking quietly and staring at the grassy clearing beyond the shade. Mark was, in fact, more mature than Ricky at the age of eight. He was more mature than any kid his age. He'd always been mature. He had hit his father with a baseball bat when he was seven. The aftermath had not been pretty, but the drunken idiot had stopped beating their mother. There had been many fights and many beatings, and Diane Sway had sought refuge and advice from her eldest son. They had consoled each other and conspired to survive. They had cried together after the beatings. They had plotted ways to protect Ricky. When he was nine, Mark convinced her to file for divorce. He had called the cops when his father showed up drunk after being served with divorce papers. He had testified in court about the abuse and neglect and beatings. He was very mature. Ricky heard the car first. There was a low rushing sound coming from the dirt road. Then Mark heard it and they stopped smoking. Just sit still, Mark said softly. They did not move. A long, black, shiny Lincoln appeared over the slight hill and eased toward them. The weeds in the road were as high as the front bumper. Mark dropped his cigarette to the ground and covered it with his shoe. Ricky did the same. The car slowed almost to a stop as it neared the clearing, then circled around, touching the tree limbs as it moved slowly. It stopped and faced the road. The boys were directly behind it and hidden from view. Mark slid off the log and crawled through the weeds to a row of brush at the edge of the clearing. Ricky followed. The rear of the Lincoln was thirty feet away. They watched it carefully. It had Louisiana license plates. "'What's he doing?' Ricky whispered. Mark peeked through the weeds. "'Shh!' He had heard stories around the trailer park of teenagers using these woods to meet girls and smoke pot, but this car did not belong to a teenager. The engine quit, and the car just sat there in the weeds for a minute. Then the door opened, and the driver stepped into the weeds and looked around. He was a chubby man in a black suit. His head was fat and round and without hair, except for neat rows above the ears and a black and gray beard. He stumbled to the rear of the car, fumbled with the keys, and finally opened the trunk. He removed a water hose, 
stuck one end into the exhaust pipe and ran the other end through a crack in the left rear window. He closed the trunk, looked around again as if he were expecting to be watched, then disappeared into the car. The engine started. Wow, Mark said softly, staring blankly at the car. What's he doing? Ricky asked. He's trying to kill himself. Ricky raised his head a few inches for a better view. I don't understand, Mark. Keep down. You see the hose, right? The fumes from the tailpipe go into the car and it kills him. You mean suicide? Right. I saw a guy do it like this in a movie once. They leaned closer to the weeds and stared at the hose running from the pipe to the window. The engine idled smoothly. Why does he want to kill himself? Ricky asked. How am I supposed to know? But we got to do something. Yeah, let's get the hell out of here. No, just be still a minute. I'm leaving, Mark. You can watch him die if you want to, but I'm gone. Mark grabbed his brother's shoulder and forced him lower. Ricky's breathing was heavy, and they were both sweating. The sun hid behind a cloud. How long does it take? Ricky asked, his voice quivering. Not very long. Mark released his brother and eased onto all fours. You stay here, okay? If you move, I'll kick your tail. What are you doing, Mark? Just stay here. I mean it. Mark lowered his thin body almost to the ground and crawled on elbows and knees through the weeds toward the car. The grass was dry and at least two feet tall. He knew the man couldn't hear him, but he worried about the movement of the weeds. He stayed directly behind the car and slid snake-like on his belly until he was in the shadow of the trunk. He reached and carefully eased the hose from the tailpipe and dropped it to the ground. He retraced his trail with a bit more speed, and seconds later was crouched next to Ricky, watching and waiting in the heavier grass and brush under the outermost limbs of the tree. He knew that if they were spotted, they could dart past the tree and down their trail and be gone before the chubby man could catch them. They waited. Five minutes passed, though it seemed like an hour. You think he's dead? Ricky whispered, his voice dry and weak. I don't know. Suddenly the door opened and the man stepped out. He was crying and mumbling and he staggered to the rear of the car where he saw the hose in the grass and cursed it as he shoved it back into the tailpipe. He held a bottle of whiskey and looked around wildly at the trees, then stumbled back into the car. He mumbled to himself as he slammed the door. The boys watched in horror. He's crazy as hell, Mark said faintly. Let's get out of here, Ricky said. We can't. If he kills himself and we saw it and knew about it, then we could get in all kinds of trouble. Ricky raised his head as if to retreat. Then we won't tell anybody. Come on, Mark. Mark grabbed his shoulder again and forced him to the ground. Just stay down. We're not leaving until I say we're leaving. Ricky closed his eyes tightly and started crying. Mark shook his head in disgust, but he didn't take his eyes off the car. Little brothers were more trouble than they were worth. Stop it, he growled through clenched teeth. I'm scared. Fine, just don't move, okay, do you hear me? Don't move and stop the crying. Mark was back on his elbows deep in the weeds and preparing to ease through the tall grass once more. Just let him die, Mark, Ricky whispered between sobs. Mark glared at him over his shoulder and eased toward the car, which was still running. He crawled along his same trail of lightly trampled grass so slowly and carefully that even Ricky, with dry eyes now, could barely see him. Ricky watched the driver's door, waiting for it to fly open and the crazy man to lunge out and kill Mark. He perched on his toes in a sprinter's stance for a quick getaway through the woods. He saw Mark emerge under the rear bumper, place a hand for balance on the taillight, and slowly ease the hose from the tailpipe. The grass crackled softly, and the weeds shook a little, and Mark was next to him again, panting and sweating and oddly smiling to himself. They sat on their legs like two insects under the brush and watched the car. What if he comes out again? Ricky asked. 
What if he sees us? He can't see us. But if he starts this way, just follow me. We'll be gone before he can take a step. Why don't we go now? Mark stared at him fiercely. I'm trying to save his life, okay? Maybe. Just maybe he'll see that this is not working, and maybe he'll decide he should wait or something. Why is that so hard to understand? Because he's crazy. If he'll kill himself, then he'll kill us. Why is that so hard to understand? Mark shook his head in frustration, and suddenly the door opened again. The man rolled out of the car, growling and talking to himself, and stomped through the grass to the rear. He grabbed the end of the hose, stared at it as if it just wouldn't behave, and looked slowly around the small clearing. He was breathing heavily and perspiring. He looked at the trees, and the boys eased to the ground. He looked down and froze, as if he suddenly understood. The grass was slightly trampled around the rear of the car, and he knelt as if to inspect it, but then crammed the hose back into the tailpipe instead and hurried back to his door. If someone was watching from the trees, he seemed not to care. He just wanted to hurry up and die. The two heads rose together above the brush, but just a few inches. They peeked through the weeds for a long minute. Ricky was ready to run, but Mark was thinking. Mark, please, let's go, Ricky pleaded. He almost saw us. What if he's got a gun or something? If he had a gun, he'd use it on himself. Ricky bit his lip and his eyes watered again. He had never won an argument with his brother, and he would not win this one. Another minute passed, and Mark began to fidget. I'll try one more time, okay? And if he doesn't give up, then we'll get out of here, I promise, okay? Ricky nodded reluctantly. His brother stretched on his stomach and inched his way through the weeds into the tall grass. Ricky wiped the tears from his cheek with his dirty fingers. The lawyer's nostrils flared as he inhaled mightily. He exhaled slowly and stared through the windshield while trying to determine if any of the precious deadly gas had entered his blood and begun its work. A loaded pistol was on the seat next to him. A half-empty fifth of Jack Daniels was in his hand. He took a sip, screwed the cap on it, and placed it on the seat. He inhaled slowly and closed his eyes to savor the gas. Would he simply drift away? Would it hurt or burn or make him sick before it finished him off? The note was on the dash above the steering wheel next to a bottle of pills. He cried and talked to himself as he waited for the gas to hurry, damn it, before he'd give up and use the gun. He was a coward, but a very determined one, and he much preferred this sniffing and floating away to sticking a gun in his mouth. He sipped the whiskey and hissed as it burned on its descent. Yes, it was finally working. Soon it would all be over, and he smiled at himself in the mirror because it was working, and he was dying, and he was not a coward after all. It took guts to do this. He cried and muttered as he removed the cap of the whiskey bottle for one last swallow. He gulped, and it ran from his lips and trickled into his beard. He would not be missed. And although this thought should have been painful, the lawyer was calmed by the knowledge that no one would grieve. His mother was the only person in the world who loved him, and she'd been dead four years, so this would not hurt her. There was a child from the first disastrous marriage, a daughter he'd not seen in eleven years, but he'd been told she had joined a cult and was as crazy as her mother. It would be a small funeral. A few lawyer buddies and perhaps a judge or two would be there, all dressed up in dark suits and whispering importantly as the piped-in organ music drifted around the near-empty chapel. No tears. The lawyers would sit and glance at their watches, while the minister, a stranger, sped through the standard comments used for dear departed ones who never went to church. It would be a ten-minute job with no frills. The note on the dash required the body to be cremated. "'Wow!' he said softly as he took another sip. He turned the bottle up, and while gulping, glanced in the rearview mirror and saw the weeds move behind the car. Ricky saw the door open before Mark heard it. 
It flew open as if kicked, and suddenly the large, heavy man with the red face was running through the weeds, holding onto the car and growling. Ricky stood in shock and fear and wet his pants. Mark had just touched the bumper when he heard the door. He froze for a second, gave a quick thought to crawling under the car, and the hesitation nailed him. His foot slipped as he tried to stand and run, and the man grabbed him. "'You, you little bastard!' he screamed as he grabbed Mark's hair and flung him onto the trunk of the car. "'You little bastard!' Mark kicked and squirmed, and a fat hand slapped him in the face. He kicked once more, not as violently, and he got slapped again. Mark stared at the wild, glowing face just inches away. The eyes were red and wet. Fluids dripped from the nose and chin. "'You little bastard!' he growled through clenched, dirty teeth. When he had him pinned and still and subdued, the lawyer stuck the hose back into the exhaust pipe, then yanked Mark off the trunk by his collar and dragged him through the weeds to the driver's door, which was open. He threw the kid through the door and shoved him across the black leather seat. Mark was grabbing at the door handle and searching for the door lock switch when the man fell behind the steering wheel. He slammed the door behind him, pointed at the door handle, and screamed, Don't touch that! Then he backhanded Mark in the left eye with a vicious slap. Mark shrieked in pain, grabbed his eyes, and bent over, stunned, crying now. His nose hurt like hell, and his mouth hurt worse. He was dizzy. He tasted blood. He could hear the man crying and growling. He could smell the whiskey and see the knees of his dirty blue jeans with his right eye. The left was beginning to swell. Things were blurred. The fat lawyer gulped his whiskey and stared at Mark, who was all bent over and shaking at every joint. Stop crying, he snarled. Mark licked his lips and swallowed blood. He rubbed the knot above his eye and tried to breathe deeply, still staring at his jeans. Again, the man said, Stop crying! So he tried to stop. The engine was running. It was a big, heavy, quiet car, but Mark could hear the engine humming very softly somewhere far away. He turned slowly and glanced at the hose winding through the rear window behind the driver like an angry snake sneaking toward them for the kill. The fat man laughed. "'I think we should die together,' he announced, all of a sudden very composed. Mark's left eye was swelling fast. He turned his shoulders and looked squarely at the man, who was even larger now. His face was chubby, the beard was bushy, the eyes were still red and glowed at him like a demon in the dark. Mark was crying. "'Please let me out of here,' he said, lip quivering, voice cracking. The driver stuck the whiskey bottle in his mouth and turned it up. He grimaced and smacked his lips. "'Sorry, kid. You had to be a cute ass. Had to stick your dirty little nose into my business, didn't you? So I think we should die together, okay? Just you and me, pal, off to La La Land, off to see the wizard. Sweet dreams, kid.' Mark sniffed the air, then noticed the pistol lying between them. He glanced away, then stared at it when the man took another drink from the bottle. "'You want the gun?' the man asked. "'No, sir.' "'So why are you looking at it?' "'I wasn't. Don't lie to me, kid, because if you do, I'll kill you. I'm crazy as hell, okay, and I'll kill you.' Though tears flowed freely from his eyes, his voice was very calm. He breathed deeply as he spoke. And besides, kid, if we're going to be pals, you've got to be honest with me. Honesty is very important, you know. Now, do you want the gun? No, sir. Would you like to pick up the gun and shoot me with it? No, sir. I'm not afraid of dying, kid. You understand? Yes, sir, but I don't want to die. I take care of my mother and my little brother. Oh, ain't that sweet, a real man of the house. He screwed the cap onto the whiskey bottle, then suddenly grabbed the pistol, stuck it deep into his mouth, curled his lips around it, and looked at Mark, who watched every move, hoping he would pull the trigger, and hoping he wouldn't. Slowly he withdrew the barrel from his mouth, kissed the end of it, then pointed it at Mark. I've never shot this thing, you know. 
he said, almost in a whisper. Just bought it an hour ago at a pawn shop in Memphis. You think it'll work? Please let me out of here. You have a choice, kid, he said, inhaling the invisible fumes. I'll blow your brains out and it's over now, or the gas will get you. Your choice. Mark did not look at the pistol. He sniffed the air and thought for an instant that maybe he smelled something. The gun was close to his head. Why are you doing this? he asked. None of your damn business, okay, kid? I'm nuts, okay? Over the edge. I planned a nice little private suicide, you know, just me and my hose and maybe a few pills and some whiskey. Nobody looking for me. But no, you have to get cute, you little bastard. He lowered the pistol and carefully placed it on the seat. Mark rubbed the knot on his forehead and bit his lip. His hands were shaking, and he pressed them between his legs. "'We'll be dead in five minutes,' he announced officially as he raised the bottle to his lips. "'Just you and me, pal. Off to see the wizard.' Ricky finally moved. His teeth chattered and his jeans were wet, but he was thinking now, moving from his crouch onto his hands and knees and sinking into the grass. He crawled toward the car, crying and gritting his teeth as he slid on his stomach. The door was about to fly open. The crazy man, who was large but quick, would leap from nowhere and grab him by the neck just like Mark, and they'd all die in the long black car. Slowly, inch by inch, he pushed his way through the weeds. Mark slowly lifted the pistol with both hands. It was as heavy as a brick. It shook as he raised it and pointed it at the fat man, who leaned toward it until the barrel was an inch from his nose. "'Now, pull the trigger, kid,' he said with a smile, his wet face glowing and dancing with delightful anticipation. "'Pull the trigger, and I'll be dead, and you go free.' Mark curled a finger around the trigger. The man nodded, then leaned even closer and bit the tip of the barrel with flashing teeth. "'Pull the trigger!' he shouted. Mark closed his eyes and pressed the handle of the gun with the palm of his hands. He held his breath and was about to squeeze the trigger when the man jerked it from him. He waved it wildly in front of Mark's face and pulled the trigger. Mark screamed as the window behind his head cracked into a thousand pieces but did not shatter. "'It works! It works!' he yelled as Mark ducked and covered his ears. Ricky buried his face in the grass when he heard the shot. He was ten feet from the car when something popped and Mark yelled. The fat man was yelling and Ricky peed on himself again. He closed his eyes and clutched the weeds. His stomach cramped and his heart pounded and for a minute after the gunshot he did not move. He cried for his brother who was dead now, shot by a crazy man. Stop crying, damn it, I'm sick of your crying. Mark clutched his knees and tried to stop crying. His head pounded and his mouth was dry. He stuck his hands between his knees and bent over. He had to stop crying and think of something. On a television show once, some nut was about to jump off a building, and this cool cop just kept talking to him and talking to him, and finally the nut started talking back and, of course, did not jump. Mark quickly smelled for gas and asked, "'Why are you doing this?' "'Because I want to die,' the man said calmly. "'Why?' he asked again, glancing at the neat little round hole in his window. "'Why do kids ask so many questions?' "'Because we're kids. "'Why do you want to die?' "'He could barely hear his own words. "'Look, kid, we'll be dead in five minutes, okay? "'Just you and me, pal. "'Off to see the wizard.' He took a long drink from the bottle, now almost empty. I feel the gas, kid. You feel it? Finally? In the side mirror through the cracks in the window, Mark saw the weeds move and caught a glimpse of Ricky as he slithered through the weeds and ducked into the bushes near the tree. He closed his eyes and said a prayer. I gotta tell you, kid, it's nice having you here. No one wants to die alone. 
What's your name? Mark. Mark who? Mark Sway. Keep talking and maybe the nut won't jump. What's your name? Jerome. But you can call me Romy. That's what my friends call me. And since you and I are pretty tight now, you can call me Romy. No more questions, okay, kid? Why do you want to die, Romy? I said no more questions. You feel the gas, Mark? I don't know. You will soon enough. Better say your prayers. Romy sank low into the seat with his beefy head straight back and eyes closed, completely at ease. We got about five minutes, Mark. Any last words? The whiskey bottle was in his right hand, the gun in his left. Yeah. Why are you doing this? Mark asked, glancing at the mirror for another sign of his brother. He took short, quick breaths through the nose, and neither smelled nor felt anything. Surely Ricky had removed the hose. Because I'm crazy. Just another crazy lawyer, right? I've been driven crazy, Mark. And how old are you? Eleven. Ever tasted whiskey? No, Mark answered truthfully. Suddenly the whiskey bottle was in his face and he took it. Take a shot, Romy said without opening his eyes. Mark tried to read the label, but his left eye was virtually closed and his ears were ringing from the gunshot and he couldn't concentrate. He sat the bottle on the seat where Romy took it without a word. We're dying, Mark, he said almost to himself. I guess that's tough at age eleven, but so be it. Nothing I can do about it. Any last words, big boy? Mark told himself that Ricky had done the trick, that the hose was now harmless, that his new friend Romy here was drunk and crazy, and that if he survived, he would have to do so by thinking and talking. The air was clean. He breathed deeply and told himself that he could make it. What made you crazy? Romy thought for a second and decided this was humorous. He snorted and actually chuckled a little. Oh, this is great. Perfect. For weeks now, I've known something no one else in the entire world knows except my client, who's a real piece of scum, by the way. You see, Mark, lawyers hear all sorts of private stuff that we can never repeat. Strictly confidential, you understand. No way we can ever tell what happened to the money or who's sleeping with who or where the body's buried, you follow? He inhaled mightily and exhaled with enormous pleasure. He sank lower in the seat, eyes still closed. Sorry I had to slap you. He curled his finger around the trigger. Mark closed his eyes and felt nothing. How old are you, Mark? Eleven? You told me that. Eleven. And I'm forty-four. We're both too young to die, aren't we, Mark? Yes, sir. But it's happening, pal. You feel it? Yes, sir. My client killed a man and hid the body. And now my client wants to kill me. That's the whole story. Dave made me crazy. <laughs> this is great, Mark. This is wonderful. I, the trusted lawyer, can now tell you, literally seconds before we float away, where the body is. The body, Mark, the most notorious undiscovered corpse of our time. Unbelievable. I can finally tell. His eyes were open and glowing down at Mark. This is funny as hell, Mark. Mark missed the humor. He glanced at the mirror, then at the door lock switch a foot away. The handle was even closer. Romy relaxed again and closed his eyes, as if trying desperately to take a nap. I'm sorry about this, kid. Really sorry. But like I said, it's nice to have you here. He slowly placed the bottle on the dash next to the note and moved the pistol from his left hand to his right caressing it softly and stroking the trigger with his index finger. Mark tried not to look. 
I'm really sorry about this kid. How old are you? Eleven. You've asked me three times. Shut up. I feel the gas now, don't you? Quit sniffing, damn it. It's odorless, you little dumbass. You can't smell it. I'd be dead now and you'd be off playing G.I. Joe if you hadn't been so cute. You're pretty stupid, you know. Not as stupid as you, thought Mark. Who did your client kill? Romy grinned, but did not open his eyes. A United States senator. I'm telling. I'm telling. I'm spilling my guts. You read newspapers? No, I'm not surprised. Senator Boyette from New Orleans. That's where I'm from. Why'd you come to Memphis? Damn it, kid. Full of questions, aren't you? Yeah. Why'd your client kill Senator Boyette? Why, why, why? Who, who, who? You're a real pain in the ass, Mark. I know. Why don't you just let me go? Mark glanced at the mirror, then at the hose running into the back seat. I might just shoot you in the head if you don't shut up. His bearded chin dropped and almost touched his chest. My client has killed a lot of people. That's how he makes money, by killing people. He's a member of the mafia in New Orleans, and now he's trying to kill me. Too bad, ain't it, kid? We beat him to it. Joke's on him. Romy took a long drink from the bottle and stared at Mark. Just think about it, kid. Right now, Barry, or Barry the Blade, as he's known, these mafia guys all have cute nicknames, you know, is waiting for me in a dirty restaurant in New Orleans. He's probably got a couple of his pals nearby. And after a quiet dinner, he'll want me to get in the car and take a little drive, talk about his case and all. And then he'll pull out a knife. That's why they call him the Blade, and I'm history. They'll dispose of my chubby little body somewhere just like they did Senator Boyette, and bam, just like that, Nolan has another unsolved murder. But we showed them, didn't we, kid? We showed them. His speech was slower and his tongue thicker. He moved the pistol up and down on his thigh when he talked. The finger stayed on the trigger. Keep him talking. Why does this Barry guy want to kill you? Another question. I'm floating. You floating? Yeah. Feels good. Bunch of reasons. Close your eyes, kid. Say your prayers. Mark watched the pistol and glanced at the door lock. He slowly touched each fingertip to each thumb, like counting in kindergarten, and the coordination was perfect. So where's the body? Romy snorted and his head nodded. The voice was almost a whisper. The body of Boyd Boyette. What a question. First U.S. senator murdered in office. Did you know that? Murdered by my dear client, Barry the Blade Moldano, who shot him in the head four times, then hid the body. No body. No case. You understand, kid? Not really. Why aren't you crying, kid? You were crying a few minutes ago. Aren't you scared? Yes, I'm scared. And, and I'd like to leave. I'm sorry you want to die and all, but I have to take care of my mother. Touching. Real touching. Now, nah, shut up. You see, kid, the feds have to have a body to prove there was a murder. Barry is their suspect, their only suspect, because they really did it, you see. In fact, they know he did it, but they need the body. Where is it? A dark cloud moved in front of the sun, and the clearing was suddenly darker. Romy moved the gun gently along his leg as if to warn Mark against any sudden moves. The blade is not the smartest thug I've ever met, you know. Thinks he's a genius, but he's really quite stupid. You're the stupid one, Mark thought again, sitting in a car with a hose running from the exhaust. He waited as still as could be. The body is under my boat. Your boat? Yes, my boat. He was in a hurry, 
I was out of town, so my beloved client took the body to my house and buried it in fresh concrete under my garage. It's still there, can you believe it? The FBI has dug up half of New Orleans trying to find it, but they never thought about my house. Maybe Barry ain't so stupid after all. When did he tell you this? I'm sick of your questions, kid. I'd really like to leave now. Shut up. The gas is working. We're gone, kid. Gone. He dropped the pistol on the seat. The engine hummed quietly. Mark glanced at the bullet hole in the window, at the millions of tiny crooked cracks running from it, then at the red face and heavy eyelids. A quick snort, almost a snore, and the head nodded downward. He was passing out. Mark stared at him and watched his thick chest move. He'd seen his ex-father do this a hundred times. Mark breathed deeply. The door lock would make noise. The gun was too close to Romy's hand. Mark's stomach cramped and his feet were numb. The red face emitted a loud, sluggish noise, and Mark knew there would be no more chances. Slowly, ever so slowly, he inched his shaking finger to the door lock switch. Ricky's eyes were almost as dry as his mouth, but his jeans were soaked. He was under the tree in the darkness, away from the bushes and the tall grass and the car. Five minutes had passed since he had removed the hose. Five minutes since the gunshot. But he knew his brother was alive because he had darted behind trees for fifty feet until he caught a glimpse of the blonde head sitting low and moving about in the huge car. So he stopped crying and started praying. He made his way back to the log, and as he crouched low and stared at the car and ached for his brother, the passenger door suddenly flew open, and there was Mark. Romy's chin dropped onto his chest, and just as he began his next snore, Mark slapped the pistol onto the floor with his left hand while unlocking the door with his right. He yanked the handle and rammed his shoulder into the door, and the last thing he heard as he rolled out was another deep snore from the lawyer. He landed on his knees and grabbed at the weeds as he scratched and clawed his way from the car. He raced low through the grass and within seconds made it to the tree where Ricky watched in muted horror. He stopped at the stump and turned, expecting to see the lawyer lumbering after him with the gun. But the car appeared harmless. The passenger door was open, the engine was running, the exhaust pipe was free of devices. He breathed for the first time in a minute, then slowly looked at Ricky. "'I pulled the hose out,' Ricky said in a shrill voice between rapid breaths. Mark nodded but said nothing. He was suddenly much calmer. The car was fifty feet away, and if Romy emerged, they could disappear through the woods in an instant, and hidden by the tree in the cover of the brush, they would never be seen by Romy if he decided to jump out and start blasting away with the gun." "'I'm scared, Mark. Let's go,' Ricky said, his voice still shrill, his hands shaking. "'Just a minute,' Mark studied the car intently. "'Come on, Mark, let's go,' I said, just a minute. Ricky watched the car. "'Is it dead?' "'I don't think so.' So the man was alive and had the gun, and it was becoming obvious that his big brother was no longer scared and was thinking of something. Ricky took a step backward. I'm leaving, he mumbled. I want to go home. Mark did not move. He exhaled calmly and studied the car. Just a second, he said without looking at Ricky. The voice had authority again. Ricky grew still and leaned forward, placing both hands on both wet knees. He watched his brother and shook his head slowly as Mark carefully picked a cigarette from his shirt pocket while staring at the car. He lit it took a long draw, and blew smoke upward to the branches. It was at this point that Ricky first noticed the swelling. What happened to your eye? Mark suddenly remembered. He rubbed it gently, then rubbed the knot on his forehead. He slapped me a couple of times. It looks bad. It's okay. You know what I'm going to do? He said, without expecting an answer. I'm going to sneak back up there and stick the hose into the exhaust pipe. I'm going to plug it in for him, the bastard. 
You're crazier than he is. You're kidding, right, Mark? Mark puffed deliberately. Suddenly the driver's door swung open and Romy stumbled out with a pistol. He mumbled loudly as he faltered to the rear of the car and once again found the garden hose lying harmlessly in the grass. He screamed obscenities at the sky. Mark crouched low and held Ricky with him. Romy spun around and surveyed the trees around the clearing. He cursed more and started crying loudly. Sweat dripped from his hair, and his black jacket was soaked and glued to him. He stomped around the rear of the car, sobbing and talking, screaming at the trees. He stopped suddenly, wrestled his ponderous bulk onto the top of the trunk, then squirmed and slid backward like a drugged elephant until he hit the rear window. His stumpy legs stretched before him. One shoe was missing. He took the gun, neither slowly nor quickly, almost routinely, and stuck it deep in his mouth. His wild red eyes flashed around and for a second paused at the trunk of the tree above the boys. He opened his lips and bit the barrel with his big dirty teeth. He closed his eyes and pulled the trigger with his right thumb. Chapter 2 The shoes were shark, and the vanilla silks ran all the way to the kneecaps, where they finally stopped and caressed the rather hairy calves of Barry Moldano, or Barry the Blade, or simply the Blade, as he liked to be called. The dark green suit had a shine to it, and appeared at first glance to be lizard or iguana or some other slimy reptile, but upon closer look it was not animal at all, but polyester, double-breasted with buttons all over the front. It hung handsomely on his well-built frame, and it rippled nicely as he strutted to the payphone in the rear of the restaurant. The suit was not gaudy, just flashy. He could pass for a well-dressed drug importer, or perhaps a hot Vegas bookie, and that was fine, because he was the blade, and he expected people to notice and when they looked at him they were supposed to see success. They were supposed to gawk in fear and get out of his way. The hair was black and full, colored to hide a bit of gray, slicked down, laden with gel, pulled back fiercely, and gathered into a perfect little ponytail that arched downward and touched precisely at the top of the dark green polyester jacket. Hours were spent on the hair. The obligatory diamond earring sparkled from the proper left lobe. A tasteful gold bracelet clung to the left wrist just below the diamond Rolex, and on his right wrist another tasteful gold chain rattled softly as he strutted. The swagger stopped in front of the payphone, which was near the restrooms, in a narrow hallway in the back of the restaurant. He stood in front of the phone and cut his eyes in all directions. To the average person, the sight of Barry the Blade's eyes cutting and darting and searching for violence would loosen the bowels. The eyes were very dark brown, and so close together that if one could stand to look directly into them for more than two seconds, one would swear Barry was cross-eyed. But he wasn't. A neat row of black hair ran from temple to temple without the slightest break for the furrow above the rather long and pointed nose. Solid brow. Puffy brown skin half circled the eyes from below, and said without a doubt that this man enjoyed booze and the fast life. The shady eyes confessed many hangovers, among other things. The blade loved his eyes. They were legendary. He punched the number of his lawyer's office and said rapidly, without waiting for a reply, "'Yeah, this is Barry. Where's Jerome? He's late. Supposed to meet me here forty minutes ago. Where is he? Have you seen him?' The Blade's voice was not pleasant, either. It had the menacing resonance of a successful New Orleans street thug who'd broken many arms, and would gladly break one more if you lingered too long in his path or weren't quick enough with your answers. The voice was rude, arrogant, and intimidating, and the poor secretary on the other end had heard it many times, and she'd seen the eyes and the slick suits and the ponytail. She swallowed hard, caught her breath, thanked heaven he was on the phone and not in the office standing before her desk cracking his knuckles, and informed Mr. Muldano that Mr. Clifford had left the office around 9 a.m. and had not been heard from since. 
The blade slammed the phone down and stormed through the hallway, then caught himself and began the strut as he neared the tables and the faces. The restaurant was beginning to fill. It was almost five. He just wanted a few drinks and then a nice dinner with his lawyer so they could talk about his mess. Just drinks and dinner, that's all. The feds were watching and listening. Jerome was paranoid, and just last week told Barry he thought they'd wired his law office so they would meet here and have a nice meal without worrying about eavesdroppers and bugging devices. They needed to talk. Jerome Clifford had been defending prominent New Orleans thugs for fifteen years, gangsters, pushers, politicians, and his record was impressive. He was cunning and corrupt, completely willing to buy people who could be bought. He drank with the judges and slept with their girlfriends. He bribed the cops and threatened the jurors. He schmoozed with the politicians and contributed when asked. Jerome knew what made the system tick, and when a sleazy defendant with money needed help in New Orleans, he invariably found his way to the law offices of W. Jerome Clifford, attorney and counselor at law. And in that office he found a friend who thrived on the dirt and was loyal to the end. Barry's case, however, was something different. It was huge and growing by the moment. The trial was a month away and loomed like an execution. It would be his second murder trial. His first had come at the tender age of eighteen, when a local prosecutor attempted to prove, with only one most unreliable witness, that Barry had cut the fingers off a rival thug and slit his throat. Barry's uncle, a well-respected and seasoned mobster, dropped some money here and there, and young Barry's jury could not agree on a verdict and thus simply hung itself. Barry later served two years in a pleasant federal joint on racketeering charges. His uncle could have saved him again, but he was twenty-five at the time and ready for a brief imprisonment. It looked good on his resume. The family was proud of him. Jerome Clifford had handled the plea bargain, and they'd been friends ever since. A fresh club soda with lime awaited Barry as he swaggered to the bar and assumed his position. The alcohol could wait a few hours. He needed steady hands. He squeezed the lime and watched himself in the mirror. He caught a few stares. After all, at this moment he was perhaps the most famous murder defendant in the country. Four weeks from trial, and people were looking. His face was all over the papers. This trial was much different. The victim was a senator, the first ever to be murdered, they alleged, while in office. United States of America versus Barry Moldano. Of course there was no body, and this presented tremendous problems for the United States of America. No corpse, no pathology reports, no ballistics, no bloody photographs to wave around the courtroom and display for the jury. But Jerome Clifford was cracking up. He was acting strange, disappearing like this, staying away from the office, not returning calls, always late for court, always mumbling under his breath and drinking too much. He'd always been mean and tenacious, but now he was detached and people were talking. Frankly, Barry wanted a new lawyer. Just four short weeks and Barry needed time. A delay, a continuance, something. Why does justice move so quickly when you don't want it to? His life had been lived on the fringes of the law, and he'd seen cases drag on for years. His uncle had once been indicted, but after three years of exhaustive warfare the government finally quit. Barry had been indicted six months ago, and bam, here's the trial. It wasn't fair. Romy wasn't working. He had to be replaced. Of course, the feds had a hole or two in their case. No one saw the killing. There would be a decent circumstantial case against him, with motive, perhaps, but no one actually saw him do it. There was an informant who was unstable and unreliable and expected to be chewed up on cross-examination, if he indeed made it to trial. The feds were hiding him, and Barry had his one marvelous advantage. The body— the diminutive, wiry corpse of Boyd Boyette, rotting slowly away in concrete. Without it, Reverend Roy could not get a conviction. This made Barry smile, and he winked at two peroxide blondes at a table near the door. Women had been plentiful since the indictment. He was famous. 
Reverend Roy's case was weak all right, but it hadn't slowed his nightly sermons in front of the cameras, or his pompous predictions of swift justice, or his blustering interviews with any journalist bored enough to quiz him. He was an oily-voiced, leather-lunged, pious U.S. attorney with obnoxious political aspirations and a thunderous opinion about everything. He had his very own press agent, a most overworked soul charged with the task of keeping the Reverend in the spotlight, so that one day very soon the public would insist he serve them in the United States Senate. From there only the Reverend knew where God might lead him. The Blade crunched his ice at the repulsive thought of Roy Fultrig waving his indictment before the cameras and bellowing all sorts of forecasts of good triumphing over evil. But six months had passed since the indictment, and neither Reverend Roy nor his confederates the FBI had found the body of Boyd Boyette. They followed Barry night and day. In fact, they were probably waiting outside right now, as if he were stupid enough to have dinner, then go look at the body just for the hell of it. They had bribed every wino and street bum who claimed to be an informant. They had drained ponds and lakes. They had dragged rivers. They had obtained search warrants for dozens of buildings and sites in the city. They'd spent a small fortune on backhoes and bulldozers. But Barry had it, the body of Boyd Boyette. He would like to move it, but he couldn't. The Reverend and his host of angels were watching. Clifford was an hour late now. Barry paid for two rounds of club soda, winked at the peroxides in their leather skirts, and left the place, cursing lawyers in general and his in particular. He needed a new lawyer, one who would return his phone calls and meet him for drinks and find some jurors who could be bought, a real lawyer. He needed a new lawyer, and he needed a continuance or a postponement or a delay, hell, anything to slow this thing down so he could think. He lit a cigarette and walked casually along magazine between Canal and Poydras. The air was thick. Clifford's office was four blocks away. His lawyer wanted a quick trial. What an idiot! No one wanted a quick trial in this system, but here was W. Jerome Clifford pushing for one. Clifford had explained not three weeks ago that they should push hard for a trial because there was no corpse, thus no case, etc., etc. And if they waited, the body might be found, and since Barry was such a lovely suspect and it was a sensational killing with a ton of pressure behind its prosecution, and since Barry had actually performed the killing, was in fact guilty as hell, then they should go to trial immediately. This had shocked Barry. They had argued viciously in Romy's office, and things had not been the same since. At one point in the discussion three weeks ago, things got quiet, and Barry boasted to his lawyer that the body would never be found. He disposed of lots of them, and he knew how to hide them. Boyette had been hidden rather quickly, and though Barry wanted to move the little fella, he was nonetheless secure and resting peacefully without the threat of disturbance from Roy and the Fibbies. Barry chuckled to himself as he strolled along Poydras. "'So where's the body?' Clifford had asked. "'You don't want to know,' Barry had replied. "'Sure, I want to know. The whole world wants to know. Come on, tell me if you got the guts.' "'You don't want to know. Come on, tell me. You're not going to like it. Tell me.' Barry flicked his cigarette on the sidewalk and almost laughed out loud. He shouldn't have told Jerome Clifford. It was a childish thing to do, but harmless. The man could be trusted with secrets, attorney-client privilege and all, and he had been wounded when Barry hadn't come clean initially with all the gory details. Jerome Clifford was as crooked and sleazy as his clients, and if they got blood on them he wanted to see it. "'You remember what day Boyette disappeared?' Barry had asked. "'Sure, January 16th. "'Remember where you were January 16th?' At this point Romy had walked to the wall behind his desk and studied his badly scrawled monthly planners. Colorado, skiing. And I borrowed your house? Yeah, you were meeting some doctor's wife. That's right, except she couldn't make it, so I took the senator to your house. Romy froze at this point and glared at his client, mouth open, eyes lowered. Barry had continued. He arrived in the trunk, and I left him at your place. Where? Romy had asked in disbelief. In the garage. 
You're lying. Under the boat that hasn't been moved in ten years. You're lying. The front door of Clifford's office was locked. Barry rattled it and cursed through the window. He lit another cigarette and searched the usual parking places for the black Lincoln. He'd find the fat bastard if it took all night. Barry had a friend in Miami who was once indicted for an assortment of drug charges. His lawyer was quite good and had managed to stall and delay for two and a half years until finally the judge lost patience and ordered a trial. The day before jury selection his friend killed his very fine lawyer and the judge was forced to grant another continuance. The trial never happened. If Romy died suddenly, it would be months, maybe years, before the trial. Chapter 3 Ricky backed away from the tree until he was in the weeds, then found the narrow trail and started to run. Ricky, Mark called. Hey, Ricky, wait! But it didn't work. He stared once more at the man on the car with the gun still in his mouth. The eyes were half open and the feet twitched at the heels. Mark had seen enough. Ricky, he called again as he jogged toward the trail. His brother was ahead, running slowly in an odd way, with both arms stiff and straight down by his legs. He leaned forward at the waist. Weeds hit him in the face. He tripped, but didn't fall. Mark grabbed him by the shoulders and spun him around. Ricky, listen, it's okay. Ricky was zombie-like, with pale skin and glazed eyes. He breathed hard and rapidly and emitted a dull, aching moan. He couldn't talk. He jerked away and resumed his trot, still moaning as the weed slapped him in the face. Mark followed close behind as they crossed a dry creek bed and headed for home. The trees thinned just before the crumbling board fence that encircled most of the trailer park. Two small children were throwing rocks at a row of cans lined neatly along the hood of a wrecked car. Ricky ran faster and crawled through a broken section of the fence. He jumped a ditch, darted between two trailers, and ran into the street. Mark was two steps behind. The steady groan grew louder as Ricky breathed even harder. The Sway mobile home was twelve feet wide and sixty feet long and parked on a narrow strip on East Street with forty others. Tucker Wheel Estates also included North, South, and West streets, and all four curved and crossed each other several times from all directions. It was a decent trailer park with reasonably clean streets, a few trees, plenty of bicycles, and few abandoned cars. Speed bumps slowed traffic. Loud music or noise brought the police as soon as it was reported to Mr. Tucker. His family owned all the land and most of the trailers, including number 17 on East Street, which Diane Sway rented for $280 a month. Ricky ran through the unlocked door and fell onto the couch in the den. He seemed to be crying, but there were no tears. He curled his knees to his stomach as if he were cold, then very slowly placed his right thumb in his mouth. Mark watched this intently. "'Ricky, talk to me,' he said gently shaking his shoulder. You gotta talk to me, man, okay? Ricky, it's okay. He sucked harder on the thumb. He closed his eyes, and his body shook. Mark looked around the den and kitchen and realized things were exactly as they had left them an hour ago. An hour ago? It seemed like days. The sunlight was fading, and the rooms were a bit darker. Their books and backpacks from school were piled, as always, on the kitchen table. The daily note from Mom was on the counter next to the phone. He walked to the sink and ran water in a clean coffee cup. He had a terrible thirst. He sipped the cool water and stared through the window at the trailer next door. Then he heard smacking noises and looked at his brother. The thumb. He'd seen a show on television where some kids in California sucked their thumbs after an earthquake. All kinds of doctors were involved. A year after it hit, the poor kids were still sucking away. The cup touched a tender spot on his lip, and he remembered the blood. He ran to the bathroom and studied his face in the mirror. Just below the hairline there was a small, barely noticeable knot. His left eye was puffy and looked awful. He ran water in the sink and washed a spot of blood from his lower lip. It was not swollen, but suddenly began throbbing. He'd looked worse after fights at school. He was tough. 
He took an ice cube from the refrigerator and held it firmly under his eye. He walked to the sofa and studied his brother, paying particular attention to the thumb. Ricky was asleep. It was almost five-thirty, time for their mother to arrive home after nine long hours at the lamp factory. His ears still rang from the gunshots and the blows he took from his late friend Mr. Romy, but he was beginning to think. He sat next to Ricky's feet and slowly rubbed around his eye with the ice. If he didn't call 911, it could be days before anyone found the body. The fatal shot had been severely muffled, and Mark was certain no one heard it but them. He'd been to the clearing many times, but suddenly realized he had never seen another person there. It was secluded. Why had Romy chosen the place? He was from New Orleans, right? Mark watched all kinds of rescue shows on television and knew for certain that every 911 call was recorded. He did not want to be recorded. He would never tell anyone, not even his mother, what he had just lived through. And he really needed at this crucial moment to discuss the matter with his little brother so they could get their lies straight. Ricky, he said, shaking his brother's leg. Ricky groaned, but did not open his eyes. He pulled himself tighter into a knot. Ricky, wake up. There was no response to this except a sudden shudder, as if he were freezing. Mark found a quilt in a closet and covered his brother, then wrapped a handful of ice cubes in a dish towel and placed the pack gingerly over his own left eye. He didn't feel like answering questions about his face. He stared at the phone and thought of cowboy and Indian movies with bodies lying around and buzzards circling above and everyone concerned about burying the dead before the damned vultures got them. It would be dark in an hour or so. Do buzzards strike at night? Never saw that in a movie. The thought of the fat lawyer lying out there with a gun in his mouth, one shoe off, probably still bleeding, was horrible enough. But throw in the buzzards ripping and tearing, and Mark picked up the phone. He punched 911 and cleared his throat. Yeah, there's a dead man in the woods, and, well, someone needs to come get him. He spoke in the deepest voice possible and knew from the first syllable that it was a pitiful attempt at disguise. He breathed hard, and the knot on his forehead pounded. "'Who's calling, please?' It was a female voice, almost like a robot's. "'Uh, I really don't want to say, okay?' "'We need your name, son.' Great, she knew he was a kid. He hoped he could at least sound like a young teenager. "'Do you want to know about the body or not?' Mark asked. "'Where's the body?' This is just great, he thought, already telling someone about it. And not someone to be trusted, but someone who wore a uniform and worked with the police, and he could just hear this taped conversation, as it would be repeatedly played before the jury, just like on television. They would do all those voice tests, and everyone would know it was Mark Sway on the phone, telling about the body when no one else in the world knew about it. He tried to make his voice even deeper. It's near Tucker Wheel Estates, and that's on Whipple Road. Yes, that's right. It's in the woods between Tuckerwheel Estates and Highway 17. The body is in the woods? Sort of. The body is actually lying on a car in the woods. And the body's dead? The guy's been shot, okay, with a gun in the mouth, and I'm sure the man's dead. Have you seen the body? The woman's voice was losing its professional restraint. It had an edge to it now. What kind of stupid question is that? Mark thought. Have I seen it? She was stalling trying to keep him on the line so she could trace it. "'Son, have you seen the body?' she asked again. "'Of course I've seen it. I need your name, son. Look, there's a small dirt road off Highway 17 that leads to a small clearing in the woods. The car is big and black, and the dead man is lying on it. If you can't find it, well, tough luck. Bye.' He hung up and stared at the phone. The trailer was perfectly still. He walked to the door and peered through the dirty curtains, half expecting squad cars to come flying in from all directions. Loudspeakers, SWAT teams, bulletproof vests. Get a grip. He shook Ricky again, and, touching his arm, noticed how clammy it was. But Ricky was still sleeping and sucking his thumb. Mark gently grabbed him around the waist and dragged him across the floor, down the narrow hallway to their bedroom where he shoveled him into bed. Ricky mumbled and wiggled a bit along the way, but quickly curled into a ball. Mark covered him with a blanket and closed the door. 
Mark wrote a note to his mother, told her Ricky felt bad and was sleeping, so please be quiet, and he'd be home in an hour or so. The boys were not required to be home when she arrived, but if they weren't, there'd better be a note. The distant beat of a helicopter went unnoticed by Mark. He lit a cigarette along the trail. Two years ago, a new bike had disappeared from a house in the suburbs not far from the trailer park. It was rumored to have been seen behind one of the mobile homes, and the same rumor held that it was being stripped and repainted by a couple of trailer park kids. The suburb kids enjoyed classifying their lesser neighbors as trailer park kids, the implications being obvious. They attended the same school, and there were daily fights between the two societies. All crime and mischief in the suburbs were automatically blamed on the trailer people. Kevin, the delinquent on North Street, had the new bike and had shown it to a few of his buddies before it was repainted. Mark had seen it. The rumors flew and the cops poked around, and one night there was a knock at the door. Mark's name had been mentioned in the investigation, and the policeman had a few questions. He sat at the kitchen table and glared down at Mark for an hour. It was very unlike television, where the defendant keeps his cool and sneers at the cop. Mark admitted nothing, didn't sleep for three nights, and vowed to live a clean life and stay away from trouble. But this was trouble. Real trouble. Much worse than a stolen bike. A dead man who told secrets before he died. Was he telling the truth? He was drunk and crazy as hell, talking about the wizard and all, but why would he lie? Mark knew Romy had a gun, had even held, and touched the trigger, and the gun killed the man. It had to be a crime to watch someone commit suicide and not stop it. He would never tell a soul. Romy had stopped talking. Ricky would have to be dealt with. Mark had kept silent about the bike, and he could do it again. No one would ever know he had been in the car. There was a siren in the distance then the steady thump of a helicopter. Mark eased under a tree as the chopper swept close by. He crept through the trees and brush, staying low and in no hurry until he heard voices. Lights flashed everywhere, blue for the cops and red for the ambulance. The white Memphis police cars were parked around the black Lincoln. The orange and white ambulance was arriving on the scene as Mark peeked through the woods. No one seemed anxious or worried. Romy had not been moved. One cop took pictures while the others laughed. Radios squawked, just like on television. Blood ran from under the body and down across the red and white taillights. The pistol was still in his right hand, on top of his bulging stomach. His head slumped to the right, his eyes closed now. The paramedics walked up and looked him over, then made bad jokes, and the cops laughed. All four doors were open, and the car was being carefully inspected. There was no effort to remove the body. The helicopter made a final pass, then flew away. Mark was deep in the brush, maybe thirty feet from the tree in the log where they had lit the first smokes. He had a perfect view of the clearing, and of the fat lawyer lying up there on the car like a dead cow in the middle of the road. Another cop car arrived, then another ambulance. People in uniform were bumping into each other. Small white bags with unseen things in them were removed with great caution from the car. Two policemen with rubber gloves rolled up the hose. The photographer squatted in each door and flashed away. Occasionally someone would stop and stare at Romy, but most of them drank coffee from styrofoam cups and chatted away. A cop laid Romy's shoe on the trunk next to the body, then placed it in a white bag and wrote something on it. Another cop knelt by the license plates and waited with his radio for a report to come back. Finally, a stretcher emerged from the first ambulance and was carried to the rear bumper and laid in the weeds. Two paramedics grabbed Romy's feet and gently pulled him until two other paramedics could grab his arms. The cops watched and joked about how fat Mr. Clifford was because they knew his name now. They asked if more paramedics were needed to carry his big ass, if the stretcher was reinforced or something, if he could fit in the ambulance. Lots of laughter as they strained to lower him. A cop put the pistol in a bag. The stretcher was heaved into the ambulance, but the doors were not closed. A wrecker with yellow lights arrived and backed itself to the front bumper of the Lincoln. Mark thought of Ricky and the thumb-sucking. 
What if he needed help? Mom would be home soon. What if she tried to wake him and got scared? He would leave in just a minute and smoke the last cigarette on the way home. He heard something behind him but thought nothing of it. Just the snap of a twig. Then, suddenly, a strong hand grabbed his neck and a voice said, What's up, kid? Mark jerked around and looked into the face of a cop. He froze and couldn't breathe. "'What are you doing, kid?' the cop asked, as he lifted Mark up by the neck. The grip didn't hurt, but the cop meant to be obeyed. "'Stand up, kid, okay? Don't be afraid.' Mark stood, and the cop released him. The cops in the clearing had heard and were staring. "'What are you doing here?' "'Just watching,' Mark said. The cop pointed with his flashlight to the clearing. The sun was down, and it would be dark in twenty minutes. "'Let's walk over there,' he said. "'I need to go home,' Mark said. The cop placed his arm around Mark's shoulders and led him through the weeds. "'What's your name?' "'Mark.' "'Last name?' "'Sway. What's yours?' "'Hardy.' "'Mark Sway, huh?' The cop repeated thoughtfully. "'You live in Tucker Wheel Estates, don't you?' He couldn't deny this, but he hesitated for some reason. "'Yes, sir.' They joined the circle of policemen who were now quiet and waiting to see the kid. "'Hey, fellas, this is Mark Sway, the kid who made the call,' Hardy announced. "'You did make the call, didn't you, Mark?' He wanted to lie, but at the moment he doubted a lie would work. "'Uh, yes, sir.' "'How'd you find the body?' "'My brother and I were playing.' "'Playing where?' "'Around here. We live over there,' he said, pointing beyond the trees. "'Were you guys smoking dope?' "'No, sir.' "'Are you sure?' "'Yes, sir.' Stay away from drugs, kid. There were at least six policemen in the circle, and the questions were coming from all directions. How'd you find the car? Well, we just sort of walked up on it. What time was it? I don't remember, really. We were just walking through the woods. We do it all the time. What's your brother's name? Ricky. Same last name? Yes, sir. Where were you and Ricky when you first saw the car? Mark pointed to the tree behind him. Under that tree... A paramedic approached the group and announced they were leaving and taking the body to the morgue. The wrecker was tugging at the Lincoln. "'Where's Ricky now? At home?' "'What happened to your face?' Hardy asked. Mark instinctively reached for his eye. "'Oh, nothing. Just got in a fight at school.' "'Why were you hiding in the bushes over there?' "'I don't know. Come on, Mark. You were hiding for a reason.' "'I don't know. It's sort of scary, you know, seeing a dead man and all.' You've never seen a dead man before? On television? One cop actually smiled at this. Did you see this man before he killed himself? No, sir. So you just found him like this? Yes, sir. We walked up under that tree and saw the car. Then we, we saw the man. Where were you when you heard the gunshot? He started to point to the tree again, but caught himself. I'm not sure I understand. We know you heard the gunshot. Where were you when you heard it? I didn't hear the gunshot. You sure? I'm sure. We walked up and found him right here, and we took off home, and I called 911. Why didn't you give your name to 911? I don't know. Come on, Mark. There must be a reason. I don't know. Scared, I guess. The cops exchanged looks as if this were a game. Mark tried to breathe normally and act pitiful. He was just a kid. I really need to go home. My mom's probably looking for me. Okay. One last question, Hardy said. Was the engine running when you first saw the car? Mark thought hard, but couldn't remember if Romy had turned it off before he shot himself. He answered very slowly. I'm not sure, but I think it was running. Hardy pointed to a police car. Get in. I'll drive you home. That's okay. I'll just walk. No, it's too dark. I'll give you a ride. Come on. He took his arm and walked him to the car. Chapter 4 Diane Sway had called the children's clinic and was sitting on the edge of Ricky's bed, biting her nails and waiting for a doctor to call. The nurse also said there was a very contagious virus in the schools and they treated dozens of children that week. He had the symptoms, so don't worry. Diane checked his forehead for a fever. She shook him gently again, but there was no response. 
He was still curled tightly, breathing normally and sucking his thumb. She heard a car door slam and went back to the living room. Mark burst through the door. Hi, Mom. Where have you been? she snapped. What's wrong with Ricky? Sergeant Hardy appeared in the door, and she froze. Good evening, ma'am, he said. She glared at Mark. What have you done? Nothing. Hardy stepped inside. Nothing serious, ma'am. Then why are you here? I can explain, Mom. It's sort of a long story. Hardy closed the door behind him, and they stood in the small room looking awkwardly at one another. I'm listening. Well, me and Ricky were back in the woods playing this afternoon, and we saw this big black car parked in a clearing with the motor running, and when we got closer there was this man lying across the trunk with a gun in his mouth. He was dead. Dead? Suicide, ma'am, Hardy offered. And we ran home as fast as we could, and I called 911. Diane covered her mouth with her fingers. Man's name is Jerome Clifford, male, white, Hardy reported officially. He's from New Orleans, and we have no idea why he came here. Been dead for about two hours now, we think, not very long. He left a suicide note. What did Ricky do? Diane asked. Well, we ran home, and he fell on the couch and started sucking his thumb and wouldn't talk. I took him to his bed and covered him. How old is he? Hardy asked with a frown. Eight? May I see him? Why? Diane asked. I'm concerned. He witnessed something awful, and he might be in shock. Shock? Yes, ma'am. Diane walked quickly through the kitchen and down the hall, with Hardy behind her and Mark following, shaking his head and clenching his teeth. Hardy pulled the covers off Ricky's shoulders and touched his arm. The thumb was in the mouth. He shook him called his name, and the eyes opened for a second. Ricky mumbled something. "'His skin is cold and damp. Has he been ill?' Hardy asked. "'No.' The phone rang, and Diane raced for it. From the bedroom, Hardy and Mark listened as she told the doctor about the symptoms and the dead body the boys had found. "'Did he say anything when you guys saw the body?' Hardy asked quietly. "'I don't think so.' It happened pretty fast. We, uh, we just took off running once we saw it. He just moaned and grunted all the way, ran sort of funny, with his arms straight down. I never saw him run like that. And then as soon as we got home, he curled up and hasn't spoken since. We need to get him to a hospital, Hardy said. Mark's knees went weak, and he leaned on the wall. Diane hung up, and Hardy met her in the kitchen. The doctor wants him at the hospital, she said in a panic. I'll call an ambulance, Hardy said, heading for his car. Pack a few of his clothes. He disappeared and left the door open. Diane glared at Mark, who was weak and needed to sit. He fell into a chair at the kitchen table. Are you telling the truth? she asked. Yes, ma'am. We saw the dead body, and Ricky freaked out, I guess, and we just ran home. It would take hours to tell the truth at this point. Once they were alone, he might reconsider and tell the rest of the story, but the cop was here now, and it would get too complicated. He was not afraid of his mother, and generally came clean when she pressed. She was only thirty, younger than any of his friend's moms, and they'd been through a lot together. Their brutal ordeals fighting off his father had forged a bond much deeper than any ordinary mother-son relationship. It hurt to hide this from her. She was scared and desperate. But the things Romy told him had nothing to do with Ricky's condition. A sharp pain hit him in the stomach, and the room spun slowly. "'What happened to your eye?' "'I got in a fight in school. It wasn't my fault. It never is. Are you okay?' "'I think so.' Hardy lumbered through the door. "'The ambulance will be here in five minutes. Which hospital?' "'The doctor said to go to St. Peter's.' "'Who's your doctor?' "'Shelby Pediatric Group.' They said they would call in a children's psychiatrist to meet us at the hospital. She nervously lit a cigarette. Do you think he's okay? He needs to be looked at. Maybe hospitalized, ma'am. I've seen this before with kids who witness shootings and stabbings. It's very traumatic, and it could take time for him to get over it. Had a kid last year who watched his mother get shot by a crack dealer in one of the projects. The poor little fellow's still in the hospital. How old was he? Eight. Now he's nine. Won't talk, won't eat, sucks his thumb and plays with dolls. Really sad. Diane had heard enough. 
I'll pack some clothes. You better pack clothes for yourself, too, ma'am. You might have to stay with them. What about Mark? she asked. What time's your husband get home? I don't have one. Then pack clothes for Mark, too. They might want to keep you overnight. Diane stood in the kitchen with her cigarette inches from her lips and tried to think. She was scared and uncertain. I don't have health insurance, she mumbled to the window. St. Peter's will take indigent cases. You need to get packed. A crowd gathered around the ambulance as soon as it stopped at number 17 East Street. They waited and watched, whispering and pointing as the paramedics went inside. Hardy laid Ricky on the stretcher, and they strapped him down under a blanket. Ricky tried to curl, but the heavy Velcro bands kept him straight. He moaned once, but never opened his eyes. Diane gently freed his right arm and made the thumb available. Her eyes were watery, but she refused to cry. The crowd backed away from the rear of the ambulance as the paramedics approached with the stretcher. They loaded Ricky, and Diane stepped in behind. A few neighbors called out their concerns, but the driver slammed the door before she could answer. Mark sat in the front seat of the police car with Hardy, who hit a switch, and suddenly blue lights were fluttering and bouncing off the nearby trailers. The crowd inched away, and Hardy gunned the engine. The ambulance followed. Mark was too worried and scared to be interested in the radios and mics and guns and gadgets. He sat still and kept his mouth shut. "'Are you telling the truth, son?' Hardy, suddenly the cop again, asked from nowhere. "'Yes, sir. About what?' "'About what you saw.' "'Yes, sir. You don't believe me?' "'I didn't say that. It's just a little strange, that's all.' Mark waited a few seconds, and when it was obvious Hardy was waiting for him, he asked, "'What's strange?' "'Several things. First, you made the call, but wouldn't give your name. Why not? If you and Ricky just stumbled upon the dead man, why not give your name? Second, why did you sneak back to the scene and hide in the woods? People who hide are afraid.' Why didn't you simply return to the scene and tell us what you saw? Third, if you and Ricky saw the same thing, why is he freaked out and you're in pretty good shape, know what I mean? Mark thought for a while and realized he could think of nothing to say, so he said nothing. They were on the interstate headed for downtown. It was neat to watch the other cars get out of the way. The red ambulance lights were close behind. You didn't answer my question, Hardy finally said. Which question? Why didn't you give your name when you made the call? I was scared, okay? That's the first dead body I ever saw, and it scared me. I'm still scared. Then why'd you sneak back to the scene? Why were you trying to hide from us? I was scared, you know. But I just wanted to see what was going on. That's not a crime, is it? Maybe not. They left the expressway and were now darting through traffic. The tall buildings of downtown Memphis were in sight. I just hope you're telling the truth, Hardy said. Don't you believe me? I've got my doubts. Mark swallowed hard and looked in the side mirror. Why do you have doubts? I'll tell you what I think, kid. You want to hear it? Sure, Mark said slowly. Well, I think you kids were in the woods smoking. I found some fresh cigarette butts under that tree with a rope. I figure you were under there having a little smoke, and you saw the whole thing. Mark's heart stopped, and his blood ran cold, but he knew the importance of trying to appear calm. Just shrug it off. Hardy wasn't there. He didn't see anything. He caught his hands shaking, so he sat on them. Hardy watched him. Did you arrest kids for smoking cigarettes? Mark asked, his voice a shade weaker. No, but kids who lie to cops get in all sorts of trouble. I'm not lying, okay? I've smoked cigarettes there before, but not today. We were just walking through the woods, thinking about maybe having a smoke, and we walked up on the car and Romy. Hardy hesitated slightly, then asked, Who's Romy? Mark braced himself and breathed deeply. In a flash he knew it was over. He'd blown it, said too much, lied too much. He lasted less than an hour with his story. Keep thinking, he told himself. That's the guy's name, isn't it? Romy? Yeah, isn't that what you called him? No. 
I told your mother his name was Jerome Clifford from New Orleans. I thought you said it was Romy Clifford from New Orleans. Who ever heard of the name Romy? Beats me. The car turned right, and Mark looked straight ahead. Is this St. Peter's? That's what the sign says. Hardy parked to the side, and they watched the ambulance back up to the emergency dock. Chapter 5 the Honorable J. Roy Fultrig, United States Attorney for the Southern District of Louisiana at New Orleans and a Republican, sipped properly from a can of tomato juice and stretched his legs in the rear of his customized Chevrolet van as it raced smoothly along the expressway. Memphis was five hours to the north, straight up Interstate 55, and he could have caught a plane, but there were two reasons why he hadn't. First, the paperwork. He could claim it was official business related to the Boyd Boyette case, and he could stretch things here and there and make it work, but it would take months to get reimbursed, and there would be eighteen different forms. Second, and much more important, he didn't like to fly. He could have waited three hours in New Orleans for a flight that would last for an hour and place him in Memphis around 11 p.m., but they would make it by midnight in the van. He didn't confess this fear of flying, and he knew he would one day be forced to see a shrink to overcome it. For the meantime, he had purchased this fancy van with his own money and loaded it down with appliances and gadgets, two phones, a television, even a fax machine. He buzzed around the southern district of Louisiana in it, always with Wally Box behind the wheel. It was much nicer and more comfortable than any limousine. He slowly kicked off his loafers and watched the night fly by as Special Agent Truman listened to the telephone stuck in his ear. On the other end of the heavily padded back bench sat Assistant U.S. Attorney Thomas Fink, a loyal Fultrig subordinate who'd worked on the Boyette case eighty hours a week and would handle most of the trial, especially the non-glamorous grunt work, saving, of course, the easy and high-profile parts for his boss. Fink was reading a document, as always, and trying to listen to the mumblings of Agent Truman, who was seated across from him in a heavy swivel seat. Truman had Memphis FBI on the phone. Next to Truman, in an identical swivel recliner, was Special Agent Skipper Scherf, a rookie who had worked little on the case, but happened to be available for this joy ride to Memphis. He scribbled on a legal pad, and would do so for the next five hours, because in this tight circle of power he had absolutely nothing to say, and no one wanted to hear him. He would obediently stare at his legal pad and record orders from his supervisor, Larry Truman, and, of course, from the general himself, Reverend Roy. Scherf stared intently at his scribbling, avoiding with great diligence even the slightest eye contact with Fultrick, and tried in vain to discern what Memphis was telling Truman. The news of Clifford's death had electrified their office only an hour earlier, and Scherf was still uncertain why and how he was sitting in Roy's van, speeding along the expressway. Truman had told him to run home, pack a change of clothes, and go immediately to Fultrick's office, and this is what he'd done. And here he was, scribbling and listening. The chauffeur, Wally Box, actually had a license to practice law, though he didn't know how to use it. Officially, he was an assistant United States attorney, same as Fink, but in reality he was a fetch-and-catch boy for Fultrick. He drove his van, carried his briefcase, wrote his speeches, and handled the media, which took fifty percent of his time, because his boss was gravely concerned with his public image. Box was not stupid. He was deft at political maneuvering, quick to the defense of his boss, and thoroughly loyal to the man and his mission. Fultrick had a great future— and Box knew he would be there one day, whispering importantly with the great man, as only the two of them strolled around Capitol Hill. Box knew the importance of Boyette. It would be the biggest trial of Fultrig's illustrious career, the trial he'd been dreaming of, the trial to thrust him into the national spotlight. He knew Fultrig was losing sleep over Barry the Blade Moldano. Larry Truman finished the conversation and replaced the phone. He was a veteran agent, early forties, with ten years to go before retirement. Fultrig waited for him to speak. They're trying to convince Memphis PD to release the car so we can go over it. It'll probably take an hour or so. They're having a hard time explaining Clifford and Boyette and all this to Memphis, but they're making progress. 
Head of our Memphis office is a guy named Jason McThune, very tough and persuasive, and he's meeting with the Memphis chief right now. McThune's called Washington, and Washington's called Memphis, and we should have the car within a couple of hours. Single gunshot wound to the head, obviously self-inflicted. Apparently, he tried to do it first with a garden hose and the tailpipe, but for some reason it didn't work. He was taking Dalmain and Codeine and washing it all down with Jack Daniels. No record on the gun, but it's too early. Memphis is checking it. A cheap thirty-eight. Thought he could swallow a bullet. No doubt he had suicide, Fultrick asked. No doubt. Where'd he do it? Somewhere in North Memphis, drove into the woods with his big black Lincoln and took care of himself. I don't suppose anyone saw it. Evidently not. A couple of kids found the body in a remote area. How long had he been dead? Not long. They'll do an autopsy in a few hours and determine the time of death. Why Memphis? Not sure. If there's a reason, we don't know it yet. Fultrick pondered these things and sipped his tomato juice. Fink took notes. Scherf scribbled furiously. Wally Box hung on every word. What about the note? Fultrick asked, looking out the window. Well, it could be interesting. Our guys in Memphis have a copy of it. Not a very good copy, and they'll try and fax it to us in a few minutes. Apparently the note was handwritten in black ink, and the writing's fairly legible. It's a few paragraphs of instructions to his secretary about the funeral, who wants to be cremated, and what to do with his office furniture. The note tells the secretary where to find his will. Nothing about Boyette, of course. Nothing about Muldano. Then he apparently tried to add something to the note with a blue big pen, but it ran out of ink after he started his message. It's badly scrawled and hard to read. What is it? We don't know. The Memphis police still have possession of the note, the gun, the pills, all the physical evidence removed from the car. McThune's trying to get it now. They found a big pen, no ink in the car, and it appears to be the same pen he tried to use to add something to the note. They'll have it when we arrive, won't they? Fultrick asked in a tone that left no doubt he expected to have it all as soon as he got to Memphis. They're working on it, Truman answered. Fultrig was not his boss, technically, but this case was a prosecution now, not an investigation, and the Reverend was in control. So Jerome Clifford drives to Memphis and blows his brains out, Fultrig said to the window, four weeks before trial. Man, oh man, what else can go crazy with this case? No answer was expected. They rode in silence, waiting for Roy to speak again. Where's Muldano? he finally asked. New Orleans, we're watching him. He'll have a new lawyer by midnight, and by noon tomorrow he'll file a dozen motions for continuances claiming the tragic death of Jerome Clifford seriously undermines his constitutional right to a fair trial with assistance of counsel. We'll oppose it, of course, and the judge will order a hearing for next week, and we'll have the hearing, and we'll lose, and it'll be six months before this case goes to trial. Six months. Can you believe it? Truman shook his head in disgust. At least it'll give us more time to find the body. It certainly would. And, of course, Roy had thought of this. He needed more time, really. He just couldn't admit it, because he was the prosecutor, the people's lawyer, the government fighting crime and corruption. He was right. Justice was on his side, and he had to be ready to attack evil at any moment, any time, any place. He had pushed hard for a speedy trial, because he was right, and he would get a conviction. The United States of America would win, and Roy Fultrig would deliver the victory. He could see the headlines. He could smell the ink. He also needed to find the damn body of Boyd Boyette, or else there might be no conviction, no front-page pictures, no interviews on CNN, no speedy ascent to Capitol Hill. He had convinced those around him that a guilty verdict was possible with no corpse, and this was true, but he didn't want to chance it. He wanted the body. Fink looked at Agent Truman. We think Clifford knew where the body is. Did you know that? It was obvious Truman did not know this. What makes you think so? Fink placed his reading material on the seat. Romy and I go way back. We were in law school together twenty years ago at Tulane. He was a little crazy back then, but very smart. About a week ago, he called me at home and said he wanted to talk about the Muldano case. He was drunk, thick-tongued, out of his head, and kept saying 
He couldn't go through with the trial, which was surprising given how much he loves these big cases. We talked for an hour. He rambled and stuttered. He even cried, Poultrick interrupted. Yeah, cried like a child. I was surprised by all this at first, but then nothing Jerome Clifford did really surprise me any more, you know, not even suicide. He finally hung up. He called me at the office at nine the next morning, scared to death he'd let something slip the night before. He was in a panic, kept hinting he might know where the body is and fishing to see whether he'd dropped off any clues during his drunken chit-chat. Well, I played along and thanked him for the information he gave me the night before, which was nothing. I thanked him twice, then three times, and I could feel Romy sweating on the other end of the phone. He called twice more that day at the office, then called me at home that night drunk again. It was almost comical, but I thought I could string him along and maybe he'd let something slip. I told him I had to tell Roy and that Roy had told the FBI and that the FBI was now trailing him round the clock. This really freaked him out, Fultrig added helpfully. Yeah, he cussed me out pretty good, but called the next day at the office. We had lunch. The guy was a nervous wreck. He was too scared to come right out and ask if we knew about the body, and I played it cool. I told him we were certain we'd have the body in plenty of time for the trial, and I thanked him again. He was cracking up before my eyes. He hadn't slept or bathed. His eyes were puffy and red. He got drunk over lunch and started accusing me of trickery and all sorts of sleazy, unethical behavior. It was an ugly scene. I paid the check and left, and he called me at home that night, remarkably sober. He apologized. I said, no problem. I explained to him that Roy was seriously considering an indictment against him for obstruction of justice, and this set him off. He said we couldn't prove it. I said maybe not, but he'd be indicted, arrested, and put on trial, and there would be no way he could represent Barry Moldano. He screamed and cussed for fifteen minutes, then hung up. I never heard from him again. He knows, or he knew, where Moldano put the body, Fultrick added with certainty. Why weren't we informed? Truman asked. We were about to tell you. In fact, Thomas and I discussed it this afternoon, just a short time before we got the call. Fultrig said this with an air of indifference, as if Truman should not question him about such things. Truman glanced at Scherf, who was glued to his legal pad, drawing pictures of handguns. Fultrig finished his tomato juice and tossed the can in the garbage. He crossed his feet. You guys need to track Clifford's movements from New Orleans to Memphis. Which route did it take? Are there friends along the way? Where did he stop? Who did he see in Memphis? Surely he must have talked to someone from the time he left New Orleans until he shot himself. Don't you think so? Truman nodded. It's a long drive. I'm sure he had to stop along the way. He knew where the body is, and he obviously planned to commit suicide. There's an outside chance he told someone, don't you think? Maybe. Think about it, Larry. Let's say you're the lawyer, heaven forbid, and you represent a killer who's murdered a United States senator. Let's say that the killer tells you, his lawyer, where he hid the body. So two and only two people in the entire world know this secret, and you, the lawyer, go off the deep end and decide to kill yourself, and you plan it. You know you're going to die, right? You get pills and whiskey and a gun and a water hose, and you drive five hours from home and you kill yourself. Now, would you share your little secret with anyone? Perhaps. I don't know. There's a chance, right? Slight chance. Good. If we have a slight chance, then we must investigate it thoroughly. I'd start with his office personnel, find out when he left New Orleans, check his credit cards, where did he buy gas, where did he eat, where did he get the gun and the pills and the booze? Does he have family between here and there? Old lawyer friends along the way. There are a thousand things to check. Truman handed the phone to Scherf. Call our office. Get Hightower on the phone. Fultrig was pleased to see the FBI jump when he barked. He grinned smugly at Fink. Between them on the floor was a storage box crammed with files and exhibits and documents all related to USA versus Barry Muldano. Four more boxes were at the office. Fink had their contents memorized, but Roy did not. He pulled out a file and flipped through it. It was a thick motion filed by Jerome Clifford two months earlier that still had not been ruled upon. He laid it down and stared through the window at the dark Mississippi landscape passing in the night. The Bogchido exit was just ahead. Where do they get these names? This would be a quick trip. 
He needed to confirm that Clifford was in fact dead, and had in fact died by his own hand. He had to know if any clues were dropped along the way, confessions to friends or loose talk to strangers, perhaps notes with last words that might be of help. Long shots at best. But there had been many dead ends in the search for Boyd Boyette and his killer, and this would not be the last. Chapter 6 a doctor in a yellow jogging suit ran through the swinging doors at the end of the emergency hallway and said something to the receptionist sitting behind the dirty sliding windows. She pointed, and he approached Diane and Mark and Hardy as they stood by a Coke machine in one corner of the admissions lobby of St. Peter's Charity Hospital. He introduced himself to Diane as Dr. Simon Greenway and ignored the cop and Mark. He was a psychiatrist, he said, and had been called moments earlier by Dr. Sage, the family's pediatrician. She needed to come with him. Hardy said he would stay with Mark. They hurried away down the narrow hallway, dodging nurses and orderlies, darting around gurneys and parked beds, and disappeared through the swinging doors. The admissions lobby was crowded with dozens of sick and struggling patients-to-be. There were no empty chairs. Family members filled out forms. No one was in a hurry. A hidden intercom rattled non-stop somewhere above, paging a hundred doctors a minute. It was a few minutes after seven. "'Are you hungry, Mark?' Hardy asked. He wasn't, but he wanted to leave this place. "'Maybe a little. Let's go to the cafeteria. I'll buy you a cheeseburger.' They walked through a busy hallway, down a flight of stairs to the basement, where a mass of anxious people roamed the corridor. Another hall led to a large open area, and suddenly they were in a cafeteria, louder and more crowded than the lunchroom at school. Hardy pointed to the only empty table in view, and Mark waited there. Of particular concern to Mark at this moment was, of course, his little brother. He was worried about Ricky's physical condition, although Hardy had explained that he was in no danger of dying. He said that some doctors would talk to him and try to bring him around, but it could take time. He said that it was terribly important for the doctors to know exactly what happened, the truth and nothing but the truth and that if the doctors were not told the truth, then it could be severely damaging to Ricky and his mental condition. Hardy said Ricky might be locked up in some institution for months, maybe years, if the doctors weren't told the truth about what the boys witnessed. Hardy was okay, not too bright, and he was making the mistake of talking to Mark as if he were five years old instead of eleven. He described the padded walls and rolled his eyes around with great exaggeration. He told of patients being chained to beds, as if spinning some horror story around the campfire. Mark was tired of it. Mark could think of little except Ricky, and whether he would remove his thumb and start talking. He desperately wanted this to happen, but he wanted to have first crack at Ricky when the shock ended. They had things to discuss. What if the doctors, or, heaven forbid, the cops got to him first, and Ricky told the whole story? and they all knew Mark was lying. What would they do to him if they caught him lying? Maybe they wouldn't believe Ricky. Since he'd blanked out and left the world for a while, maybe they would tend to believe Mark instead. This conflict in stories was too awful to think about. It's amazing how lies grow. You start with a small one that seems easy to cover, then you get boxed in and tell another one, then another. People believe you at first, and they act upon your lies, and you catch yourself wishing you'd simply told the truth. He could have told the truth to the cops and to his mother. He could have explained in great detail everything that Ricky saw, and the secret would still be safe, because Ricky didn't know. Things were happening so fast he couldn't plan. He wanted to get his mother in a room with the door locked and unload all this, just stop it now before it got worse. If he didn't do something, he might go to jail, and Ricky might go to the nuthouse for kids. Hardy appeared with a tray covered with french fries and cheeseburgers, two for him and one for Mark. He arranged the food neatly and returned the tray. Mark nibbled on a french fry. Hardy launched into a burger. "'So what happened to your face?' Hardy asked, chomping away. Mark rubbed the knot and remembered he'd been wounded in the fray. Oh, nothing, just got in a fight in school. Who's the other kid? Damn it, cops are relentless. Tell one lie to cover another. He was sick of lying. You don't know him, he answered, then bit into his cheeseburger. I might want to talk to him. Why? 
Did you get in trouble for this fight? I mean, did your teacher take you to the principal's office or anything like that? No, it happened when school was out. I thought you said you got in a fight at school. Well, it sort of started at school, okay? Me and this guy got into it at lunch and agreed to meet when school was out. Hardy drew mightily on the tiny straw in his milkshake. He swallowed hard, cleared his mouth, and said, What's the other kid's name? Why do you want to know? This angered Hardy, and he stopped chewing. Mark refused to look into his eyes, and he bent low over his food and stared at the ketchup. I'm a cop, kid. It's my job to ask questions. Do I have to answer them? Of course you do. Unless, of course, you're hiding something and afraid to answer. At that point, I'll have to get with your mother and perhaps take the both of you down to the station for more questioning. Questioning about what? What exactly do you want to know? Who is the kid you had a fight with today? Mark nibbled forever on the end of a long fry. Hardy picked up the second cheeseburger. A spot of mayonnaise hung from the corner of his mouth. I don't want to get him in trouble, Mark said. He won't get in trouble. Then why do you want to know his name? I just want to know. It's my job, okay? You think I'm lying, don't you? Mark asked, looking pitifully into the bulging face. The chomping stopped. I don't know, kid. Your story is full of holes. Mark looked even more pitiful. I can't remember everything. It happened so fast. You expect me to give every little detail, and I can't remember it that way. Hardy stuck a wad of fries in his mouth. Eat your food. We'd better get back. Thanks for the dinner. Ricky was in a private room on the ninth floor. A large sign by the elevator labeled it as the psychiatric wing, and it was much quieter. The lights were dimmer, the voices softer, the traffic much slower. The nurse's station was near the elevator, and those stepping off were scrutinized. A security guard whispered with the nurses and watched the hallways. Down from the elevators, away from the rooms, was a small, dark sitting area with the television, soft drink machines, magazines, and Gideon Bibles. Mark and Hardy were alone in the waiting area. Mark sipped a Sprite, his third, and watched a rerun of Hill Street Blues on cable while Hardy dozed fitfully on the terribly undersized couch. It was almost nine, and half an hour had passed since Diane had walked him down the hall to Ricky's room for a quick peek. He looked small under the sheets. The IV Diane had explained was to feed him because he wouldn't eat. She assured him Ricky would be all right, but Mark studied her eyes and knew she was worried. Dr. Greenway would return in a bit and wanted to talk to Mark. "'Has he said anything?' Mark had asked as he studied the IV. "'No, not a word.' She took his hand, and they walked through the dim hallway to the sitting area. At least five times Mark had almost blurted something out. They had passed an empty room not far from Ricky's, and he thought of dragging her inside for a confession, but he didn't. Later, he kept telling himself. I'll tell her later. Hardy had stopped asking questions. His shift ended at ten, and it was obvious he was tired of Mark and Ricky and the hospital. He wanted to return to the streets. A pretty nurse in a short skirt walked past the elevators and motioned for Mark to follow her. He eased from his chair, holding his sprite. She took his hand, and there was something exciting about this. Her fingernails were long and red. Her skin was smooth and tanned. She had blonde hair and a perfect smile, and she was young. Her name was Karen, and she squeezed his hand a bit tighter than necessary. His heart skipped a beat. Dr. Greenway wants to talk to you, she said, leaning down as she walked. Her perfume lingered, and it was the most wonderful fragrance Mark could remember. She walked him to Ricky's room, number 943, and released his hand. The door was closed, so she knocked slightly and opened it. Mark entered slowly, and Karen patted him on the shoulder. He watched her leave through the half-open door. Dr. Greenway now wore a shirt and tie with a white lab jacket over it. An ID tag hung from the left front pocket. He was a skinny man with round glasses and a black beard and seemed too young to be doing this. "'Come in, Mark,' he said, after Mark was already in the room and standing at the foot of Ricky's bed. "'Sit here,' he pointed to a plastic chair next to a fold-away bed under the window. His voice was low, almost a whisper. Diane sat with her feet curled under her on the bed. Her shoes were on the floor.' 
She wore blue jeans and a sweater, and stared at Ricky under the sheets with a tube in his arm. A lamp on a table near the bathroom door provided the only light. The blinds were shut tight. Mark eased into the plastic chair, and Dr. Greenway sat on the edge of the foldaway, not two feet away. He squinted and frowned and projected such somberness that Mark thought for a second they were all about to die. "'I need to talk to you about what happened,' he said. He was not whispering now. It was obvious Ricky was in another world, and they were unafraid of waking him. Diane was behind Greenway, still staring blankly at the bed. Mark wanted her alone so he could talk and work out of this mess, but she was back there in the darkness behind the doctor ignoring him. "'Has he said anything?' Mark asked first. The past three hours with Hardy had been nothing but quick questions, and the habit was hard to break. No. How sick is he? Very sick, Greenway answered, his tiny dark eyes glowing at Mark. What did he see this afternoon? Is this in secret? Yes, anything you tell me is strictly confidential. What if the cops want to know what I tell you? I can't tell them, I promise. This is all very secret and confidential. Just you and me and your mother. We're all trying to help Ricky, and I've got to know what happened. Maybe a good dose of the truth would help everyone, especially Ricky. Mark looked at the small blonde head with hair sticking in all directions on the pillow. Why, oh, why didn't they just run when the black car pulled up and parked? He was suddenly hit with guilt, and it terrified him. All of this was his fault. He should have known better than to mess with a crazy man. His lip quivered and his eyes watered. He was cold. It was time to tell all. He was running out of lies, and Ricky needed help. Greenway watched every move. And then Hardy walked slowly by the door. He paused for a second in the hall and locked eyes with Mark, then disappeared. Mark knew he wasn't far away. Greenway had not seen him. Mark started with the cigarettes. His mother looked at him hard, but if she was angry she didn't convey it. She shook her head once or twice, but never said a word. He spoke in a low voice, his eyes alternating quickly between Greenway and the door, and described the tree with the rope and the woods and the clearing, then the car. He left out a good chunk of the story, but did admit to Greenway, in a soft voice and in extreme confidence, that he once crawled to the car and removed the hose, and when he did so, Ricky cried and peed in his pants. Ricky begged him not to do it. He could tell Greenway liked this part. Diane listened without expression. Hardy walked by again, but Mark pretended not to see him. He paused in his story for a few seconds, then told how the man stormed out of the car, saw the garden hose lying harmlessly in the weeds, and crawled on the trunk and shot himself. How far away was Ricky? Greenway asked. Mark looked around the room. You see that door across the hall? he asked, pointing. From here to there? Greenway looked and rubbed his beard. About forty feet. That's not very far. It was very close. What exactly did Ricky do when the shot was fired? Diane was listening now. It apparently had just occurred to her that this was a different version from the earlier one. She wrinkled her forehead and looked hard at her eldest. I'm sorry, Mom. I was too scared to think. Don't be angry with me. You actually saw the man shoot himself? she asked in disbelief. Yes. She looked at Ricky. No wonder. What did Ricky do when the shot was fired? I wasn't looking at Ricky. I was watching the man with the gun. Poor baby, Diane mumbled in the background. Greenway held up a hand to cut her off. Was Ricky close to you? Mark glanced at the door and explained faintly how Ricky had frozen, then started away in an awkward jog, arms straight down, a dull moaning sound coming from his mouth. He told it all with dead accuracy from the point of the shooting to the point of the ambulance and left out nothing. He closed his eyes and relived each step, each movement. It felt wonderful to be so truthful. "'Why didn't you tell me you watched the man kill himself?' Diane asked. This irritated Greenway. "'Please, Mrs. Sway, you can discuss it with him later,' he said, without taking his eyes off Mark. "'What was the last word Ricky said?' 
Greenway asked. He thought and watched the door. The hall was empty. I really can't remember. Sergeant Hardy huddled with his lieutenant and special agent Jason McThune of the FBI. They chatted in the sitting area next to the soft drink machines. Another FBI agent loitered suspiciously near the elevator. The hospital security guard glared at him. The lieutenant explained hurriedly to Hardy that it was now an FBI matter, that the dead man's car and all other physical evidence had been turned over by Memphis P.D., that print experts had finished dusting the car and found lots of fingerprints too small for an adult and they needed to know if Mark had dropped any clues or changed his story. No, but I'm not convinced he's telling the truth, Hardy said. Has he touched anything we can take? McThune asked quickly, unconcerned about Hardy's theories or convictions. What do you mean? We have a strong suspicion the kid was in the car at some point before Clifford died. We need to lift the kid's prints from something and see if they match. What makes you think he was in the car? Hardy asked with great anticipation. I'll explain later, his lieutenant said. Hardy looked around the sitting area and suddenly pointed to a trash basket by the chair Mark had sat in. There. The Sprite can. He drank a Sprite while sitting right there. McThune looked up and down the hall and carefully wrapped a handkerchief around the Sprite can. He placed it in the pocket of his coat. It's definitely his, Hardy said. This is the only trash basket and that's the only Sprite can. I'll run this to our fingerprint men, McThune said. Is the kid Mark staying here tonight? I think so, Hardy said. They've moved a portable bed into his brother's room. Looks like they'll all sleep in there. Why is the FBI concerned with Clifford? I'll explain later, said his lieutenant. Stay here for another hour. I'm supposed to be off in ten minutes. You need the overtime. Dr. Greenway sat in the plastic chair near the bed and studied his notes. I'm going to leave in a minute, but I'll be back early in the morning. He's stable, and I expect little change through the night. The nurses will check in every so often. Call them if he wakes up. He flipped a page of notes and read the chicken scratch, then looked at Diane. It's a severe case of acute post-traumatic stress disorder. What does that mean? Mark asked. Diane rubbed her temples and kept her eyes closed. Sometimes a person sees a terrible event and cannot cope with it. Ricky was badly scared when you removed the garden hose from the tailpipe, and when he saw the man shoot himself he was suddenly exposed to a terrifying experience that he couldn't handle. It triggered a response in him. He sort of snapped. It shocked his mind and body. He was able to run home, which is quite remarkable, because normally a person traumatized like Ricky would immediately become numb and paralyzed. He paused and placed his notes on the bed. There's not a lot we can do right now. I expect him to come around tomorrow or the next day at the latest, and we'll start talking about things. It may take some time. He'll have nightmares of the shooting and flashbacks. He'll deny it happened. Then he'll blame himself for it. He'll feel isolated, betrayed, bewildered, maybe even depressed. You just never know. How will you treat him? Diane asked. We have to make him feel safe. You must stay here at all times. Now you said the father's of no use. Keep him away from Ricky, Mark said sternly. Diane nodded. Fine. And there are no grandparents or relatives nearby? No. Very well. It's imperative that both of you stay in this room as much as possible for the next several days. Ricky must feel safe and secure. He'll need emotional and physical support from you. He and I will talk several times a day. It will be important for Mark and Ricky to talk about the shooting. They need to share and compare their reactions. When do you think we might go home? Diane asked. I don't know, but as soon as possible. He needs the safety and familiarity of his bedroom and surroundings. Maybe a week, maybe two. Depends on how quickly he responds. Diane pulled her feet under her. I, uh, I have a job. I don't know what to do. I'll have my office contact your employer first thing in the morning. My employer runs a sweatshop. It is not a nice, clean corporation with benefits and sympathy. They will not send flowers. I'm afraid they won't understand. I'll do the best I can. What about school? Mark asked. Your mother has given me the name of the principal. I'll call first thing in the morning and talk to your teachers. Diane was rubbing her temples again. 
A nurse, not the pretty one, knocked while entering. She handed Diane two pills and a cup of water. "'It's Dalmaine,' Greenway said. "'It should help you rest. If not, call the nurse's station and they'll bring something stronger.' The nurse left, and Greenway stood and felt Ricky's forehead. "'See you guys in the morning. Get some sleep.' He smiled for the first time, then closed the door behind him. They were alone the tiny Swave family, or what was left of it. Mark moved closer to his mother and leaned on her shoulder. They looked at the small head on the large pillow less than five feet away. She patted his arm. It'll be all right, Mark. We've been through worse. She held him tight and he closed his eyes. I'm sorry, Mom. His eyes watered and he was ready for a cry. I'm so sorry about all this. She squeezed him and held him tight for a long minute. He sobbed quietly with his face buried in her shirt. She gently lay down with Mark still in her arms, and they curled together on the cheap foam mattress. Ricky's bed was two feet higher. The window was above them. The lights were low. Mark stopped the crying. It was something he was lousy at anyway. The dolmane was working, and she was exhausted. Nine hours of packing plastic lamps into cardboard boxes, five hours of a full-blown crisis, and now the dolmane. She was ready for a deep sleep. "'Will you get fired, Mom?' Mark asked. He worried about the family finances as much as she did. "'I don't think so. We'll worry about it tomorrow.' "'We need to talk, Mom. I know we do, but let's do it in the morning. Why can't we talk now?' She relaxed her grip and breathed deeply, eyes already closed. "'I'm very tired and sleepy, Mark. I promise we'll have a long talk first thing in the morning. You have some questions to answer, don't you? Now go brush your teeth and let's try and sleep.' Mark was suddenly tired, too. The hard line of a metal brace protruded through the cheap mattress, and he crept closer to the wall and pulled the lone sheet over him. His mother rubbed his arm. He stared at the wall six inches away and decided he could not sleep like this for a week. Her breathing was much heavier and she was completely still. He thought of Romy. Where was he now? Where was the chubby little body with a bald head? He remembered the sweat and how it poured from his shiny scalp and ran down in all directions, some dripping from his eyebrows and some soaking his collar. Even his ears were wet. Who would get his car? Who would clean it up and wash the blood off? Who would get the gun? Mark realized for the first time that his ears were no longer ringing from the gunfire in the car. Was Hardy still out there in the sitting room trying to sleep? Would the cops return tomorrow with more questions? What if they asked about the garden hose? What if they asked a thousand questions? He was wide awake now, staring at the wall. Lights from the outside trickled through the blinds. The dolmane worked well because his mother was breathing very slow and heavy. Ricky had not moved. He stared at the dim light above the table and thought of Hardy and the police. Were they watching him? Was he under surveillance like on television? Surely not. He watched them sleep for twenty minutes and got bored with it. It was time to explore. When he was a first grader, his father came home drunk late one night and started raising hell with Diane. They fought, and the trailer shook, and Mark eased open the shoddy window in his room and slid to the ground. He went for a long walk around the neighborhood, then through the woods. It was a hot, sticky night with plenty of stars, and he rested on a hill overlooking the trailer park. He prayed for the safety of his mother. He asked God for a family in which everyone could sleep without fear of abuse. Why couldn't they just be normal? He rambled for two hours. All was quiet when he returned home, and thus began a habit of nighttime excursions that had brought him much pleasure and peace. Mark was a thinker, a worrier, and when sleep came and went or wouldn't come at all, he went for long secret walks. He learned much. He wore dark clothing and moved like a thief through the shadows of Tucker Wheel Estates. 
He witnessed petty crimes of theft and vandalism, but he never told. He saw lovers sneak from windows. He loved to sit on the hill above the park on clear nights and enjoy a quiet smoke. The fear of getting caught by his mother had vanished years ago. She worked hard and slept sound. He was not afraid of strange places. He pulled the sheet over his mother's shoulder, did the same for Ricky, and quietly closed the door behind him. The hall was dark and empty. Karen the Gorgeous was busy at the nurse's desk. She smiled beautifully at him and stopped her writing. He wanted to go for some orange juice in the cafeteria, he said, and he knew how to get there. He'd be back in a minute. Karen grinned at him as he walked away, and Mark was in love. Hardy was gone. The sitting room was empty, but the television was on Hogan's Heroes. He took the empty elevator to the basement. The cafeteria was deserted. A man with casts on both legs sat stiffly in a wheelchair at one table. The casts were shiny and clean. An arm was in a sling. A band of thick gauze covered the top of his head, and it looked as though the hair had been shaven. He was terribly uncomfortable. Mark paid for a pint of juice and sat at a table near the man. He grimaced in pain and shoved his soup away in frustration. He sipped juice through a straw and noticed Mark. "'What's up?' Mark asked with a smile. He could talk to anyone and felt sorry for the guy. The man glared at him, then looked away. He grimaced again and tried to adjust his legs. Mark tried not to stare. A man with a white shirt and tie appeared from nowhere with a tray of food and coffee and sat at a table on the other side of the injured guy. He didn't appear to notice Mark. "'Bad injury,' he said with a large smile. "'What happened?' "'Car wreck,' came the somewhat anguished reply. "'Got hit by an Exxon truck. Nut ran a stop sign.' The smile grew even larger, and the food and coffee were ignored. "'When did it happen?' Three days ago. "'Did you say Exxon truck?' The man was standing and moving quickly to the guy's table, pulling something out of his pocket. He took a chair and was suddenly sitting within inches of the casts. "'Eh, uh, the guy said warily. The man handed him a white card. "'My name's Gil Teal. I'm a lawyer, and I specialize in auto accidents, especially cases involving large trucks.' Gil Teal said this very rapidly, as if he'd hooked a large fish and had to work quickly or it might get away. "'That's my specialty. Big truck cases. Eighteen-wheelers, dump trucks, tankers, you name it. Now nah, go after them.' He thrust his hand across the table. "'Name's Gil Teal.' Luckily for the guy, his good arm was his right one, and he lamely slung it over the table to shake hands with this hustler. "'Joe Farris.' Gill pumped it furiously and eagerly moved in for the kill. "'What you got? Two broke legs, concussion, couple of puncture wounds, and broken collarbone. Great. Then we're looking at permanent disability. What type of work you do?' Gill asked, rubbing his chin in careful analysis. The card was lying on the table, untouched by Joe. They were unaware of Mark. "'Crane operator?' "'Union?' "'Yeah.' Wow! An Exxon truck ran a stop sign. No doubt about who's at fault here. Joe frowned and shifted again, and even Mark could tell he was rapidly tiring of Gill and this intrusion. He shook his head no. Gill made frantic notes on a napkin, then smiled at Joe and announced, I can get you at least six hundred thousand. I take only a third, and you walk away with four hundred thousand. Minimum. Four hundred grand tax-free, of course. We'll file suit tomorrow. Joe took this as if he'd heard it before. Gill hung in midair with his mouth open, proud of himself, full of confidence. "'I've talked to some other lawyers,' Joe said. "'I can get you more than anybody. I do this for a living. Nothing but truck cases. I've sued Exxon before. Know all the lawyers and corporate people locally, and they're terrified of me because I go for the jugular. It's warfare, Joe, and I'm the best man in town. I know how to play their dirty games. Just settled a truck case for almost half a million. They threw money at my client once he hired me. Not bragging, Joe, but I'm the best in town when it comes to these cases. A lawyer called me this morning and said he could get me a million. He's lying. What was his name? McFay? Ragnan? Snodgrass? I know these guys. I kick their asses all the time, Joe, and anyway, I said 600000 is a minimum. Could be much more. 
Hell, Joe, if they push us to trial, who knows how much a jury might give us. I'm in trial every day, Joe, kicking ass all over Memphis. Six hundred is a minimum. Have you hired anybody yet? Signed a contract? Joe shook his head. No, not yet. Wonderful. Look, Joe, you got a wife and kids, right? Ex-wife, three kids. So you got child support, man. Now listen to me. How much child support? Five hundred a month. That's low. And you got bills. Here's what I'll do. I'll advance you a thousand bucks a month to be applied against your settlement. If we settle in three months, I withhold three thousand. If it takes two years, and it won't. But if it does, I'll withhold twenty-four thousand or whatever. You follow me, Joe? Cash now on the spot. Joe shifted again and stared at the table. This other lawyer came by my room yesterday and said he'd advance two thousand now and float me two thousand a month. Who was it? Scotty Moss. Rob Lamoke, I know these guys, Joe, and they are trash. Can't find their way to the courthouse. You can't trust them. They are incompetent. I'll match it. Two thousand now and two thousand a month. This other guy with some big firm offered ten thousand up front and a line of credit for whatever I needed. Gill was crushed, and it was at least ten seconds before he could speak. Listen to me, Joe. It's not a matter of advance cash, okay? It's a matter of how much money I can get for you from Exxon. And nobody, I repeat, nobody will get more than me. Nobody. Look, I'll advance 5000 now and allow you to draw what you need to pay bills. Fair enough. i think about it. Time is critical, Joe. We must move fast. Evidence disappears. Memories fade. Big corporations move slow. I said, i think about it. Can I call you tomorrow? No. Why not? Hell, I can't sleep now for all the damn lawyers calling. I can't eat a meal without you guys barging in. There are more lawyers around this damn place than doctors. Gill was unmoved. There are a lot of sharks out there, Joe. A lot of really lousy lawyers who'll screw up your case. Sad but true. The profession is overcrowded, so lawyers are everywhere trying to find business. But don't make a mistake, Joe. Check me out. Look in the yellow pages. There's a full-page three-color ad for me, Joe. Look up Gil Teal and you'll see who's for real. Uh, think about it. Gil came forth with another card and handed it to Joe. He said goodbye and left, never touching the food or coffee on his tray. Joe was suffering. He grabbed the wheel with his right arm and slowly rolled himself away. Mark wanted to help but thought better of asking. Both of Gill's cards were on the table. He finished his juice, glanced around, and picked up one of the cards. Mark told Karen, his sweetheart, that he couldn't sleep and would be watching television if anyone needed him. He sat on the couch in the waiting area and flipped through the phone book while watching Cheers reruns. He sipped another Sprite. Hardy, bless his heart, had given him eight quarters after dinner. Karen brought him a blanket and tucked it around his legs. She patted his arm with her long, thin hands and glided away. He watched every step. Mr. Gil Teal did indeed have a full-page ad in the attorney section of the Memphis Yellow Pages, along with a dozen other lawyers. There was a nice picture of him standing casually outside a courthouse with his jacket off and sleeves rolled up. I fight for your rights, it said under the photo. In bold red letters across the top, the question, Have you been injured? cried out. Thick green print answered just below. If so, call Gil Teal. He's for real. Farther down in blue print, Gil listed all the types of cases he handled, and there were hundreds. Lawn mowers, electrical shock, deformed babies, car wrecks, exploding water heaters, eighteen years' experience in all courts. A small map in the corner of the ad directed the world to his office, which was just across the street from the courthouse. Mark heard a familiar voice, and suddenly there he was, Gil Teal himself, on television, standing beside a hospital emergency entrance, talking about injured loved ones and crooked insurance companies. Red lights flashed in the background. Paramedics ran behind him. But Gil had the situation under control, and he would take your case for nothing down, no fee unless he recovered. Small world. In the past two hours Mark had seen him in person, picked up one of his business cards, was literally looking at his face in the yellow pages, and now here he was speaking to him from the television. He closed the phone book and laid it on the cluttered coffee table. 
he pulled the blanket over him and decided to go to sleep. Tomorrow he might call Giltil. Chapter 7 Fultrig liked to be escorted. He especially enjoyed those priceless moments when the cameras were rolling and waiting for him, and at just the right moment he would stroll majestically through the hall or down the courthouse steps, with Wally Box in front like a pit bull, and Thomas Fink or another assistant by his side, brushing off idiotic questions. He spent many quiet moments watching videos of himself darting in and out of courthouses with a small entourage. His timing was usually perfect. He had the walk perfected. He held his hands up patiently, as if he would love to answer questions, but being a man of great importance, he just didn't have the time. Soon thereafter, Wally would call the reporters in for an orchestrated press conference, in which Roy himself would break from his brutal work schedule and spend a few moments in the lights. A small library in the U.S. Attorney's suite had been converted to a press room, complete with floodlights and a sound system. Roy kept makeup in a locked cabinet. As he entered the Federal Building on Main Street in Memphis a few minutes after midnight, he had an escort of sorts with Wally and Fink and Agents Truman and Scherf, but there were no anxious reporters. In fact, not a soul waited for him until he entered the offices of the FBI, where Jason McThune sipped stale coffee with two other weary agents. So much for grand entrances. Introductions were handled quickly as they walked to McThune's cramped office. Fultrick took the only available seat. McThune was a twenty-year man who'd been shipped to Memphis four years earlier against his wishes, and was counting the months until he could leave for the Pacific Northwest. He was tired and irritated because it was late. He'd heard of Fultrick, but never met him. The rumors described him as a pompous ass. An agent who was unidentified and unintroduced closed the door, and McThune fell into his seat behind the desk. He covered the basics, the finding of the car, the contents of it, the gun, the wound, the time of death, and on and on. Kid's name is Mark Sway. He told Memphis PD he and his younger brother happened upon the body and ran to call the authorities. They live about a half a mile away in a trailer park. The younger kid's in the hospital now, suffering from what appears to be traumatic shock. Mark Sway and his mother Diane, divorced, are also at the hospital. The father lives here in the city and has a record of petty stuff, DUIs, fights, and the like. Sophisticated criminal. Low-class white people. Anyway, the kid's lying. I couldn't read the note, Fultrig interrupted, dying to say something. The facts was bad. He said this as if McThune and the Memphis FBI were inept because he, Roy Fultrig, had received a bad fax in his van. McThune glanced at Larry Truman and Skipper Scherf standing against the wall and continued, I'll get to that in a minute. We know the kid's lying because he says they arrived on the scene after Clifford shot himself. Looks doubtful. First, the kid's fingerprints are all over the car, inside and out. On the dash, on the door, on the whiskey bottle, on the gun, everywhere. We lifted a print from him about two hours ago, and we've had our people all over the car. They'll finish up tomorrow. But it's obvious the kid was inside. Doing what? Well, we're not yet certain. We've also found prints all around the rear taillights just above the exhaust pipe, and there were also three fresh cigarette butts under a tree near the car. Virginia Slims, the same brand used by Diane Sway. We figure the kids were being kids, took the cigarettes from their mother and went for a smoke. They were minding their own business when Clifford appears from nowhere. They hide and watch him. It's a dense area, and hiding is no problem. Maybe they sneak around and pull out the hose. We're not sure, and the kids aren't telling. The little boy can't talk right now, and Mark evidently is lying. Anyway, it's obvious the hose didn't work. We're trying to match prints on it, but it's tedious work, maybe impossible. I'll have photos in the morning to show the location of the hose when Memphis PD arrived. McThune lifted a yellow notepad from the wreckage on his desk. He spoke to it, not to Fultrick. Clifford fired at least one shot from inside the car. The bullet exited through the center, almost exactly of the front passenger window, which cracked but did not shatter. No idea why he did this, and no idea when it was done. 
The autopsy was finished an hour ago, and Clifford was full of Dalmain, codeine, and percodan. Plus, his blood alcohol content was .22, so he was drunk as a skunk, as these people say down here. My point being, not only was he off his rocker enough to kill himself, but he was also drunk and stoned, so there's no way to figure out a lot of this. We're not tracking a rational mind. I understand that, Roy nodded impatiently, while the box hovered behind him like a well-trained terrier. McThune ignored him. The gun's a cheap thirty-eight he purchased illegally at a pawn shop here in Memphis. We've questioned the owner, but he won't talk without his lawyer present, so we'll do that in the morning. Or this morning, I should say. A Texaco receipt shows a purchase of gasoline in Vaden, Mississippi, about an hour and a half from here. The clerk's a kid who says she thinks he stopped around 1 p.m. No other evidence of any stops. His secretary says he left the office around 9 a.m., said he had an errand to run, and she didn't hear a word until we called. Frankly, she's not very upset at the news. It looks as though he left New Orleans shortly after 9, drove to Memphis in five or six hours, stopped once for gas, stopped to buy the gun, and drove off and shot himself. Maybe he stopped for lunch, maybe to buy whiskey, maybe a lot of things. We're digging. Why Memphis? Wally Box asked. Fultrig nodded, obviously approving the question. Because he was born here, McThune said solemnly, while staring at Fultrig as if everyone prefers to die in the place of their birth. It was a humorous response delivered by a serious face, and Fultrig missed it all. McThune had heard he was not too bright. Evidently, the family moved away when he was a child, he explained after a pause. He went to college at Rice and law school at Tulane. We were in law school together, Fink said proudly. That's great. The note was handwritten and dated today, or yesterday, I should say. Handwritten with a black felt-tip pen of some sort. The pen wasn't found on him or in the car. McThune picked up a sheet of paper and leaned across the desk. Here, this is the original. Be careful with it. Wally Box leaped at it and handed it to Fultrig, who studied it. McThune rubbed his eyes and continued, just funeral arrangements and directions to his secretary. Look at the bottom. It looks as though he tried to add something with a blue ballpoint pen, but the pen was out of ink. Fultrig's nose got closer to the note. It says, Mark, Mark, where are? And I can't make out the rest of it. Right. The handwriting is awful and the pen ran out of ink, but our experts say the same thing. Mark, Mark, where are? He also thinks that Clifford was drunk or stoned or something when he tried to write this. We found the pen in the car, cheap Bic. No doubt it's the pen. He has no children, nephews, brothers, uncles, or cousins by the name of Mark. We're checking his close friends. His secretary said he had none, but as of now, we haven't found a Mark. So what does it mean? There's one other thing. A few hours ago, Mark Sway rode to the hospital with a Memphis cop by the name of Hardy. Along the way, he let it slip that Romy said it did something. Romy, short for Jerome, according to Mr. Clifford's secretary. In fact, she said more people called him Romy than Jerome. How would the kid know the nickname unless Mr. Clifford himself told him? Fultrig listened with his mouth open. What do you think? he asked. Well, my theory is that the kid was in the car before Clifford shot himself and that he was there for some time because of all the prints and that he and Clifford talked about something. Then, at some point, the kid leaves the car. Clifford tries to add something to his note and shoots himself. The kid's scared, his little brother goes into shock, and here we are. Why would the kid lie? One, he's scared. Two, he's a kid. Three... Maybe Clifford told him something he doesn't need to know. McThune's delivery was perfect, and the dramatic punchline left a heavy silence in the room. Fultrig was frozen. Box and Fink stared blankly at the desk with open mouths. Because his boss was temporarily at a loss, Wally Box moved in defensively and asked a stupid question. Why do you think this? McThune's patience with U.S. attorneys and their little flunkies had been exhausted about twenty years ago. He'd seen them come and go. he learned to play their games and manipulate their egos. He knew the best way to handle their banalities was simply to respond. 
because of the note, the prints, and the lies. The poor kid doesn't know what to do. Fultrick placed the note on the desk and cleared his throat. Have you talked to the kid? No. I went to the hospital two hours ago, but did not see him. Sergeant Hardy of Memphis PD talked to him. Do you plan to? Yes, in a few hours. Truman and I will go to the hospital around nine or so and talk to the kid and maybe his mother. I'd also like to talk to the little brother, but it'll depend on his doctor. I'd like to be there, Fultrick said. Everyone knew it was coming. McThune shook his head. Not a good idea. We'll handle it. He was abrupt, and left no doubt that he was in charge. This was Memphis, not New Orleans. What about the kid's doctor? Have you talked to him? No, not yet. We'll try this morning. I doubt if he'll say much. Do you think these kids would tell the doctor? Fink asked innocently. McThune rolled his eyes at Truman as if to say, What kind of dumbasses have you brought me? I can't answer that, sir. I don't know what the kids know. I don't know the doctor's name. I don't know if he's talked to the kids. I don't know if the kids will tell him anything. Fultrig frowned at Fink, who shrank with embarrassment. McThune glanced at his watch and stood. Gentlemen, it's late. Our people will finish with the car by noon, and I suggest we meet then. We must know everything Mark Sway knows, Roy said without moving. He was in that car, and Clifford talked to him. I know that. Yes, Mr. Maxune, but there are some things you don't know. Clifford knew the location of the body, and he was talking about it. There are a lot of things I don't know, Mr. Fultrig, because this is a New Orleans case, and I work Memphis. You understand? I don't want to know any more about poor Mr. Boyette and poor Mr. Clifford. I'm up to my ass in dead bodies here. It's almost 1 a.m., and I'm sitting here in my office working on a case that's not mine, talking to you fellas and answering your questions. And I'll work on the case until noon tomorrow, then my pal Larry Truman here can have it. I'll be finished. Unless, of course, you get a call from Washington. Yes, unless, of course, I get a call from Washington. Then I'll do whatever Mr. Voyles tells me. I talk to Mr. Voyles every week. Congratulations. The Boyette case is the FBI's top priority at this moment, according to him. So I've heard. And I'm sure Mr. Voyles will appreciate your efforts. I doubt it. Roy stood slowly and stared at McThune. It is imperative that we know everything Mark Sway knows. Do you understand? McThune returned the stare and said nothing. Chapter 8 Karen checked on Mark throughout the night and brought him orange juice around eight. He was alone in the small waiting room. She woke him gently. In spite of his many problems at the moment, he was falling hopelessly in love with this beautiful nurse. He sipped the juice and looked into her sparkling brown eyes. She patted the blanket covering his legs. "'How old are you?' he asked. She smiled even wider. Twenty-four. Thirteen years older than you. Why do you ask? Just a habit. Are you married? No. She gently removed the blanket and began folding it. How is the sofa? Mark stood, stretched, and watched her. Better than that bed Mom had to sleep on. Did you work all night? From eight to eight. We're doing twelve-hour shifts four days a week. Come with me. Dr. Greenway's in the room and wants to see you. She took his hand, which helped immensely, and they walked to Ricky's room. Karen left and closed the door behind her. Diane looked tired. She stood at the foot of Ricky's bed with an unlit cigarette in her trembling hand. Mark stood next to her, and she put her arm on his shoulder. They watched as Greenway rubbed Ricky's forehead and spoke to him. His eyes were closed, and he was not responding. He doesn't hear you, doctor, Diane said finally. It was difficult to listen to Greenway chat away in baby talk. He ignored her. She wiped a tear from her cheek. Mark smelled fresh soap and noticed her hair was wet. She'd changed clothes, but there was no makeup and her face was different. Greenway stood straight. A most severe case, he said properly, almost to himself while staring at the closed eyes. What's next? she asked. We wait. His vital signs are stable and there's no physical danger. 
He'll come around, and when he does, it's imperative that you be in this room. Greenway was looking at them now, rubbing his beard deep in thought. He must see his mother when he opens his eyes. Do you understand this? I'm not leaving. You, Ma, can come and go a bit, but it's best if you stay here as much as possible, too. Mark nodded his head. The thought of spending another minute in the room was painful. The first moments can be crucial. He'll be frightened when he looks around. He needs to see and feel his mother. Hold him and reassure him. Call the nurse immediately. I'll leave instructions. He'll be very hungry, so we'll try and get some food in him. The nurse will remove the IV so we can walk around the room. But the important thing is to hold him. When do you... I don't know. Probably today or tomorrow. There's no way to predict. Have you seen cases like this before? Greenway looked at Ricky and decided to go for the truth. He shook his head. Not quite this bad. He's almost comatose, which is a bit unusual. Normally, after a period of good rest, they'll be awake and eating. He almost managed to smile. But I'm not concerned. Ricky will be all right. It'll just take some time. Ricky seemed to hear this. He grunted and stretched, but did not open his eyes. They watched intently, hoping for a mumble or word. Though Mark preferred that he remain silent about the shooting until they discussed it alone, he desperately wanted his little brother to wake up and start talking about other matters. He was tired of looking at him, curled up on the pillow, sucking that damned thumb. Greenway reached into his bag and produced a newspaper. It was the Memphis Press, the morning paper. He laid it on the bed and handed Diane a card. My office is in the building next door. Here's the phone number, just in case. Remember, the moment he wakes up, call the nurse's station, and they'll call me immediately, okay? Diane took the card and nodded. Greenway unfolded the newspaper on Ricky's bed in front of them. Have you seen this? No, she answered. At the bottom of the front page was a headline about Romy. New Orleans lawyer commits suicide in North Memphis. Under the headline to the right was a big photo of W. Jerome Clifford, and to the left was the smaller headline, Flamboyant Criminal Lawyer with Suspected Mob Ties. The word mob jumped at Mark. He stared at Romy's face and suddenly needed to vomit. Greenway leaned forward and lowered his voice. It seems as though Mr. Clifford was a rather well-known lawyer in New Orleans. He was involved in the Senator Boyette case. Apparently he was the attorney for the man charged with the murder. Have you kept up with it? Diane actually put the unlit cigarette in her mouth. She shook her head no. Well, it's a big case. The first U.S. senator to be murdered in office. You can read this after I leave. There are police and FBI downstairs. They were waiting when I arrived an hour ago. Mark grabbed the railing on the foot of the bed. They want to talk to Mark, and, of course, they want you present. Why? she asked. Greenway looked at his watch. The Boyette case is complicated. I think you'll understand more after you read the story here. I told them you and Mark could not speak with them until I say so. Is this all right? Yes, Mark blurted. I don't want to talk to them. Diane and Greenway looked at him. I may end up like Ricky if these cops keep bugging me. For some reason, Mark knew the police would return with a lot of questions. They were not finished with him. But the photo on the front page of the paper and the mention of the FBI suddenly sent chills over him, and he needed to sit down. "'Keep them away for now,' Diane said to Greenway. "'They asked if they could see you at nine, and I said no, but they won't go away.' He looked at his watch again. "'I'll be here at noon. Perhaps we should talk to them then. Whatever you think she said. Very well. I'll put them off until twelve. My office is called your employer and the school. Try not to worry about that. Just stay by his bed until I return. He almost smiled as he closed the door behind him. Diane ran to the bathroom and lit her cigarette. Mark punched the remote control by Ricky's bed until the television was on and he found the local news. Nothing but weather and sports. Diane finished the story about Mr. Clifford and placed the paper on the floor under the fold-away bed. Mark watched anxiously. "'His client killed a United States senator,' she said in awe. "'No kidding. There were about to be some tough questions,' 
and Mark was suddenly hungry. It was past nine. Ricky hadn't moved. The nurses had forgotten about them. Greenway seemed like ancient history. The FBI was waiting somewhere in the darkness. The room was growing smaller by the minute, and the cheap cot on which he was sitting was ruining his back. I wonder why he did that, he said, because he could think of nothing else to say. It says Jerome Clifford had ties with the New Orleans mob and that his client is widely thought to be a member. He'd seen The Godfather on cable. In fact, he'd even seen the first sequel to The Godfather, and he knew all about the mob. Scenes from the movies flashed before his eyes, and the pains in his stomach grew sharper. His heart pounded. I'm hungry, Mom. Are you hungry? Why didn't you tell me the truth, Mark? Because the cop was in the trailer, and it wasn't a good time to talk. I'm sorry, Mom. I promise I'm sorry. I planned to tell you as soon as we were alone, I promise. She rubbed her temples and looked so sad. You never lie to me, Mark. Never say never. Can we talk about this later, Mom? I'm really hungry. Give me a couple of bucks, and I'll run down to the cafeteria and get some doughnuts. I'd love a doughnut. I'll get you some coffee. He was on his feet, waiting for the money. Fortunately, she was not in the mood for a serious talk about truthfulness and such. The Dalmain lingered, and her thoughts were slow. Her head pounded. She opened a purse and gave him a five-dollar bill. Where's the cafeteria? Basement. Madison Wing. I've been there twice. Why am I not surprised? I suppose you've been all over this place. He took the money and crammed it in the pocket of his jeans. Yes, ma'am. We're on the quietest floor. The babies are in the basement, and it's a circus down there. Be careful. He closed the door behind him. She waited, then took the bottle of Valium from her purse. Greenway had sent it. Mark ate four doughnuts during Donahue and watched his mother try to nap on the bed. He kissed her on the forehead and told her he needed to roam around a bit. She told him not to leave the hospital. He used the stairs again because he figured Hardy and the FBI and the rest of the gang might be hanging around somewhere downstairs waiting for him to happen by. Like most big city charity hospitals, St. Peter's had been built over time, whenever funds could be squeezed, with little thought of architectural symmetry. It was a sprawling and bewildering configuration of additions and wings, with a maze of hallways and corridors and mezzanines trying desperately to connect everything. Elevators and escalators had been added wherever they would fit. At some point in history, someone had realized the difficulty of moving from one point to another without getting hopelessly lost, and a dazzling array of color-coded signs had been implemented for the orderly flow of traffic. Then more wings were added. The signs became obsolete, but the hospital failed to remove them. Now they only added to the confusion. Mark darted through now-familiar territory and exited the hospital through a small lobby on Monroe Avenue. He'd studied a map of downtown in the front of the phone book, and he knew Gil Teal's office was within easy walking distance. It was on the third floor of a building four blocks away. He moved quickly. It was Tuesday, a school day, and he wanted to avoid truant officers. He was the only kid on the street, and he knew he was out of place. A new strategy was developing. What was wrong, he asked himself as he stared at the sidewalk and avoided eye contact with the pedestrians passing by, with making an anonymous phone call to the cops or FBI and telling them exactly where the body was. The secret would no longer belong only to him. If Romy wasn't lying, he was the only kid on the street, and he knew he was out of place. A new strategy was developing. What was wrong, he asked himself as he stared at the sidewalk and avoided eye contact with the pedestrians passing by, with making an anonymous phone call to the cops or FBI and telling them exactly where the body was. The secret would no longer belong only to him. He turned on Third Street and darted into the Steric building. It was old and very tall. The lobby was tile and marble. He entered the elevator with a crowd of others and punched the button for the third floor. Four other buttons were pushed by people wearing nice clothes and carrying briefcases. They chatted quietly in the normal, hushed tones of elevator talk. His stop was first. 
He stepped into a small lobby with hallways running left, right, and straight ahead. He went left and roamed about innocently, trying to appear calm, as if lawyer shopping were a chore he'd done many times. There were plenty of lawyers in the building. Their names were etched on distinguished bronze plates screwed into the doors, and some doors were covered with rather long and intimidating names with lots of initials followed by periods. J. Winston Buckner F. MacDonald Durston I. Hempstead Crawford The more names Mark read, the more he longed for plain old Gil Teal. He found Mr. Teal's door at the end of the hall, and there was no bronze plate. The words, Gil Teal, the people's lawyer, were painted in bold black letters from the top of the door to the bottom. Three people waited in the hall beside it. Mark swallowed and entered the office. It was packed. The small waiting room was filled with sad people suffering from all sorts of injuries and wounds. Crutches were everywhere. Two people sat in wheelchairs. There were no empty seats, and one poor man in a neck brace sat on the cluttered coffee table, his head wobbling around like a newborn's. A lady with a dirty cast on her foot cried softly. A small girl with a horribly burned face clung to her mother. War could not have been more pitiful. It was worse than the emergency room at St. Peter's. Mr. Teal certainly had been busy rounding up clients. Mark decided to leave when someone called out rudely, What do you want? It was a large lady behind the receptionist's window. You kid, you want something? Her voice boomed around the room, but no one noticed. The suffering continued unabated. He stepped to the window and looked at the scowling, ugly face. I'd like to see Mr. Teal, he said softly, looking around. Oh, you would. Do you have an appointment? She picked up a clipboard and studied it. No, ma'am. What's your name? Um, uh, Mark Sway. It's a very private matter. I'm sure it is. She glared at him from head to toe. What type of injury is it? He thought about the Exxon truck and how it had excited Mr. Teal, but he knew he couldn't pull it off. I, uh, I don't have an injury. Well, you're in the wrong place. Why do you need a lawyer? It's a long story. Look, kid, you see all these people? They've all got appointments to see Mr. Teal. He's a very busy man, and he only takes cases involving death or injuries. Okay. Mark was already retreating and thinking about the minefield of canes and crutches behind him. Now, please, go bother someone else. Sure. And if I get hit by a truck or something, I'll come back to see you. He walked through the carnage and made a quick exit. He took the stairs down and explored the second floor. More lawyers. On one door he counted twenty-two bronze names. Lawyers on top of lawyers. Surely one of these guys could help him. He passed a few of them in the hall. They were too busy to notice. A security guard suddenly appeared and walked slowly toward him. Mark glanced at the next door. The words, Reggie Love, Lawyer, were painted on it in small letters, and he casually turned the knob and stepped inside. The small reception area was quiet and empty. Not a single client was waiting. Two chairs and a sofa sat around a glass table. The magazines were arranged neatly. Soft music came from above. A pretty rug covered the hardwood floor. A young man with a tie but no coat stood from his desk behind some potted trees and walked a few steps forward. "'May I help you?' he asked, quite pleasantly. "'Yes. I need to see a lawyer.' "'You're a bit young to need a lawyer, aren't you?' "'Yes, but I'm having some problems. "'Are you Reggie, love?' "'No, Reggie's in the back. I'm her secretary. "'What's your name?' "'He was her secretary. "'Reggie was a she. "'The secretary was a he. "'Uh, Mark Sway. "'You're a secretary?' "'And a paralegal, among other things. "'Why aren't you in school?' "'A nameplate on the desk identified him as Clint Van Hooser. "'So you're not a lawyer?' No, Reggie's the lawyer. Then I need to speak with Reggie. She's busy right now. You can have a seat. He waved at the sofa. How long will it be? Mark asked. I don't know. The young man was amused by this kid needing a lawyer. I'll tell her you're here. Maybe she can see you for a minute. It's very important. The kid was nervous and sincere. 
His eyes glanced at the doors as if someone had followed him here. "'Are you in trouble, Mark?' Clint asked. "'Yes.' "'What type of trouble? You need to tell me a little bit about it or Reggie won't talk to you.' "'I'm supposed to talk to the FBI at noon and I think I need a lawyer.' "'This was good enough. Have a seat. It'll be a minute.' Mark eased into a chair, and as soon as Clint disappeared, he opened a yellow phone book and flipped through the pages until he found the attorneys. There was Gil Teal again in his full-page spread. Pages and pages of huge ads, all crying out for injured people. Photos of busy and important men and women holding thick law books, or sitting behind wide desks, or listening intently to the telephones stuck in their ears. Then half-page ones, then quarter. Reggie Love was not there. What kind of lawyer was she? Reggie Love was one of thousands in the Memphis Yellow Pages. She couldn't be much of a lawyer if the Yellow Pages thought so little of her, and the thought of racing from the office crossed his mind. But then there was Gil Teal, the one for real, the people's lawyer, the star of the Yellow Pages, who also had enough fame to get himself on television, and just look at his office down the hall. No, he quickly decided. He'd take his chances with Reggie Love. Maybe she needed clients. Maybe she had more time to help him. The idea of a woman lawyer suddenly appealed to him because he'd seen one on L.A. Law once, and she'd ripped up some cops pretty good. He closed the book and returned it carefully to the magazine rack beside the chair. The office was cool and pretty. There were no voices. Clint closed the door behind him and eased across the Persian rug to her desk. Reggie Love was on the phone, listening, more than talking. Clint placed three phone messages before her and gave the standard hand signal to indicate someone was waiting in the reception area. He sat on the corner of the desk, straightening a paper clip and watching her. There was no leather in the office. The walls were papered with light floral shades of rose and pink. A spotless desk of glass and chrome covered one corner of the rug. The chairs were sleek and upholstered with a burgundy fabric. This, without a doubt, was the office of a woman, a very neat woman. Reggie Love was fifty-two years old and had been practicing law for less than five years. She was of medium build with very short, very gray hair that fell in bangs almost to the top of her perfectly round black-framed glasses. The eyes were green and they glowed at Clint as if something funny had been said. Then she rolled them and shook her head. "'Goodbye, Sam,' she finally said, and hung up. "'Got a new client for you,' Clint said with a smile. "'I don't need new clients, Clint. I need clients who can pay. What's his name?' "'Mark Sway. He's just a kid, ten, maybe twelve years old, and he says he's supposed to meet with the FBI at noon. Says he needs a lawyer.' "'He alone?' "'Yeah. How do you find us?' "'I have no idea. I'm just the secretary, remember?' You'll have to ask some questions yourself. Reggie stood and walked around the desk. Show him in. And rescue me in fifteen minutes, okay? I've got a busy morning. Follow me, Mark, Clint said, and Mark followed him through a narrow door and down a hallway. Her office door was covered with stained glass and a small brass plate again, said Reggie Love Lawyer. Clint opened the door and motioned for Mark to enter. The first thing he noticed about her was her hair. It was gray and shorter than his, very short above the ears and in the back, a bit thicker on top with bangs halfway down. He'd never seen a woman with gray hair worn so short. She wasn't old and she wasn't young. She smiled appropriately as they met at the door. Mark, I'm Reggie Love. She offered a hand. He took it reluctantly and she squeezed hard and shook firm. Shaking hands with women was not something he did often. She was neither tall nor short, thin nor heavy. Her dress was straight and black, and she wore black and gold bracelets on both wrists. They rattled. "'Nice to meet you,' he said weakly as they shook. She was already leading him to a corner of the office where two soft chairs faced a table with picture books on it. "'Have a seat,' she said. "'I only have a minute.' Mark sat on the edge of his seat and was suddenly terrified. He'd lied to his mother. He'd lied to the police. He'd lied to Dr. Greenway. He was about to lie to the FBI. 
Romy had been dead less than a day, and he was lying right and left to every one who asked. Tomorrow he would certainly lie to the next person. Maybe it was time to come clean for a change. Sometimes it was frightening to tell the truth, but he usually felt better afterward. But the thought of unloading all this baggage on a stranger made his blood run cold. Would you like something to drink? No, ma'am. She crossed her legs. Mark Sway, right? Please do not call me ma'am, all right? My name is not Ms. Love or any of that. My name is Reggie. I'm old enough to be your grandmother, but you call me Reggie, okay? Okay. How old are you, Mark? Tell me a little about yourself. I'm eleven. I'm in the fifth grade at Willow Road. Why aren't you in school this morning? It's a long story. I see. And you're here because of this long story? Yes. Do you want to tell me this long story? I think so. Clint said you're supposed to meet with the FBI at noon. Is this true? Yes. They want to ask me some questions at the hospital. She picked up a legal pad from the table and wrote something on it. The hospital? It's part of the long story. Can I ask you something, Reggie? It was strange calling this lady by a baseball name. He'd watched a cheap TV movie about the life of Reggie Jackson and remembered the crowd chanting, Reggie, Reggie, in perfect unison. Then there was the Reggie candy bar. Sure. She grinned a lot, and it was obvious she enjoyed this scene with the kid who needed a lawyer. Mark knew the smiles would disappear if he made it through the story. She had pretty eyes, and they sparkled at him. "'If I tell you something, will you ever repeat it?' he asked. "'Of course not. It's privileged, confidential.' "'What does that mean?' "'It means simply that I can never repeat anything you tell me unless you tell me I can repeat it.' "'Never? Never. It's like talking to your doctor or minister.' The conversations are secret and held in trust. Do you understand? I think so. Under no circumstances, never. Under no circumstances can I tell anyone what you tell me. What if I told you something that no one else knows? I can't repeat it. Something the police really want to know? I can't repeat it. She, at first, was amused by these questions, but his determination made her wonder. "'Something that could get you in a lot of trouble. "'I can't repeat it.' "'Mark looked at her without blinking for a long minute "'and convinced himself she could be trusted. "'Her face was warm and her eyes were comforting. "'She was relaxed and easy to talk to. "'Any more questions?' she asked. "'Yeah. Where'd you get the name Reggie?' "'I changed my name several years ago. "'It was Regina, and I was married to a doctor.' And then all sorts of bad things happened, so I changed my name to Reggie. You're divorced? Yes. My parents are divorced. I'm sorry. Don't be sorry. My brother and I were really happy when they got a divorce. My father drank a lot and beat us. Beat Mom, too. Me and Ricky always hated him. Ricky's your brother? Yes. He's the one in the hospital. What's the matter with him? It's part of the long story. When would you like to tell me this story? Mark hesitated a few seconds and thought about a few things. He wasn't quite ready to tell all. How much do you charge? I don't know. What kind of case is it? What kind of cases do you take? Mostly cases involving abused or neglected children. Some abandoned children. Lots of adoptions. A few medical malpractice cases involving infants, but mainly abuse cases. I get some pretty bad cases. Good, because this is a really bad one. One person is dead, one is in the hospital. The police and FBI want to talk to me. Look, Mark, I assume you don't have a lot of money to hire me, do you? No. Technically, you're supposed to pay me something as a retainer, and once this is done, I'm your lawyer, and we'll go from there. Do you have a dollar? Yes. Then why don't you give it to me as a retainer? Mark pulled a one-dollar bill from his pocket and handed it to her. This is all I've got. Reggie didn't want the kid's dollar, but she took it because ethics were ethics and because it would probably be his last payment. 
and he was proud of himself for hiring a lawyer. She would somehow return it to him. She laid the bill on the table and said, "'Okay, now I'm the lawyer and you're the client. Let's hear the story.' He reached into his pocket again and pulled out the folded clipping from the newspaper Greenway had given them. He handed it to her. "'Have you seen this?' he asked. "'It's in this morning's paper.' His hand was trembling and the paper shook. "'Are you scared, Mark?' "'Sort of. Try to relax, okay?' "'Okay. I'll try. Have you seen this?' "'No, I haven't seen the paper yet.' She took the clipping and read it. Mark watched her eyes closely. Okay, she said when she finished. It mentions the body was found by two boys. Well, that's me and Ricky. Well, I'm sure that must have been awful, but it's no crime to find a dead body. Good, because there's much more to the story. Her smile had disappeared. The pen was ready. I want to hear it now. Mark breathed deeply and rapidly. The four doughnuts churned away in his stomach. He was scared, but he also knew he would feel much better when it was over. He settled deep in the chair, took a long breath, and looked at the floor. He started with his career as a smoker, and Ricky catching him, and going to the woods. Then the car, the water hose, the fat man who turned out to be Jerome Clifford. He spoke slowly because he wanted to remember it all, and because he wanted his new lawyer to write it all down. Clint attempted to interrupt after fifteen minutes, but Reggie frowned at him. He quickly closed the door and disappeared. The first account took twenty minutes with few interruptions from Reggie. There were gaps and holes, none the fault of Mark, just soft spots that she picked through during the second pass, which took another twenty minutes. They broke for coffee and ice water, all fetched by Clint, and Reggie moved the conversation to her desk where she spread out her notes and prepared for the third run-through of this remarkable story. She filled one legal pad and started another. The smiles were long gone. The friendly patronizing chit-chat from the grandmother to her grandchild had been replaced with pointed questions picking for details. The only details Mark withheld were the ones describing the exact location of the body of Senator Boyd Boyette, or rather Romy's story about the body. As the secret and confidential conversation unfolded, it became obvious to Reggie that Mark knew where the body was allegedly buried, and she skillfully and fearfully danced around this information. Maybe she would ask, maybe she wouldn't, but it would be the last thing discussed. An hour after they started she took a break and read the newspaper story twice. Then again, it seemed to fit. He knew too many details to be lying. This was not a story a hyperactive mind could fabricate, and the poor kid was scared to death. Clint interrupted again at 11.30 to inform Reggie her next appointment had been waiting for an hour. Cancel it, Reggie said, without looking from her notes, and Clint was gone. Mark walked around her office as she read. He stood in her window and watched the traffic on 3rd Street below, then he returned to his seat and waited. His lawyer was deeply troubled, and he almost felt sorry for her. All those names and faces in the yellow pages, and he had to drop this bomb on Reggie Love. "'What are you afraid of, Mark?' she asked, rubbing her eyes. "'Lots of things. I've lied to the police about this, and I think they know I'm lying, and that scares me. My little brother's in a coma because of me. It's all my fault. I lied to his doctor, and all that scares me. I don't know what to do, and I guess that's why I'm here. What should I do? Have you told me everything? No, but almost. Have you lied to me? No. Do you know where the body is buried? I think so. I know what Jerome Clifford told me. For a split second, Reggie was terrified he would blurt it out, but he didn't, and they stared at each other for a long time. "'Do you want to tell me where it is?' she finally asked. "'Do you want me to?' "'I'm not sure. "'What keeps you from telling me? "'I'm scared. "'I don't want anybody to know that I know, "'because Romy told me his client had killed many people "'and was planning on killing Romy too. "'If he's killed lots of people, 
and if he thinks I know this secret, he'll come after me. And if I tell this stuff to the cops, then he'll come after me for sure. He's in the mafia, and that really scares me. Wouldn't it scare you? I think so. And the cops have threatened me if I don't tell the truth, and they think I'm lying anyway, and I just don't know what to do. Do you think I should tell the police and the FBI? Reggie stood and walked slowly to the window. She had no wonderful advice at this point. If she suggested that her newest client spill his guts to the FBI and he followed her advice, his life could indeed be in danger. There was no law requiring him to tell. Obstruction of justice, maybe, but he was just a kid. They didn't know for certain what he knew, and if they couldn't prove it, he was safe. Let's do this, Mark. Don't tell me where the body is, okay? For now, anyway. Maybe later, but not now. And let's meet with the FBI and listen to them. You won't have to say a word. I'll do the talking, and we'll both do the listening. And when it's over, you and I will decide what to do next. Sounds good to me. Does your mother know you're here? No, I need to call her. Reggie found the number in the phone book and dialed the hospital. Mark explained to Diane that he had gone for a walk and would be there in a minute. He was a smooth liar, Reggie noticed. He listened for a while and looked disturbed. How is he? he asked. I'll be there in a minute. He hung up and looked at Reggie. Mom's upset. Ricky's coming out of the coma and she can't find Dr. Greenway. I'll walk with you to the hospital. That would be nice. Where does the FBI want to meet? I think at the hospital. She checked her watch and threw two fresh legal pads into a briefcase. She was suddenly nervous. Mark waited by the door. Chapter 9 The second lawyer hired by Barry the Blade Moldano to defend him on these obnoxious murder charges was another angry hatchet man by the name of Willis Upchurch, a rising star among the gang of boisterous mouthpieces trotting across the country, performing for crooks and cameras. Upchurch had offices in Chicago and Washington, and any other city where he could hook a famous case and rent space. As soon as he talked with Moldano after breakfast, he was on a plane to New Orleans to, first, organize a press conference, and, second, meet with his famous new client and plot a noisy defense. He had become somewhat rich and noted in Chicago for his passionate defense of mob assassins and drug traffickers, and in the past decade or so had been called in by mob brass around the country for all sorts of representation. His record was average, but it was not his one lost ratio that attracted clients. It was his angry face and bushy hair and thunderous voice. Upchurch was a lawyer who wanted to be seen and heard in magazine articles, news stories, advice columns, quickie books, and gossip shows. He had opinions. He was unafraid of predictions. He was radical and would say anything, and this made him a favorite of the loony daytime TV talk shows. He took only sensational cases with lots of headlines and cameras. Nothing was too repulsive for him. He preferred rich clients who could pay, but if a serial killer needed help, Upchurch would be there with a contract, giving himself exclusive book and movie rights. Though he enjoyed his notoriety immensely and received some praise from the far left for his vigorous defense of indigent murderers, Upchurch was little more than a mafia lawyer. He was owned by the mob, yanked around by their strings, and paid whenever they decided. He was allowed to roam a bit and spout at the mouth, but if they called, he came running. And when Johnny Solari, Barry's uncle, called at four in the morning, Willis Upchurch came running. The uncle explained the scarce facts about the untimely death of Jerome Clifford. Upchurch drooled into the receiver as Solari asked him to fly immediately to New Orleans. He skipped to the bathroom at the thought of defending Barry the Blade Moldano in front of all those cameras. He whistled in the shower when he thought of all the ink the case had already generated and how he would now be the star. He grinned at himself in the mirror as he tied his ninety-dollar tie and thought of spending the next six months in New Orleans with the press at his beck and call. This was why he went to law school. The scene was frightening at first. 
The IV had been removed because Diane was in the bed clutching Ricky and rubbing his head. She hugged him fiercely and wrapped her legs around his. He was moaning and grunting, twisting and jerking. His eyes were open, then shut. Diane pressed her head to his and spoke softly through her tears. It's okay, baby. It's okay. Mommy's here. Mommy's here. Greenway stood close by, arms folded, rubbing his beard. He appeared puzzled, as if he hadn't seen this before. A nurse held the other side of the bed. Mark entered the room slowly, and no one noticed. Reggie had stopped at the nurse's station. It was almost noon, time for the FBI and all, but Mark knew immediately that no one in the room was remotely concerned with the cops and their questions. "'It's okay, baby, it's okay. Mommy's here.' Mark inched to the foot of the bed for a closer look. Diane managed a quick, uncomfortable smile, then closed her eyes and kept whispering to Ricky. After a few minutes of this, Ricky opened his eyes, seemed to notice and recognize his mother, and grew still. She kissed him a dozen times on the forehead. The nurse smiled and patted his shoulder and cooed something at him. Greenway looked at Mark and nodded at the door. Mark followed him outside into the quiet hallway. They walked slowly toward the end of it, away from the nurse's station. He woke up about two hours ago, the doctor explained. It looks like he's coming out of it slowly. Has he said anything yet? Like what? Well, you know, like about what happened yesterday. No, he's mumbled a lot, which is a good sign, but he hasn't made any words yet. This was comforting, in a sense. Mark would have to stick close to the room just in case. So he's going to be okay? I didn't say that. The lunch cart stopped in the middle of the hall, and they walked around it. I think he'll be okay, but it could take time. There was a long pause in which Mark worried if Greenway expected him to say something. How strong is your mother? Pretty strong, I guess. We've been through a lot. Where's the family? She'll need plenty of help. There's no family. She has a sister in Texas, but they don't get along, and her sister has problems, too. Your grandparents? No. My ex-father was an orphan. I figure his parents probably dumped him somewhere when they got to know him. My mother's father's dead, and her mother lives in Texas, too. She's sick all the time. I'm sorry. They stopped at the end of the hall and looked through a dirty window at downtown Memphis. The Steric building stood tall. The FBI is bugging me, Greenway said. Join the club, Mark thought. Where are they? Room 28. It's a small conference room on the second floor that's seldom used. They said they'd be expecting me, you, and your mother at exactly noon, and they sounded very serious. Greenway glanced at his watch and started to walk back to the room. They are quite anxious. I'm ready for them, Mark said in a weak effort at boldness. Greenway frowned at him. How's that? I've hired us a lawyer, he said proudly. When? This morning. She's here now, down the hall. Greenway looked ahead, but the nurse's station was around a bend in the corridor. The lawyer's here? he asked in disbelief. Yep. How did you find a lawyer? It's a long story, but I paid her myself. Greenway pondered this as he shuffled along. Well, your mother cannot leave Ricky right now under any circumstances, and I certainly need to stay close. No problem. Me and the lawyer will handle it. They stopped at Ricky's door, and Greenway hesitated before pushing it open. I can put them off until tomorrow. In fact, I can order them out of the hospital. He was attempting to sound tough, but Mark knew better. No, thanks. They won't go away. You take care of Ricky and Mom, and me and the lawyer will take care of the FBI. Reggie found an empty room on the eighth floor, and they hurried down the stairs to use it. They were ten minutes late. She closed the door quickly and said, Pull up your shirt. He froze and stared at her. Pull up your shirt, she insisted, and he began pulling at his bulky Memphis State Tiger sweatshirt. 
She opened her briefcase and removed a small black recorder and a strip of plastic and Velcro. She checked the microcassette tape, then punched the buttons. Mark watched every move. She'd used this device many times before, he could tell. She pressed it to his stomach and said, Hold it right here. Then she threaded the plastic strap through a clip on the recorder, wrapped it around his midsection and back, and fastened it snugly with the Velcro ends. Breathe deeply, she said, and he did. He tucked the sweatshirt into his jeans. Reggie took a step back and stared at his stomach. Perfect, she said. What if they frisk me? They won't. Let's go. She grabbed her briefcase and they were out the door. How do you know they won't frisk me? he asked again, very anxious. He walked fast to keep up with her. A nurse looked at them suspiciously. Because they're here to talk, not to arrest. Just trust me. I trust you, but I'm really scared. You'll do fine, Mark. Just remember what I told you. Are you sure they can't see this thing? I'm positive. She pushed hard through a door, and they were back in the stairwell, descending quickly on green concrete steps. Mark was one step behind. What if the beeper goes off or something, and they freak out and pull guns? What then? No beeper. She took his hand, squeezed it hard, and zigzagged downward to the second floor. And they don't shoot kids. They did in a movie once. The second floor of St. Peter's had been built many years before the ninth. It was gray and dirty, and the narrow corridors were swarming with the usual anxious traffic of nurses, doctors, technicians, and orderlies pushing stretchers, and patients rolling along in wheelchairs, and dazed families walking to nowhere in particular and trying to stay awake. Corridors met from all directions in chaotic little junctions, then branched out again in a hopeless labyrinth. Reggie asked three nurses about the location of Room 28, and the third pointed and talked, but never stopped walking. They found a neglected hallway with ancient carpet and bad lighting, and six doors down to the right was their room. The door was cheap wood with no window. "'I'm scared, Reggie,' Mark said, staring at the door. She held his hand firmly. If she was nervous, it was not apparent. Her face was calm, her voice was warm and reassuring. "'Just do as I told you, Mark. I know what I'm doing.' They retreated a step or two, and Reggie opened an identical door to room 24. It was an abandoned coffee room, now used for haphazard storage. "'I'll wait in here. Now go knock on the door. I'm scared, Reggie.' She carefully felt the recorder and worked her fingers around it until she pushed the button. "'Now go,' she instructed, and pointed down the hall. Mark took a deep breath and knocked on the door. He could hear chairs move inside. "'Come in,' someone said, and the voice was not friendly. He opened the door slowly, stepped inside, and closed it behind him. The room was narrow and long, just like the table in the center of it. No windows. No smiles from the two men who stood on each side of the table near the end. They could pass for twins, white button-down shirts, red and blue ties, dark pants, short hair. "'You must be Mark,' one said as the other stared at the door. Mark nodded but could not speak. "'Where's your mother?' "'Uh, who are you?' Mark managed to get it out. The one on the right said, "'I'm Jason McThune, FBI, Memphis.' He stuck out his hand, and Mark shook it limply. "'Nice to meet you, Mark.' "'Yeah, my pleasure.' "'And I'm Larry Truman,' said the other. "'FBI, New Orleans.' Mark allowed Truman the same feeble handshake. The agents exchanged nervous looks, and for an awkward second neither knew what to say. Truman finally pointed to the chair at the end of the table. "'Have a seat, Mark.' McThune nodded his agreement and almost smiled. Mark carefully sat down, terrified the Velcro would break away and the damn thing would somehow fall off. They'd handcuff his little butt so fast and throw him in the car and he'd never see his mother again. What would Reggie do then? They moved toward him in their rolling chairs. They slid their notepads on the table to within inches of him. They were breathing on him, and Mark figured it was part of the game. Then he almost smiled. If they wanted to sit this close, fine. But the black recorder would get it all. No fading voices. 
We, uh, we really expected your mother and Dr. Greenway to be here, Truman said, glancing at McThune. They're with my brother. How is he? McThune asked gravely. Not too good. Mom can't leave his room right now. We thought she'd be here, Truman said again, and looked at McThune as if uncertain how to proceed. Well, we can wait a day or two until she's available, Mark offered. No, Mark, we really need to talk now. Maybe I can go get her. Truman took his pen from his shirt pocket and smiled at Mark. No, let's talk a few minutes, Mark, just the three of us. Are you nervous? A little. What do you want? He was still stiff with fear, but breathing better. The recorder hadn't beeped or shocked him. Well, we want to ask you some questions about yesterday. Do I need a lawyer? They looked at each other with perfectly symmetrical open mouths, and at least five seconds passed before McThune cocked his head at Mark and said, Of course not. Why not? Well, we just, you know, want to ask you a few questions, that's all. If you decide you want your mother, then we'll go get her, or something. But you don't need a lawyer. Just a few questions, that's all. I've already talked to the cops once. In fact, I talked to the cops for a long time last night. We're not cops. We're FBI agents. That's what scares me. I think maybe I need a lawyer to, you know, protect my rights and all. You've been watching too much TV, kid. The name's Mark, okay? Can you at least call me Mark? Sure. Sorry. But you don't need a lawyer. Yeah, Truman chimed in. Lawyers just get in the way. We have to pay the money and they object to everything. Don't you think we should wait until my mother can be here? They exchanged matching little smiles, and McThune said, Not really, Mark. I mean, we can wait if you want to, but you're a smart kid, and we're really in a hurry here, and we just have a few quick questions for you. Okay. I guess. If I have to. Truman looked at his notepad and went first. Good. You told the Memphis police that Jerome Clifford was already dead when you and Ricky found the car yesterday. Now, Mark, is this really the truth? He sort of sneered toward the end of the question as if he knew damn well it wasn't the truth. Mark fidgeted and looked straight ahead. Do I have to answer the question? Sure you do. Why? Because we need to know the truth, Mark. We're the FBI, and we're investigating this thing, and we must know the truth. What happens if I don't answer? Oh, a lot of things. We might be forced to take you down to our office in the back seat of the car, of course. No handcuffs. And ask some really tough questions. May have to bring along your mother, too. What will happen to my mother? Can she get in trouble? Maybe. What kind of trouble? They paused for a second and exchanged nervous looks. They had started on shaky ground, and things were getting shakier by the minute. Children are not to be interviewed without first talking to the parents. But what the hell? His mother didn't show, he had no father, he was a poor kid, and here he was all alone. It was perfect, really. They couldn't ask for a better situation. Just a couple of quick questions. McThune cleared his throat and went into a deep frown. Mark, have you ever heard of obstruction of justice? I don't think so. Well, it's a crime, okay? A federal offense. A person who knows something about a crime and withholds this information from the FBI or the police might be found guilty of obstruction of justice. What happens then? Well, if found guilty, such a person might be punished. You know, sent to jail or something like that. So if I don't answer your questions, me and Mom might go to jail? McThune retreated a bit and looked at Truman. The ice was getting thinner. Why don't you want to answer the question, Mark? Truman asked. Are you hiding something? I'm just scared. And it doesn't seem fair since I'm just 11 years old and you're the FBI and my mom's not here. I don't know what to do, really. Can't you just answer the questions, Mark, without your mother? You saw something yesterday, and your mother was not around. She can't help you answer the questions. We just want to know what you saw. If you were in my place, would you want a lawyer? 
Hell no, McThune said. I would never want a lawyer. Pardon my language, son, but they're just a pain in the ass, a real pain. If you have nothing to hide, you don't need a lawyer. Just answer our questions truthfully and everything will be fine. He was becoming angry, and this did not surprise Mark. One of them had to be angry. It was the good bad guy routine Mark had seen a thousand times on television. McThune would get ugly, and Truman would smile a lot, and sometimes even frown at his partner for Mark's benefit, and this would somehow endear Truman to Mark. McThune would then get disgusted and leave the room, and Mark would then be expected to spill his guts all over the table. Truman leaned to him with a drippy smile. Mark, was Jerome Clifford already dead when you and Ricky found him? I take the Fifth Amendment. The drippy smile vanished. McThune's face reddened, and he shook his head in absolute frustration. There was a long pause as the agents stared at each other. Mark watched an ant crawl across the table and disappear under a notepad. Truman, the good guy, finally spoke. Mark, I'm afraid you've been watching too much television. You mean I can't take the Fifth Amendment? Let me guess, McThune snarled. You watch L.A. Law, right? Every week. Figures. Are you going to answer any questions, Mark? Because if you're not, then we have to do other things. Like what? Go to court. Talk to the judge. Convince him to require you to talk to us. It's pretty nasty, really. I need to go to the restroom, Mark said as he slid his chair away from the table and stood. Oh, sure, Mark, Truman said, suddenly afraid they'd made him sick. I think it's just down the hall. Mark was at the door. Take five minutes, Mark. We'll wait. No hurry. He left the room and closed the door behind him. For seventeen minutes the agents made small talk and played with their pens. They weren't worried. They were experienced agents with many tricks. They'd been here before. He would talk. A knock, and McThune said, Come in. The door opened, and an attractive lady of fifty or so walked in and closed the door as if this were her office. They scrambled to their feet, just as she said, Keep your seats. We are in a meeting, Truman said officially. You're in the wrong room, McThune said rudely. She placed a briefcase on the table and handed each agent a white card. I don't think so, she said. My name is Reggie Love. I'm an attorney, and I represent Mark Sway. They took it well. McThune inspected the card while Truman just stood there, arms dangling by his legs, trying to say something. "'When did he hire you?' McThune said, looking wildly at Truman. "'That's really none of your business, is it now? I'm not hired. I'm retained. Sit down.' She eased gracefully into her seat and rolled it to the table. They backed awkwardly into theirs and kept their distance. "'Where's, uh, where's Mark?' Truman asked. He's off somewhere, taking the fifth. Can I see your ID, please? They instantly reached for their jackets, fished around desperately, and simultaneously produced their badges. She held both, studied them carefully, then wrote something on a legal pad. When she finished, she slid them across the table and asked, Did you, in fact, attempt to interrogate this child outside the presence of his mother? No, said Truman. Of course not, said McThune, shocked at this suggestion. He tells me you did. He's confused, said McThune. We initially approached Dr. Greenway, and he agreed to this meeting, which was supposed to include Mark, Diane, Sway, and the doctor. But the kid showed up alone, Truman added quickly, very anxious to explain things. And we asked where his mother was, and he said she couldn't make it right now, and we sort of thought she was on her way or something, so we were just chit-chatting with the kid. Yeah, while we waited for Ms. Sway and the doctor, McThune chimed in helpfully. Where were you during this? Don't ask questions that are irrelevant. Did you advise Mark to talk to a lawyer? The agents locked eyes and searched each other for help. It wasn't mentioned, Truman said, shrugging innocently. It was easier to lie because the kid wasn't there, and he was just a scared little kid who'd gotten things confused, and they were, after all, FBI agents, so she'd eventually believe them. McThune cleared his throat and said, uh, yeah, once, Larry, remember Mark said something, or maybe I said something about L.A. law, and then Mark said he might need a lawyer, but he was sort of kidding, and we, 
Or at least I took it as a joke. Remember, Larry? Larry now remembered. Oh, sure, yeah. Something about L.A. law. Just a joke, though. Are you sure? Reggie asked. Of course I'm sure, Truman protested. McThune frowned and nodded along with his partner. He didn't ask you guys if he needed a lawyer. They shook their heads and tried hopelessly to remember. I don't remember it that way. He's just a kid and very scared, and I think he's confused, McThune said. Did you advise him of his Miranda rights? Truman smiled at this and was suddenly more confident. Of course not. He's not a suspect. He's just a kid. We need to ask him a few questions. And you did not attempt to interrogate him without his mother's presence or consent? No, of course not. And you did not tell him to avoid lawyers after he asked your advice? No, ma'am. No way. The kid's lying if he told you otherwise. Reggie slowly opened her briefcase and lifted out the black recorder and the micro-cassette tape. She sat them in front of her and placed the briefcase on the floor. Special Agents McThune and Truman stared at the devices and seemed to shrink a bit in their seats. Reggie rewarded each with a bitchy smile and said, I think we know who's lying. McThune slid two fingers down the bridge of his nose. Truman rubbed his eyes. She let them suffer for a moment. The room was silent. It's all right here on tape, fellas. You boys attempted to interrogate a child outside the presence of his mother and without her consent. He specifically asked if you shouldn't wait until she was available and you said no. You attempted to coerce the child with a threat of criminal prosecution, not only for the child, but also for his mother. He told you he was scared, and twice he specifically asked you if he needed a lawyer. You advised him not to get a lawyer, given as one of your reasons the opinion that lawyers are a pain in the ass. Gentlemen, the pain is here. They sunk lower. McThune pressed four fingers against his forehead and gently rubbed. Truman stared in disbelief at the tape, but was careful not to look at this woman. He thought of grabbing it and ripping it to shreds and stomping on it because it could be his career. But for some reason he believed with all his troubled heart that this woman had made a copy of it. Getting slapped with a lie was bad enough, but their problems ran much deeper. There could be serious disciplinary proceedings, reprimands, transfers, crap in the record, and at this moment Truman also believed that this woman knew all there was to know about the disciplining of wayward FBI agents. "'You wired the kid,' Truman said meekly, to no one in particular. "'Why not? No crime. You're the FBI, remember? You boys run more wire than AT&T.' "'What a smart ass. But then she was a lawyer, wasn't she?' McThune leaned forward, cracked his knuckles, and decided to offer some resistance. Look, Miss Love, we... It's Reggie. Okay, okay, Reggie. Uh, look, we're sorry. We uh, got a little carried away, and, well, we apologize. A little carried away? I could have your jobs for this. They were not about to argue with her. She was probably right, and even if there was room for debate, they simply were not up to it. Are you taping this? Truman asked. No. Okay. We were out of line. We're sorry. He could not look at her. Reggie slowly placed the tape in her coat pocket. Look at me, fellas. They slowly lifted their eyes to hers, but it was painful. You've already proven to me that you'll lie, and that you'll lie quickly. Why should I trust you? Truman suddenly slapped the table, hissed, and made a noisy show of standing and pacing to the end of the table. He threw up his hands. This is incredible. We came here with just a few questions for the kid, just doing our jobs, and now we're fighting with you. The kid didn't tell us he had a lawyer. If he told us, then we would have backed off. Why'd you do this? Why'd you deliberately pick this fight? It's senseless. What do you want from the kid? The truth. He's lying about what he saw yesterday. We know he's lying. We know he talked to Jerome Clifford before Clifford killed himself. We know the kid was in the car. Maybe I don't blame him for lying. He's just a kid. He's scared. But, damn it, we need to know what he saw and heard. What do you suspect he saw and heard? The nightmare of explaining this to Fultrick suddenly hit Truman, and he leaned against the wall. This is exactly why he hated lawyers. Fultrick, Reggie... 
the next one he met. They made life so complicated. Has he told you everything? McThune asked. Our conversations are extremely private. I know that. But do you realize who Clifford was and Moldano and Boyd Boyette? Do you know the story? I read the paper this morning. I've kept up with the case in New Orleans. You boys need the body, don't you? You could say that, Truman said from the end of the table. But at this moment we really need to talk to your client. I'll think about it. When might you reach a decision? I don't know. Are you boys busy this afternoon? Why? I need to talk to my client some more. Let's say we'll meet in my office at 3 p.m. She took her briefcase and placed the recorder in it. It was obvious this meeting was over. I'll keep the tape to myself. It'll just be our little secret, okay? McThune nodded his agreement, but knew there was more. If I need something from you boys, like the truth or a straight answer, I expect to get it. If I catch you lying again, I'll use the tape. That's blackmail, said Truman. That's exactly what it is. Indict me. She stood and grabbed the doorknob. See you boys at three. McThune followed her. Uh, listen, Reggie. There's this guy who'll probably want to be at the meeting. His name is Roy Fultrig, and he's... Mr. Fultrig is in town? Yes, he arrived last night, and he'll insist on attending this meeting at your office. Well, well, I'm honored. Please invite him. Chapter 10 The front-page story in the Memphis press about Clifford's death was written top to bottom by Slick Moeller a veteran police reporter who'd been covering crime and cops in Memphis for thirty years. His real name was Alfred, but no one knew it. His mother called him Slick, but not even she could remember the nickname's origins. Three wives and a hundred girlfriends had called him Slick. He did not dress exceptionally well, did not finish high school, did not have money, was blessed with average looks and build, drove a Mustang, could not keep a woman, and so no one knew why he was called Slick. Crime was his life. He knew the drug dealers and pimps. He drank beer at the topless bars and gossiped with the bouncers. He kept charts on the who's who of motorcycle gangs that supplied the city with drugs and strippers. He could move deftly through the toughest projects of Memphis without a scratch. He knew the rank and file of the street gangs. He had busted no less than a dozen stolen car rings by tipping the police. He knew the ex-cons, especially the ones who returned to crime. He could spot a fencing operation simply by watching the pawn shops. His cluttered downtown apartment was most unremarkable except for an entire wall of emergency scanners and police radios. His Mustang had more junk than a police cruiser, except for a radar gun, and he didn't want one. Slick Moeller lived and moved in the dark shadows of Memphis. He was often on the crime scene before the cops. He moved freely about the morgues and hospitals and black funeral parlors. He had nurtured thousands of contacts and sources, and they talked to Slick because he could be trusted. If it was off the record, then it was off the record. Background was background. An informant would never be compromised. Tips were guarded zealously. Slick was a man of his word, and even the street gang leaders knew it. He was also on a first-name basis with virtually every cop in the city, many of whom referred to him with great admiration as the Mole. Mole Moeller did this, Mole Moeller said that. Since Slick had become his real name, the added nickname did not bother him. Nothing bothered Slick much. He drank coffee with cops in a hundred all-night diners around town. He watched them play softball, knew when their wives filed for divorce, knew when they got themselves reprimanded. He was at central headquarters at least twenty hours a day, it seemed, and it was not uncommon for cops to stop him and ask what was going on. Who got shot? Where was the hold-up? Was the driver drunk? How many were killed? Slick told them as much as he could. He helped them whenever possible. His name was often mentioned in classes at the Memphis Police Academy. And so it was no surprise to anyone that Slick spent the entire morning fishing around Central. He'd made his calls to New Orleans and knew the basics. He knew Roy Fultrig and New Orleans FBI were in town, and that everything had been turned over to them. This intrigued him. 
It was not just a simple suicide. There were too many blank faces and no comments. There was a note of some sort, and all questions about it were met with sudden denials. He could read the faces of some of these cops, been doing it for years. He knew about the boys, and that the younger one was in bad shape. There were some fingerprints, some cigarette butts. He left the elevator on the ninth floor and walked away from the nurse's station. He knew the number of Ricky's room, but this was the psychiatric ward, and he was not about to go barging in with his questions. He didn't want to scare anyone, especially an eight-year-old kid who was in shock. He stuck two quarters in the soft-drink machine and sipped on a Diet Coke as if he'd been there all night walking the floors. An orderly in a light blue jacket pushed a cart of cleaning supplies to the elevator. He was a male about twenty-five, long hair, and certainly bored with his menial job. Slick stepped to the elevators, and when the door opened he followed the orderly on to it. The name Fred was sewn into the jacket above the pocket. They were alone. "'You work the ninth floor?' Slick asked, bored, but with a smile. "'Yeah?' Fred did not look at him. "'I'm Slick Moeller with the Memphis Press, working on a story about Ricky Sway in room 943. You know, the shooting and all. He learned early in his career that it was best to tell them up front who and what. Fred was suddenly interested. He stood erect and looked at Slick, as if to say, "'Yeah, I know plenty, but you're not getting it from me.' The cart between them was filled with Ajax Comet and twenty bottles of generic hospital supplies. A bucket of dirty rags and sponges covered the bottom tray. Fred was a toilet scrubber, but in a flash he became a man with the inside scoop. Yeah, he said calmly. Have you seen the kid? Slick asked nonchalantly while watching the numbers light up above the door. Yeah, just left there. I hear it's severe traumatic shock. Don't know, Fred said, smugly, as if his secrets were crucial. But he wanted to talk, and this never ceased to amaze Slick. Take an average person, tell him you're a reporter, and nine times out of ten he'll feel obligated to talk. He'll want to talk. He'll tell you his deepest secrets. Poor kid, Slick mumbled to the floor as if Ricky were terminal. He said nothing else for a few seconds, and this was too much for Fred. What kind of a reporter was he? Where were the questions? He, Fred, knew the kid had just left his room, had talked to his mother. He, Fred, was a player in this game. Yeah, he's in bad shape, Fred said, also to the floor. Still in a coma? In and out. May take a long time. Yeah, that's what I heard. The elevator stopped on the fifth floor, but Fred's cart blocked the door and no one entered. The door closed. "'There's not much you can do for a kid like that,' Slick explained. "'I see it all the time. "'Kid sees something horrible in a split second, goes into shock, "'and it takes months to drag him out. "'All kinds of shrinks and stuff. Really sad. "'This Sway kid ain't that bad, is he?' "'I doubt it. "'Dr. Greenway thinks he'll snap out in a day or two. "'It'll take some therapy, but he'll be fine. "'I see it all the time. "'Thinking about med school myself. "'Have the cops been snooping around?' Fred cut his eyes around as if the elevator were bugged. Yeah, FBI was here all day. The family's already hired a lawyer. You don't say. Yeah, cops are real interested in this case, and they're talking to the kid's brother. Somehow a lawyer's got in the middle of it. The elevator stopped on the second floor, and Fred grabbed the handles on his cart. Who's the lawyer? Slick asked. The door opened, and Fred pushed forward. Reggie, somebody. I haven't seen him yet. Thanks, Slick said, as Fred disappeared and the elevator filled. He rode it to the ninth floor to search for another fish. By noon, the Reverend Roy Fultrick and his sidekicks, Wally Box and Thomas Fink, had become a collective nuisance around the offices of the United States Attorney for the Western District of Tennessee. George Ord had held the office for seven years, and he did not care for Roy Fultrick. He'd not invited him to Memphis. Ord had met Fultrick before, at numerous conferences and seminars, where the various U.S. attorneys gather and plot ways to protect the government. Fultrick usually spoke at these forums, always anxious to share his opinions and strategies and great victories with anyone who would listen. 
After Maxune and Truman returned from the hospital and broke the frustrating news about Mark and his new lawyer, Fultrig, along with Box and Fink, had once again situated himself in Ord's office to analyze the latest. Ord sat in his heavy leather chair behind his massive desk and listened as Fultrig interrogated the agents and occasionally barked orders to Box. "'What do you know about this lawyer?' he asked Ord. "'Never heard of her.' "'Surely someone in your office has dealt with her.' Fultrig asked. The question was nothing sort of a challenge for Ord to find someone with a scoop on Reggie Love. He left his office and consulted with an assistant. The search began. Truman and Maxoon sat very quietly in one corner of Ord's office. They had decided to tell no one of the tape, at least for the moment. Maybe later. Maybe, they hoped, never. A secretary brought sandwiches, and lunch was eaten amid aimless speculation and chatter. Fultrig was anxious to return to New Orleans, but more anxious to hear from Mark Sway. The fact that the kid had somehow obtained the services of an attorney was most troublesome. He was afraid to talk. Fultrig was convinced Clifford had told him something, and as the day wore on he became more convinced the kid knew about the body. He was never one to hesitate before drawing conclusions. By the time the sandwiches were finished, he'd persuaded himself and everyone in the room that Mark Sway knew precisely where Boyette was buried. David Sherpinski, one of Ward's many assistants, presented himself at the office and explained he'd gone to law school at Memphis State with Reggie Love. He sat next to Fultrig in Wally's seat and answered questions. He was busy and would rather have been working on a case. We finished law school together four years ago, Sherpinski said. So she's only practiced for four years, Fultrig surmised quickly. What kind of work does she do? Criminal law? How much criminal law? Does she know the ropes? Maxoon glanced at Truman. They'd been nailed by a four-year lawyer. A little criminal stuff, Sharpinski replied. We're pretty good friends. I see her around from time to time. Most of her works with abused children. She's, well, she's had a pretty rough time of it. What do you mean by that? It's a long story, Mr. Fultrig. She's a very complex person. This is her second life. You know her well, don't you? I do. We were in law school together for three years, off and on. What do you mean, off and on? Well, she had to drop out. Let's say, emotional problems. In her first life, she was the wife of a prominent doctor, an OBGYN. They were rich and successful, all over the society pages, charities, country clubs, you name it. Big house in Germantown. His and her Jaguars. She was on the board of every garden club and social organization in Memphis. She'd worked as a school teacher to put him through med school, and after fifteen years of marriage, he decided to trade her in for a new model. He started chasing women and became involved with a younger nurse who eventually became wife number two. Reggie's name back then was Regina Cardoni. She took it hard, filed for divorce, and things got nasty. Dr. Cardoni played hardball, and she slowly cracked up. He tormented her. The divorce dragged along. She felt publicly humiliated. Her friends were all doctors' wives, country club types, and they ran for cover. She even attempted suicide. It's all in the divorce papers in the clerk's office. He had a truckload of lawyers, and they pulled strings and had her committed to an institution. Then he cleaned her out. Children? Two, a boy and a girl. They were young teenagers, and, of course, he got custody. He gave them their freedom and enough money to finance it, and they turned their backs on their mother. He and his lawyers kept her in and out of mental institutions for two years, and by then it was all over. He got the house, kids, the trophy wife, everything. Describing this tragic history of a friend troubled Sharpinski, and he was obviously uncomfortable telling it all to Mr. Fultrig, but most of it was public record. So had she become a lawyer? It wasn't easy. The court order prohibited visitation with the children. She lived with her mother, who I think probably saved her life. I'm not sure, but I've heard that her mother mortgaged a home to finance some pretty heavy therapy. It took years, but she slowly pieced her life back together. She pulled out of it. The kids grew up and left Memphis. The boy went to prison for selling drugs, and her daughter lives in California. What kind of law student was she? At times very astute. She was determined to prove to herself she could succeed as a lawyer, but she continued to battle depression. She struggled with booze and pills and finally dropped out halfway through. Then she came back 
clean and dry, and finished with a vengeance. As usual, Fink and Box scribbled furiously on legal pads, trying, importantly, to take down every word, as if Fultrig would later quiz them on their notes. Ord listened, but was more concerned with a pile of past-due work on his desk. With each minute he resented Fultrig and this intrusion more and more. He was just as busy and important as Fultrig. "'What kind of lawyer is she?' Roy asked. "'Mean as hell,' thought McThune. "'Shrewd as the devil,' thought Truman. "'Quite talented with electronics. "'She works hard, doesn't make much money, "'but then I don't think money's important to Reggie.' "'Where in the world she get a name like Reggie?' Fultrig asked, thoroughly baffled by it. Perhaps it came from Regina, Ord thought to himself. Sharpinsky started to speak, then thought for a second. It would take hours to tell what I know about her, and I really don't want to. It's not important, is it? Maybe, Box snapped. Sharpinsky glared at him, then looked at Fultrig. When she started law school, she tried to erase most of her past, especially the painful years. She took back her maiden name of love. I guess she got Reggie from Regina, but I've never asked. But she did it legally, court orders and all, and there's no trace of the old Regina Cardoni, at least not on paper. She didn't talk about her past in law school, but she was the topic of a lot of conversation. Not that she gives a damn. Is she still sober? Fultrig wanted the dirt and this irritated Sharpinsky. To Macthune and Truman she appeared remarkably sober. "'You'll have to ask her, Mr. Fultrick. How often do you see her?' "'Once a month, maybe twice. We talk on the phone occasionally. How old is she?' Fultrick asked the question with a great deal of suspicion, as if perhaps Sharpinsky and Reggie had a little thing going on the side. "'You'll have to ask her that, too. Early fifties, I'd guess.' Why don't you call her now? Ask her what's going on. Just friendly small talk, you know. See if she mentions Mark Sway. Sharpinsky gave Fultrick a look that would sour butter. Then he looked at Ord, his boss, as if to say, Can you believe this nut? Ord rolled his eyes and began refilling a stapler. Because she's not stupid, Mr. Fultrick. In fact, she's quite smart, and if I call, she'll immediately know the reason why. Perhaps you are right. I am. I would like for you to go with us at three to her office, if you can work it in. Sharpinsky looked at Ord for guidance. Ord was deeply involved with the stapler. I can't do it. I'm very busy. Anything else? No, you can go now, Ord suddenly said. Thanks, David. Sharpinsky left the office. "'I really need him to go with me,' Fultrig said to Ward. "'He said he was busy, Roy. "'My boys work,' he said, looking at Box and Fink. "'A secretary knocked and entered. "'She brought a two-page fax to Fultrig, who read it with Box. "'It's from my office,' he explained to Ord, "'as if he and he alone had such technology at his fingertips. "'They read on, and Fultrig finally finished. "'Ever hear of Willis Upchurch?' Yes, he's a big-shot defense lawyer from Chicago. A lot of mob work. What's he done? It says he just finished a press conference before a lot of cameras in New Orleans and that he's been hired by Muldano, that the case will be postponed, his client will be found not guilty, etc., etc. That sounds like Willis Upchurch. I can't believe you haven't heard of him. He's never been to New Orleans, Fultrick said with authority, as if he remembered every lawyer who dared to step on his turf. Your case just became a nightmare. Wonderful. Just wonderful. Chapter 11 The room was dark because the shades were pulled. Diane was curled along the end of Ricky's bed, napping. After a morning of mumbling and thrashing and getting everyone's hopes aroused, he had drifted away again after lunch and had returned to the now familiar position of knees pulled to his chest, IV in the arm, thumb in the mouth. Greenway assured her repeatedly that he was not in pain. But after squeezing and kissing him for four hours, she was convinced her son was hurting. She was exhausted. Mark sat on the fold-away bed with his back against the wall under the window and stared at his brother and his mother in the bed. He, too, was exhausted, but sleep was not possible. 
Events were whirling around his overworked brain, and he tried to keep thinking. What was the next move? Could Reggie be trusted? He'd seen all those lawyer shows and movies on TV, and it seemed as if half the lawyers could be trusted, and the other half were snakes. When should he tell Diane and Dr. Greenway? If he told them everything, would it help Ricky? He thought about this for a long time. He sat on the bed listening to the quiet voices in the hallway as the nurses went about their work, and debated with himself about how much to tell. The digital clock next to the bed gave the time as 2.32. It was impossible to believe that all this crap had happened in less than 24 hours. He scratched his knees and made the decision to tell Greenway everything that Ricky could have seen and heard. He stared at the blonde hair sticking out from under the sheet, and he felt better. He would come clean stop the lying, and do all he could to help Ricky. The things Romy told him in the car were not heard by anyone else, and for the moment, and subject to advice from his lawyer, he would hold them private for a while. But not for long. These burdens were getting heavy. This was not a game of hide-and-seek played by trailer park kids in the woods and ravines around Tucker Wheel Estates. This was not a sly little escape from his bedroom for a moonlit walk through the neighborhood. Romy stuck a real gun in his mouth. These were real FBI agents with real badges, just like the true crime stories on television. He had hired a real lawyer who'd stuck a real tape recorder to his stomach so she could outfox the FBI. The man who killed the senator was a professional killer who'd murdered many others, according to Romy, and was a member of the Mafia, and those people would think nothing of rubbing out an eleven-year-old kid. This was just too much for him to handle alone. He should be at school right now, fifth period, doing math, which he hated but suddenly missed. He'd have a long talk with Reggie. She'd arrange a meeting with the FBI, and he'd tell them every stinking detail Romy had unloaded on him. Then they would protect him. Maybe they would send in bodyguards until the killer went to jail, or maybe they would arrest him immediately and all would be safe. Maybe. Then he remembered a movie about a guy who squealed on the Mafia and thought the FBI would protect him, but suddenly he was on the run with bullets flying over his head and bombs going off. The FBI wouldn't return his phone calls because the guy didn't say something right in the courtroom. At least twenty times during the movie someone said, The mob never forgets. In the final scene this guy's car was blown to bits just as he turned the key, and he landed a half a mile away with no legs. As he took his final breath, a dark figure stood over him and said, The mob never forgets. It wasn't much of a movie, but its message was suddenly clear to Mark. He needed a sprite. His mother's purse was on the floor under the bed, and he slowly unzipped it. There were three bottles of pills. There were two packs of cigarettes, and for a split second he was tempted. He found the quarters and left the room. A nurse whispered to an old man in the waiting area. Mark opened his sprite and walked to the elevators. Greenway had asked him to stay in the room as much as possible, but he was tired of the room, and tired of Greenway, and there seemed little chance of Ricky waking any time soon. He entered the elevator and pushed the button to the basement. He would check out the cafeteria and see what the lawyers were doing. A man entered just before the doors closed and seemed to look at him a bit too long. "'Are you Mark Sway?' he asked. This was getting old. Starting with Romy, he'd met enough strangers in the past twenty-four hours to last for months. He was certain he'd never seen this guy before. "'Who are you?' he asked cautiously. "'Slick Mola, with the Memphis Press. You know, the newspaper. You're Mark Sway, aren't you?' "'How'd you know?' "'I'm a reporter. I'm supposed to know these things. How's your brother?' "'He's doing great. Why do you want to know?' Working on a story about the suicide and all, and your name keeps coming up. Cops say you know more than you're telling. When's it going to be in the paper? I don't know. Tomorrow, maybe. Mark felt weak again and stopped looking at him. I'm not answering any questions. That's fine. The elevator door suddenly opened and a swarm of people entered. Mark could no longer see the reporter. Seconds later it stopped on the fifth floor, and Mark darted out between two doctors. He hit the stairs and walked quickly to the sixth floor. He'd lost the reporter. He sat on the steps in the empty stairwell and began to cry. 
Fultrig, Maxion, and Truman arrived in the small but tasteful reception area of Reggie Love, attorney at law, at exactly 3 p.m., the appointed hour. They were met by Clint, who asked them to be seated, then offered coffee or tea, all of which they stiffly declined. Fultrig informed Clint right properly that he was the United States Attorney for the Southern District of Louisiana, New Orleans, and that he was now present in this office and did not expect to wait. It was a mistake. He waited for forty-five minutes. While the agents flipped through magazines on the sofa, Fultrick paced the floor, glanced at his watch, fumed, scowled at Clint, even barked at him twice, and each time was informed Reggie was on the phone with an important matter. As if Fultrick was there for an unimportant matter. He wanted to leave so badly, but he couldn't. For one of the rare times in his life he had to absorb a subtle ass-kicking without a fight. Finally, Clint asked them to follow him to a small conference room lined with shelves of heavy law books. Clint instructed them to be seated and explained that Reggie would be right with them. "'She's four to five minutes late,' Fultrick protested. "'That's quite early for Reggie, sir,' Clint said with a smile as he closed the door. Fultrick sat at one end of the table with an agent close to each side. They waited. "'Look, Roy,' Truman said with hesitation, you need to be careful with this gal. She might be taping this. What makes you think so? Well, you just never— These Memphis lawyers do a lot of taping, McZune added helpfully. I don't know about New Orleans, but it's pretty bad up here. She has to tell us up front if she's taping, doesn't she? Fultrig asked, obviously without a clue. Don't bet on it, said Truman. Just be careful, okay? The door opened and Reggie entered, forty-eight minutes late. "'Keep your seats,' she said as Clint closed the door behind her. She offered a hand to Fultrick, who was half standing. "'Reggie, love, you must be Roy Fultrick. "'I am. Nice to meet you. Please be seated.' She smiled at McThune and Truman, and for a brief second all three of them thought about the tape. "'Sorry I'm late,' she said as she sat alone at her end of the conference table. They were eight feet away, huddled together like wet ducks. "'No problem,' Fultrig said loudly, as if it was very much a problem. She pulled a large tape recorder from a hidden drawer in the table and sat it in front of her. "'Mind if I tape this little conference?' she asked as she plugged in the microphone. The little conference would be taped, whether they liked it or not. "'I'd be happy to provide you with a copy of the tape.' "'Fine with me,' Fultrig said, pretending he had a choice." McThune and Truman stared at the tape recorder. How nice of her to ask. She smiled at the two of them as they smiled at her, then all three smiled at the recorder. She was as subtle as a rock through a window. The damnable micro-cassette could not be far away. She pushed a button. Now, what's up? Where's your client? Fultrick asked. He leaned forward, and it was clear he would do all the talking. At the hospital. The doctor wants him to stay in the room near his brother. When can we talk to him? You're assuming that you will, in fact, talk to him. She looked at Fultrig with very confident eyes. Her hair was gray and cut like a boy's. The face was quite colorful. The eyebrows were dark, the lips were soft red and meticulously painted, the skin was smooth and free of heavy makeup. It was a pretty face, with bangs and eyes that glowed with a calm steadiness. Fultrig looked at her and thought of all the misery and suffering she'd seen. She covered it well. Maxune opened a file and flipped through it. In the past two hours they had assembled a two-inch-thick dossier on Reggie Love, a.k.a. Regina L. Cardoni. They had copied the divorce papers and commitment proceedings from the clerk's office in the county courthouse. The mortgage papers and land records on her mother's home were in the folder. Two Memphis agents were attempting to obtain her law school transcripts. Fultrig loved the trash. Whatever the case, and whoever the opponent, Fultrig always wanted the dirt. Maxune read the sordid legal history of the divorce, with its allegations of adultery and alcohol and dope and unfitness, and, ultimately, the attempted suicide. He read it carefully, though, without being seen. He did not, under any circumstances, want to make this woman angry. We need to talk to your client, Miss Love. It's Reggie, okay, Roy? Whatever. We think he knows something plain and simple. Such as? 
Well, we are convinced little Mark was in the car with Jerome Clifford prior to his death. We think he spent more than a few seconds with him. Clifford was obviously planning to kill himself, and we have reason to believe he wanted to tell someone where his client, Mr. Moldano, had disposed of the body of Senator Boyette. What makes you think he wanted to tell? It's a long story, but he had contacted an assistant in my office on two occasions, and hinted that he might be willing to cut some deal and get out. He was scared, and he was drinking a lot. Very erratic behavior. He was sliding off the deep end and wanted to talk. Why do you think he talked to my client? There's just a chance, okay. And we must look under every stone. Surely you understand. I sense a bit of desperation. A lot of desperation, Reggie. I'm leveling with you. We know who killed the senator, but frankly, I'm not ready for trial without a corpse. He paused and smiled warmly at her. Despite his many obnoxious flaws, Roy had spent hours before judges, and he knew how and when to act sincere. And she'd spent many hours in therapy, and she could spot a fake. I'm not telling you that you cannot talk to Mark Sway. You cannot talk to him today, but maybe tomorrow, maybe the next day. Things are moving fast. Mr. Clifford's body is still warm. Let's slow down a bit and take it one step at a time, okay? Okay. Now, convince me Mark Sway was in the car with Jerome Clifford prior to the shooting. No problem. Fultrig looked at a notepad and reeled off the many places where fingerprints were matched. Rear taillights, trunk, front passenger door handle and lock switch, dash, gun, bottle of Jack Daniels. There was a tentative match on the hose, but it was not definite. They were working on it. Fultrig was the prosecutor now, building a case with indisputable evidence. Reggie took pages of notes. She knew Mark had been in the car, but she had no idea he'd left such a wide trail. "'The whiskey bottle?' she asked. Fultrig flipped a page for the details. "'Yes, three definite prints, no question about it.' Mark had told her about the gun, but not about the bottle. "'Seems a bit strange, doesn't it?' "'It's all strange at this point.' The police officers who talked to him do not recall smelling alcohol, so I don't think he drank any of it. I'm sure he could explain it, you know, if only we could talk to him. I'll ask him. So he didn't tell you about the bottle? No. Did he explain the gun? I cannot divulge what my client has explained to me. Fultrick waited desperately for a hint, and this really angered him. Truman likewise waited breathlessly. McThune stopped reading the report of a court-appointed psychiatrist. "'So he hasn't told you everything?' Fultrig asked. "'He's told me a lot. It's possible he missed some of the details. These details could be crucial. I'll determine what's crucial and what's not. What else do you have?' "'Hand on the note,' Fultrig instructed Truman, who produced it from a file and handed it to her. She read it slowly, then read it again. Mark had not mentioned the note. Obviously, two different pens, Fultrig explained. We found the blue one in the car, a cheap bick out of ink. Just speculating, it looks as though Clifford tried to add something after Mark left the car. The word where seems to indicate the boy was gone. It's obvious they talked, exchanged names, and that the kid was in the car long enough to touch everything. No prints on this? she asked, waving the note. None. We've checked it thoroughly. The kid did not touch it. She calmly placed it next to her legal pad and folded her hands together. Well, Roy, I think the big question is, how did you guys match his fingerprints? How did you obtain one of his to match with the ones in the car? She asked this with the same confident sneer Truman and Macthune had seen when she produced the tape less than four hours ago. Very simple. We lifted one off a soft drink can at the hospital last night. Did you ask either Mark Sway or his mother before doing so? No. So you invaded the privacy of an eleven-year-old child? No, we are trying to obtain evidence. Evidence? Evidence for what? Not for a crime, I dare say. The crime has been committed and the body has been disposed of. You just can't find it. What other crime do we have here? Suicide? Watching the suicide? Did he watch the suicide? I can't tell you what he did or saw, because he has confided in me as his lawyer. 
Our talks are privileged. You know that, Roy. What else have you taken from this child? Nothing. She snorted as if she didn't believe this. What else do you have? This is not enough? I want it all. Fultrick flipped pages back and forth and did a slow burn. You've seen the puffy left eye and a knot on his forehead. The police said there was a trace of blood on his lip when they found him at the scene. Clifford's autopsy revealed a spot of blood on the back of his right hand, and it's not his type. Let me guess. It's Mark's. Probably so, same blood type. How do you know his blood type? Fultrick dropped the legal pad and rubbed his face. The most effective defense lawyers are those who keep the fighting away from the issues. They bitch and throw rocks over the tiny subplots of a case and hope the prosecution and the jury are diverted away from the obvious guilt of their clients. If there's something to hide, then scream at the other guy for violating technicalities. Right now they should be nailing down the facts of what, if anything, Clifford said to Mark. It should be so simple. But now the kid had a lawyer, and here they were trying to explain how they obtained certain crucial information. There was nothing wrong with lifting prints from a can without asking. Good police work. But from the mouth of a defense lawyer, it's suddenly a vicious invasion of privacy. Next, she would threaten a lawsuit. And now, the blood. She was good. He found it difficult to believe she'd been practicing only four years. From his brother's hospital admission records. And how did you obtain the hospital records? We have ways. Truman braced for a reprimand. MacThune hid behind the file. They had been burned by this temper. She'd made them stutter and stammer and sweat blood. And now it was time for old Roy to take a few punches. It was almost funny. But she kept her cool. She slowly extended a skinny finger with white nail polish and pointed it at Roy. If you get near my client again and attempt to obtain anything from him without my permission, I'll sue you and the FBI. I'll file an ethics complaint with the state bar in Louisiana and Tennessee, and I'll hold your ass into juvenile court here and ask the judge to lock you up. The words were spoken in an even voice, no emotion, but so matter-of-factly that everyone in the room, including Roy Fultrick, knew that she would do exactly as she promised. He smiled and nodded. Fine. Sorry if we've gotten a bit out of line, but we're anxious and we must talk to your client. Have you told me everything you know about Mark? Fultrick and Truman checked their notes. Yes, I think so. What's that? she insisted, pointing to the file MacThune was lost in. He was reading about her suicide attempt by pills, and it was alleged in the pleadings, sworn under oath, that she'd been in a coma for four days before pulling out. Evidently her ex-husband, Dr. Cardoni, a real piece of scum, according to the pleadings, was a nasty sort with all the money and lawyers, and as soon as Regina-slash-Reggie here took the pills, he ran to court with a pile of motions to get the kids. Looking at the dates stamped on the papers, it was obvious the good doctor was filing requests and asking for hearings while she was lost in a coma and fighting for her life. Maxune didn't panic. He looked at her innocently and said, Just some of our internal stuff. It was not a lie, because he was afraid to lie to her. She had the tape and had sworn them to truthfulness. About my client? Oh, no. She studied her legal pad. Let's meet again tomorrow, she said. It was not a suggestion, but a directive. We are really in a hurry, Reggie, Fultrick pleaded. Well, I'm not. And I guess I'm calling the shots, aren't I? I guess you are. I need time to digest this and talk with my client. This was not what they wanted, but it was painfully clear this was all they would get. Fultrig dramatically screwed the top onto his pen and slid his notes into his briefcase. Truman and Maxune followed his lead, and for a minute the table shook as they shuffled paper and files and restuffed everything. What time tomorrow? Fultrick asked, slamming his briefcase and pushing away from the table. Ten, in this office. Will Mark Sway be here? I don't know. 
They stood and filed out of the room. Chapter 12 Wally Box called the office in New Orleans at least four times every hour. Fultrig had forty-seven assistant U.S. attorneys fighting all sorts of crime and protecting the interests of the government, and Wally was in charge of relaying orders from the boss in Memphis. In addition to Thomas Fink, three other attorneys were working on the Moldano case, and Wally felt the need to call them every fifteen minutes with instructions and the latest on Clifford. By noon, the entire office knew of Mark Sway and his little brother. The place buzzed with gossip and speculation. How much did the kid know? Would he lead them to the body? Initially these questions were pondered in hushed whispers by the three Moldano prosecutors, but by mid-afternoon the secretaries in the coffee room were exchanging wild theories about the suicide note and what was told to the kid before Clifford ate his bullet. All other work virtually stopped as Fultrig's office waited for Wally's next call. Fultrig had been burned by leaks before. He'd fired people he suspected of talking too much. He'd required polygraphs for all lawyers, paralegals, investigators, and secretaries who worked for him. He kept sensitive information under lock and key for fear of leakage by his own people. He lectured and threatened. But Roy Fultrick was not the sort of person to inspire intense loyalty. He was not appreciated by many of the assistants. He played the political game. He used cases for his own raw ambition. He hogged the spotlight and took credit for all the good work and blamed his subordinates for all the bad. He sought marginal indictments against elected officials for a few cheap headlines. He investigated his enemies and dragged their names through the press. He was a political whore whose only talent with the law was in the courtroom, where he preached to juries and quoted scripture. He was a Reagan appointee with one year left, and most of the assistant attorneys were counting the days. They encouraged him to run for office. Any office. The reporters in New Orleans began calling at 8 a.m. They wanted an official comment about Clifford from Fultrig's office. They did not get one. Then Willis Upchurch performed at 2 o'clock with Moldano glowering at his side, and more reporters came snooping around the office. There were hundreds of phone calls to Memphis and back. People talked. They stood before the dirty window at the end of the hall on the ninth floor and watched the rush-hour traffic of downtown. Diane nervously lit a Virginia Slim and blew a heavy cloud of smoke. Who is this lawyer? Her name is Reggie Love. How did you find her? He pointed to the Sterrick building four blocks away. I went to her office in that building right there and I talked to her. Why, Mark? These cops scare me, Mom. The police and FBI are crawling all over this place. And reporters. I had one catch me in the elevator this afternoon. I think we need some legal advice. Lawyers don't work for free, Mark. You know we can't afford a lawyer. I've already paid her, he said, like a tycoon. What? How can you pay a lawyer? She wanted a small retainer, and she got one. I gave her a dollar from that five that went for donuts this morning. She's working for a dollar. She must be a great lawyer. She's pretty good. I've been impressed so far. Diane shook her head in amazement. During her nasty divorce, Mark, then age nine, had constantly criticized her lawyer. He watched hours of reruns of Perry Mason and never missed L.A. Law. It had been years since she'd won an argument with him. What has she done so far? Diane asked, as if she were emerging from a dark cave and seeing sunlight for the first time in a month. At noon she met with some FBI agents and ripped them up pretty good, and later she met with them again in her office. I haven't talked with her since then. What time is she coming here? Around six. She wants to meet you and talk to Dr. Greenway. You'll really like her, Mom. Diane filled her lungs with smoke and exhaled. But why do we need her, Mark? I don't understand why she's entered the picture. You've done nothing wrong. You and Ricky saw the car. You tried to help the man, but he shot himself anyway. And you guys saw it. Why do you need a lawyer? Well, I did lie to the cops at first, and that scares me. 
and I was afraid we might get in trouble because we didn't stop the man from shooting himself. It's all pretty scary, Mom. She watched him intently as he explained this, and he avoided her eyes. There was a long pause. Have you told me everything? She asked this very slowly, as if she knew. At first he'd lied to her at the trailer while they waited on the ambulance, with Hardy lingering nearby, all ears. Then, last night in Ricky's room, under cross-examination by Greenway, he had told the first version of the truth. He remembered how sad she had been when she heard this revised story, and later how she'd said, You never lie to me, Mark. They'd been through so much together, and here he was, dancing around the truth, dodging questions, telling Reggie more than he told his mother. It made him sick. Mom, it all happened so fast yesterday. It was all a blur in my mind last night, but I've been thinking about it today, thinking hard. I've gone through each step minute by minute, and I'm remembering things now. Such as? Well, you know how this has affected Ricky. I think it shocked me sort of like that, not as bad, but I'm remembering things now that I should have remembered last night when I talked to Dr. Greenway. Does this make sense? Actually, it did make sense. Diane was suddenly concerned. Two boys see the same event. One goes into shock. It's reasonable to believe the other would be affected. She hadn't thought of this. She leaned down next to him. Ma, are you all right? He knew he had her. I think so, he said with a frown, as if a migraine were upon him. What have you remembered? she asked cautiously. He took a deep breath. Well, I remember. Greenway cleared his throat and appeared from nowhere. Mark whirled around. I need to be going, Greenway said, almost as an apology. I'll check back in a couple of hours. Diane nodded but said nothing. Mark decided to get it over with. Look, doctor, I was just telling Mom that I'm remembering things now for the first time. About the suicide? Yes, sir. All day long I've been seeing flashes and recalling details. I think some of it might be important. Greenway looked at Diane. Let's go back to the room and talk, he said. They walked to the room, closed the door behind them, and listened as Mark tried to fill in the gaps. It was a relief to unload this baggage, though he did most of the talking in the direction of the floor. It was an act, this painful pulling of scenes from a shocked and badly scarred mind, and he carried it off with finesse. He paused quite often, long pauses, in which he searched for words to describe what was already firmly etched in his memory. He glanced at Greenway occasionally, and the doctor's expression never changed. He glanced at his mother from time to time, and she didn't appear to be disappointed. She maintained a look of motherly concern. But when he got to the part about Clifford grabbing him, he could see them fidget. He kept his troubled eyes on the floor. Diane sighed when he talked about the gun. Greenway shook his head when he told of the gunshot through the window. At times he thought they were about to yell at him for lying last night, but he plowed ahead, obviously disturbed and deep in thought. He carefully replayed every single event that Ricky could have seen and heard. The only details he kept to himself were Clifford's confessions. He vividly recalled the crazy stuff, La La Land and floating off to see the wizard. When he finished, Diane was sitting on the fold-away bed rubbing her head, talking about Valium. Greenway sat in a chair, hanging on every word. "'Is this all of it, Mark?' "'I don't know. It's all I can remember right now,' he mumbled as if he had a toothache. "'You were actually in the car,' Diane said, without opening her eyes. He pointed to his slightly swollen left eye. "'You see this? This is where he slapped me when I tried to get out of the car. I was dizzy for a long time. Maybe I was unconscious. I don't know.' You told me you were in a fight at school. I don't remember telling you that, Mom, and if I did well, maybe I was in shock or something. Damn it, trapped by another lie. Greenway stroked his beard. Ricky saw you get grabbed, 
thrown in the car, the gunshot. Wow. Yeah, it's coming back to me real clear. I'm sorry I didn't remember it sooner, but my mind just went blank, sort of like Ricky here. Another long pause. Frankly, Mark, I find it hard to believe you couldn't remember some of this last night, Greenway said. Give me a break, would you? Look at Ricky here. He saw what happened to me, and it drove him to the ozone. Did we talk last night? Come on, Mark, Diane said. Of course we talked, Greenway said, with at least four new wrinkles across his forehead. Yeah, I guess we did. Don't remember much of it, though. Greenway frowned at Diane, and their eyes locked. Mark walked into the bathroom and drank water out of a paper cup. It's okay, Diane said. Have you told the police this? No, I just remembered it, remember? Diane nodded slowly and managed a very slight grin at Mark. Her eyes were narrow, and his suddenly found the floor. She believed all of his story about the suicide, but this sudden surge of clear memory did not fool her. She would deal with him later. Greenway had his doubts, too, but he was more concerned with treating his patient than reprimanding Mark. He gently stroked his beard and studied the wall. There was a long pause. "'I'm hungry,' Mark finally said. Reggie arrived an hour late with apologies. Greenway had left for the day. Mark stumbled through the introductions. She smiled warmly at Diane as they shook hands, then sat beside her on the bed. She asked her a dozen questions about Ricky. She was an immediate friend of the family, anxious and properly concerned about everything. What about her job, school, money, clothes? Diane was tired and vulnerable, and it was nice to talk to a woman. She opened up, and they went on for a while about Greenway, saying this and that, about everything unrelated to Mark and his story and the FBI, the only reason for Reggie's being there. Reggie had a sack of deli sandwiches and chips, and Mark spread them on a crowded table by Ricky's bed. He left the room to get drinks. They hardly noticed. He bought two Dr. Peppers in the waiting area and returned to the room without being stopped by cops, reporters, or mafia gunmen. The women were deep into a conversation about McThune and Truman trying to interrogate Mark. Reggie was telling the story in such a manner that Diane had no choice but to mistrust the FBI. They were both shocked. Diane was alive and animated for the first time in many hours. Jack, Nance, and Associates was a quiet firm that advertised itself as security specialists, but was in fact nothing more than a couple of private investigators. Its ad in the yellow pages was one of the smallest in town. It did not want the run-of-the-mill divorce cases in which one spouse was sleeping around and the other wanted photos. It did not own a polygraph. It did not snatch children. It did not track down thieving employees. Jack Nance himself was an ex-con with an impressive record who'd managed to avoid trouble for ten years. His associate was Cal Sisson, also a convicted felon who'd run a terrific scam with a bogus roofing company. Together they scratched out a nice living doing dirty work for rich people. They had once broken both hands of the teenage boyfriend of a rich client's daughter after the kid slapped her. They had once deprogrammed a couple of Moonies, the children of another rich client. They were not afraid of violence. More than once they had beaten a business rival who'd taken money from a client. They had once burned the downtown love nest of a client's wife and her lover. There was a market for their brand of investigative work, and they were known in small circles as two very nasty and efficient men who would take your cash, do your dirty work, and leave no trail. They achieved amazing results. Every client came by referral. Jack Nance was in his cluttered office after dark when someone knocked on the door. The secretary had left for the day. Cal Sisson was stalking a crack dealer who'd hooked the son of a client. Nance was around forty, not a big man, but compact and extremely agile. He walked through the secretary's office and opened the front door. The face was a strange one. "'Looking for Jack Nance,' the man said. "'That's me.' The man stretched out his hand and they shook. "'My name's Paul Gronke. Can I come in?' Nance opened the door wider and motioned for Gronke to enter. They stood in front of the secretary's desk. 
Grunky looked around the cramped and messy room. It's late, Nat said. What do you want? I need some fast work. Who referred you? I've heard of you. Word gets around. Give me a name. Okay, J.L. Granger. I think he helped him on a business deal. He also mentioned Mr. Schwartz, who was also quite pleased with your work. Nance thought about this for a second as he studied Grunky. He was a burly man with a thick chest, late thirties, badly dressed, but didn't know it. Because of his clipped drawl, Nance immediately knew he was from New Orleans. I get a $2,000 retainer up front, non-refundable, all in cash, before I lift a finger. Grunky pulled a roll of bills from his left front pocket and peeled off twenty big ones. Nance relaxed. It was his fastest retainer in ten years. Sit down, he said, taking the money and waving at a sofa. I'm listening. Gronky took a folded newspaper clipping from his jacket and handed it to Nance. Did you see this in today's paper? Nance looked at it. Yeah, I read it. How are you involved? I'm from New Orleans. In fact, Mr. Muldana is an old pal, and he's very disturbed to see his name suddenly show up here in the Memphis paper. It says he has mafia ties and all. Can't believe a word in the newspapers. The press is going to ruin this country. Was Clifford his lawyer? Yeah, but now has a new one. That's not important, though. Let me tell you what's worrying him. He has a good source telling him these two boys know something. Where are the boys? One's in the hospital, a coma or something. He freaked out when Clifford shot himself. His brother was actually in the car with Clifford prior to the shooting, and we're afraid this kid might know something. He's already hired a lawyer and is refusing to talk to the FBI. Looks real suspicious. Where do I fit in? We need someone with Memphis connections. We need to see the kid. We need to know where he is at all times. What's his name? Mark Sway. He's at the hospital, we think, with his mother. Last night they stayed in the room with the younger brother, a kid named Ricky Sway. Ninth floor at St. Peter's, room 943. We want you to find the kid, determine his location as of now, and then watch him. Easy enough. Maybe not. There are cops and probably FBI agents watching, too. The kid's attracting the crowd. I got a hundred bucks an hour. Cash. I know that. She called herself Amber, which, along with Alexis, happened to be the two most popular acquired names among strippers and whores in the French Quarter. She answered the phone, then carried it a few feet to the tiny bathroom, where Barry Moldano was brushing his teeth. "'It's Gronky,' she said, handing it to him. He took it, turned off the water, and admired her naked body as she crawled under the sheets. He stepped into the doorway. "'Yeah,' he said into the phone." A minute later he placed the phone on the table next to the bed and quickly dried himself off. He dressed in a hurry. Amber was somewhere under the covers. "'What time are you going to work?' he asked, tying his tie. Ten. What time is it?' Her head appeared between the pillows. "'Almost nine. I gotta run an errand. I'll be back.' "'Why? You got what you wanted.' "'I might want some more. I pay the rent here, sweetheart. Some rent.' Why don't you move me out of this dump? Get me a nice place. He tugged his sleeves from under his jacket and admired himself in the mirror. Perfect. Just perfect. He smiled at Amber. I like it here. It's a dump. If you treated me right, you'd get me a nice place. Yeah, yeah. See you later, sweetheart. He slammed the door. Strippers. Get them a job, then an apartment, buy some clothes, feed them nice dinners— and then they get culture and start making demands. They were an expensive habit, but one he could not break. He bounced down the steps in his alligator loafers and opened the door onto Domain. He looked right and left, certain that someone was watching, and took off around the corner onto Bourbon. He moved in shadows, crossing and recrossing the street, then turned corners and retraced some of his steps. He zigzagged for eight blocks, then disappeared into Randy's Oyster on Decatur. If they stuck to him, they were supermen. Randy's was a sanctuary. It was an old-fashioned New Orleans eatery, long and narrow, dark and crowded, off-limits for tourists, owned and operated by the family. He ran up the cramped staircase to the second floor where reserved seating was required, and only a select few could get reservations. 
He nodded to a waiter, grinned at a beefy thug, and entered a private room with four tables. Three were empty, and at the fourth a solitary figure sat in virtual darkness, reading by the light of a real candle. Barry approached, stopped, and waited to be invited. The man saw him and waved at a chair. Barry obediently took a seat. Johnny Solari was the brother of Barry's mother and the undisputed head of the family. He owned Randy's along with a hundred other assorted ventures. As usual, he was working tonight, reading financial statements by candlelight and waiting for dinner. This was Tuesday, just another night at the office. On Friday, Johnny would be here with an Amber, or an Alexis, or a Sabrina, and on Saturday he would be here with his wife. He did not appreciate the interruption. "'What is it?' he asked. Barry leaned forward, well aware that he was not wanted here at this moment. "'Just talk to Gronky and Memphis. Kids hired a lawyer and is refusing to talk to the FBI.' "'I can't believe you're so stupid, Barry. You know that?' We've had this conversation, okay? I know, and we'll have it again. You're a dumbass, and I just want you to know I think you're a real dumbass. Okay, I'm a dumbass, but we need to make a move. What? We need to send Bono and someone else. Maybe Perini, maybe the Bull, I don't care, but we need a couple of men in Memphis, and we need them now. You want to hit the kid? Maybe. We'll see. We need to find out what it knows, okay? If it knows too much, then maybe we'll take him out. I'm embarrassed we're related by blood, Barry. You're a complete fool, you know that? Okay, but we need to move fast. Johnny picked up a stack of papers and began reading. San Bono and Perini, but no more stupid moves, okay? You're an idiot, Barry. An imbecile. And I don't want anything done up there until I say so, understand? Yes, sir. Leave now. Johnny waved his hand, and Barry jumped to his feet. Chapter 13 By Tuesday evening, George Ord and his staff had managed to confine the activities of Fultrick, Box, and Fink to the expansive library in the center of the offices. Here they'd set up camp. They had two phones. Ord loaned them a secretary and an intern. All other assistant attorneys were ordered to stay out of the library. Fultrick kept the doors closed and spread his papers and mess over the sixteen-foot conference table in the middle of the room. Truman was allowed to come and go. The secretary fetched coffee and sandwiches whenever the Reverend ordered. Fultrick had been a mediocre student of the law and had managed to avoid the drudgery of legal research for the past fifteen years. He had learned to hate libraries in law school. Research was to be done by egghead scholars. That was his theory. Law could be practiced only by real lawyers who could stand before juries and preach. But out of sheer boredom, here he was in George Ord's library with Box and Fink, nothing to do but wait at the beck and call of one Reggie Love, and so he, the great Roy Fultrig, lawyer extraordinaire, had his nose stuck in a thick law book with a dozen more stacked around him on the table. Fink, the egghead scholar, was on the floor between two shelves of books with his shoes off and research materials littered about. Box, also a lightweight legal intellect, went through the motions at the other end of Fultrig's table. Box had not opened a law book in years, but for the moment there was simply nothing else to do. He wore his only clean pair of boxer shorts and hoped like hell they left Memphis tomorrow. At issue, at the heart of their research, was the question of how Mark Sway could be made to divulge information if he didn't want to. If someone possesses information crucial to a criminal prosecution and that person chooses not to talk, then how can the information be obtained? For issue number two, Fultrick wanted to know if Reggie Love could be made to divulge whatever Mark Sway had told her. The attorney-client privilege is almost sacred, but Roy wanted it researched anyway. The debate over whether or not Mark Sway knew anything had ended hours ago with Fultrick clearly victorious. The kid had been in the car. Clifford was crazy and wanted to talk. The kid had lied to the cops, and now the kid had a lawyer because the kid knew something and was afraid to talk. 
Why didn't Mark Sway simply come clean and tell all? Why? Because he was afraid of the killer of Boyd Boyette, plain and simple. Fink still had his doubts, but was tired of arguing. His boss was not bright and was very stubborn, and when he closed his mind it remained closed forever, and there was a lot of merit to Fultrig's arguments. The kid was making strange moves, especially for a kid. Vox, of course, stood firm behind his boss and believed everything he said. If Roy said the kid knew where the body was, then it was the gospel. Pursuant to one of his many phone calls, a half-dozen assistant U.S. attorneys were doing identical research in New Orleans. Larry Truman knocked and entered the library around ten, Tuesday night. He'd been in McThune's office for most of the evening. Following Fultrig's orders, they'd begun the process of obtaining approval to offer Mark Sway safety under the Federal Witness Protection Program. They had made a dozen phone calls to Washington, twice speaking with the director of the FBI, F. Denton Voiles. If Mark Sway didn't give Fultrig the answers he wanted in the morning, they would be ready with a most attractive offer. Fultrig said it would be an easy deal. The kid had nothing to lose. They would offer his mother a good job in a new city, one of her choosing. She would earn more than the six lousy bucks an hour she got at the lamp factory. The family would live in a house with a foundation, not a cheap trailer. There would be a cash incentive, maybe a new car. Mark sat in the darkness on the thin mattress and stared at his mother lying above him next to Ricky. He was sick of this room and this hospital. The fold-away bed was ruining his back. Tragically, Karen the Beautiful was not at the nurse's station. The hallways were empty. No one waited for the elevators. A solitary man occupied the waiting area. He flipped through a magazine and ignored the mash reruns on the television. He was on the sofa, which happened to be the spot Mark had planned to sleep. Mark stuck two quarters in the machine and pulled out a Sprite. He sat in a chair and stared at the TV. The man was about forty and looked tired and worried. Ten minutes passed, and Mash went away. Suddenly there was Gil Teal, the people's lawyer, standing calmly at the scene of a car wreck, talking about defending rights and fighting insurance companies. Gil Teal, he's for real. Jack Nance closed the magazine and picked up another. He glanced at Mark for the first time and smiled. Hi there, he said warmly, then looked at a red book. Mark nodded. The last thing he needed in his life was another stranger. He sipped his drink and prayed for silence. "'What are you doing here?' the man asked. "'Watching television,' Mark answered, barely audible. The man stopped smiling and began reading an article. The midnight news came on, and there was a huge story about a typhoon in Pakistan. There were live pictures of dead people and dead animals piled along the shore like driftwood. It was the kind of footage one had to watch. "'That's awful, isn't it?' Jack Nance said to the TV, as a helicopter hovered over a pile of human debris. "'It's gross,' Mark said, careful not to get friendly. "'Who knows, this guy could be just another hungry lawyer waiting to pounce on wounded prey.' "'Really gross,' the man said, shaking his head at the suffering. "'I guess we have much to be thankful for, but it's hard to be thankful in a hospital, know what I mean?' He was suddenly sad again. He looked painfully at Mark. "'What's the matter?' Mark couldn't help but ask. "'It's my son. He's in real bad shape.' The man threw the magazine on the table and rubbed his eyes. "'What happened?' Mark asked. He felt sorry for this guy. "'Car wreck. Drunk driver. My boy was thrown out of the car.' "'Where is he?' "'I see you, first floor.' I had to leave and get away. It's a zoo down there. People screaming and crying all the time. I'm very sorry. He's only eight years old. He appeared to be crying, but Mark couldn't tell. My little brother's eight. He's in a room around the corner. What's wrong with him? The man asked without looking. He's in shock. What happened? It's a long story. and getting longer. He'll make it, though. I sure hope your kid pulls through. Jack Nance looked at his watch and suddenly stood. Me too. I need to go check on him. Good luck to you. What's your name? Mark Sway. 
Good luck, Mark. I gotta run. He walked to the elevator and disappeared. Mark took his place on the couch and within minutes was asleep. Chapter 14 The photos on the front page of Wednesday's edition of the Memphis Press had been lifted from the yearbook at Willow Road Elementary School. They were a year old. Mark was in the fourth grade and Ricky the first. They were next to each other on the bottom third of the page, and under the cute, smiling faces were the names. Mark Sway, Ricky Sway. To the left was a story about Jerome Clifford's suicide and the bizarre aftermath in which the boys were involved. It was written by Slick Moeller, and he pieced together a suspicious little story. The FBI was involved. Ricky was in shock. Mark had called 911 but hadn't given his name. The police had tried to interrogate Mark, but he hadn't talked yet. The family had hired a lawyer, one Reggie Love, female. Mark's fingerprints were all over the inside of the car, including the gun. The story made Mark look like a cold-blooded killer. Karen brought it to him around six, as he sat in an empty, semi-private room directly across the hall from Ricky's. Mark was watching cartoons and trying to nap. Greenway wanted everyone out of the room except Ricky and Diane. An hour earlier Ricky had opened his eyes and asked to use the bathroom. He was back in the bed now, mumbling about nightmares and eating ice cream. "'You've hit the big time,' Karen said as she handed him the front section and put his orange juice on the table. "'What is it?' he asked, suddenly staring at his face in black and white. "'Damn!' "'Just a little story. I'd like your autograph when you have time.' "'Very funny.' She left the room, and he read it slowly. Reggie had told him about the fingerprints in the note. He dreamed about the gun, but through a legitimate lapse in memory had forgotten about touching the whiskey bottle. There was something unfair here. He was just a kid who'd been minding his own business, and now suddenly his picture was on the front page and fingers were pointed at him. How can a newspaper dig up old yearbook photos and run them whenever it chooses? Wasn't he entitled to a little privacy? He threw the paper to the floor and walked to the window. It was dawn, drizzling outside, and downtown Memphis was slowly coming to life. Standing in the window of the empty room, looking at the blocks of tall buildings, he felt completely alone. Within an hour a half million people would be awake, reading about Mark and Ricky Sway while sipping their coffee and eating their toast. The dark buildings would soon be filled with busy people gathering around desks and coffee pots, and they would gossip and speculate wildly about him and what had happened with the dead lawyer. Surely the kid was in the car. There are fingerprints everywhere. How did the kid get in the car? How did he get out? They would read Slick Moeller's story as if every word were true, as if Slick had the inside dope. It was not fair for a kid to read about himself on the front page and not have parents to hide behind. Any kid in this mess needed the protection of a father and the sole affection of a mother. He needed a shield against cops and FBI agents and reporters and, God forbid, the mob. Here he was, eleven years old, alone, lying, then telling the truth, then lying some more, never certain what to do next. The truth can get you killed, he'd seen that in a movie one time, and always remembered it when he felt the urge to lie to someone in authority. How could he get out of this mess? He retrieved the paper from the floor and entered the hall. Greenway had stuck a note on Ricky's door, forbidding anyone from entering, including nurses. Diane was having back pains from sitting in his bed and rocking, and Greenway had ordered another round of pills for her discomfort. Mark stopped at the nurse's station and handed the paper to Karen. "'Nice story, huh?' she said with a smile. The romance was gone. She was still beautiful, but now playing hard to get, and he just didn't have the energy. "'I'm going to get a donut," he said. "'You want one?' "'No, thanks.' He walked to the elevators and pushed the call button. The middle door opened, and he stepped in. At that precise second, Jack Nance turned in the darkness of the waiting room and whispered into his radio. The elevator was empty. It was just a few minutes past six, a good half an hour before the rush hit. The elevator stopped at floor number eight. The door opened, and one man stepped in. He wore a white lab jacket, jeans, sneakers, and a baseball cap. Mark did not look at his face. He was tired of meeting new people. 
The door closed, and suddenly the man grabbed Mark and pinned him in a corner. He clenched his fingers around Mark's throat. The man fell to one knee and pulled something from a pocket. His face was inches from Mark's, and it was a horrible face. He was breathing heavy. "'Listen to me, Mark Sway,' he growled. Something clicked in his right hand, and suddenly a shiny switchblade entered the picture. A very long switchblade. "'I don't know what Jerome Clifford told you,' he said urgently. The elevator was moving. "'But if you repeat a single word of it to anyone, including your lawyer, I'll kill you. And I'll kill your mother and your little brother, okay? He's in room 943. I've seen the trailer where you live, okay? I've seen your school at Willow Road.' His breath was warm and had the smell of creamed coffee, and he aimed it directly at Mark's eyes. "'Do you understand me?' he sneered with a nasty smile. The elevator stopped, and the man was on his feet by the door, with the switchblade hidden by his leg. Although Mark was paralyzed, he was able to hope and pray that someone would get on the damned elevator with him. It was obvious he was not getting off at this point. They waited ten seconds at the sixth floor, and nobody entered. The doors closed, and they were moving again. The man lunged at him again, this time with a switchblade an inch or two from Mark's nose. He pinned him in the corner with a heavy forearm, and suddenly jabbed the shiny blade at Mark's waist. Quickly and efficiently he cut a belt loop, then a second one. He'd already delivered his message without interruption, and now it was time for a little reinforcement. "'I'll slice your guts out. Do you understand me?' he demanded, and then released Mark. Mark nodded. A lump the size of a golf ball clogged his dry throat, and suddenly his eyes were wet. He nodded, yes, yes, yes. I'll kill you. Do you believe me? Mark stared at the knife and nodded some more. And if you tell anyone about me, I'll get you. Understand? Mark kept nodding, only faster now. The man slid the knife into a pocket and pulled a folded eight-by-ten color photograph from under the lab jacket. He stuck it in Mark's face. "'You seen this before?' he asked, smiling now. It was a department store portrait, taken when Mark was in the second grade, and for years now it had hung in the den above the television. Mark stared at it. "'Recognize it?' the man barked at him. Mark nodded. There was only one such photograph in the world. The elevator stopped on the fifth floor, and the man moved quickly, again by the door. At the last second two nurses stepped in, and Mark finally breathed. He stayed in the corner, holding the railings, praying for a miracle. The switchblade had come closer with each assault, and he simply could not take another one. On the third floor three more people entered and stood between Mark and the man with the knife. In an instant Mark's assailant was gone, through the door as it was closing. "'Are you okay?' a nurse was staring at him, frowning and very concerned. The elevator kicked and started down. She touched his forehead and felt a layer of sweat between her fingers. His eyes were wet. "'You look pale,' she said. "'I'm okay,' he mumbled weakly, holding the railings for support. Another nurse looked down at him in the corner. They studied his face with much concern. "'Are you sure?' He nodded, and the elevator door suddenly opened on the second floor. He darted through bodies and was in a narrow corridor, dodging gurneys and wheelchairs. His well-worn Nike high-tops squeaked on the clean linoleum as he ran to a door with an exit sign over it. He pushed through the door and was in the stairwell. He grabbed the rails and started up, two steps at a time, churning and churning. The pain hit his thighs at the sixth floor, but he ran harder. He passed a doctor on the eighth floor, but never slowed. He ran, climbing the mountain at a record pace until the stairwell stopped on the fifteenth floor. He collapsed on a landing under a fire hose and sat in the semi-darkness until the sun filtered through a tiny painted window above him. Pursuant to his agreement with Reggie, Clint opened the office at exactly eight, and after turning on the lights made the coffee. It was Wednesday, Southern Pecan Day. He looked through the countless one-pound bags of coffee beans in the refrigerator until he found Southern Pecan, and measured four perfect scoops into the grinder. She would know in an instant if he'd missed the measurement by half a teaspoon. She would take the first sip like a wine connoisseur, smack her lips like a rabbit, then pass judgment on the coffee. He added the precise quantity of water, flipped the switch, and waited for the first black drops to hit the canister. The aroma was delicious. 
Clint enjoyed the coffee almost as much as his boss, and the meticulous routine of making it was only half serious. They began each morning with a quiet cup as they planned the day and talked about the mail. They had met in a detox center eleven years ago when she was forty-one and he was seventeen. They had started law school at the same time, but he flunked out after a nasty round with coke. He'd been perfectly clean for five years, she for six. They leaned on each other many times. He sorted the mail and placed it carefully on her clean desk. He poured his first cup of coffee in the kitchen and read with great interest the front-page story about her newest client. As usual, Slick had his facts, and as usual the facts were stretched with a good dose of innuendo thrown in. The boys favored each other, but Ricky's hair was a shade lighter. He smiled with several teeth missing. Clint placed the front page in the center of Reggie's desk. Unless she was expected in court, Reggie seldom made it to the office before 9 a.m. She was a slow starter who usually hit her stride around 4 in the afternoon and preferred to work late. Her mission as a lawyer was to protect abused and neglected children, and she did this with great skill and passion. The juvenile courts routinely called her for indigent work representing kids who needed lawyers but didn't know it. She was a zealous advocate for small clients who could not say thanks. She had sued fathers for molesting daughters. She had sued uncles for raping their nieces. She had sued mothers for abusing their babies. She had investigated parents for exposing their children to drugs. She served as legal guardian for more than twenty children. And she worked the juvenile court as appointed counsel for kids in trouble with the law. She performed pro bono work for children in need of commitment to mental facilities. The money was adequate, but not important. She had money once, lots of it, and it had brought nothing but misery. She sipped the southern pecan, pronounced it good, and planned the day with Clint. It was a ritual adhered to whenever possible. As she picked up the newspaper, the buzzer rang as the door opened. Clint jumped to answer it. He found Mark Sway standing in the reception room, wet from the drizzle and out of breath. "'Good morning, Mark. You're all wet. I need to see Reggie.' His bang stuck to his forehead, and water dripped from his nose. He was in a daze. Sure. Clint backed away from him, and returned with a hand towel from the restroom. He wiped Mark's face and said, Follow me. Reggie was waiting in the center of her office. Clint closed the door and left them alone. What's the matter? she asked. I think we need to talk. She pointed, and he sat in a wing-back chair, and she sat on the sofa. "'What's going on, Mark?' His eyes were red and tired. He stared at the flowers on the coffee table. "'Ricky snapped out of it early this morning. "'That's great. What time?' "'A couple of hours ago. "'You look tired. Would you like some hot cocoa?' "'No. Did you see the paper this morning?' "'Yeah, I saw. Does it scare you?' "'Of course it scares me.' Clint knocked on the door then opened it and brought the hot cocoa anyway. Mark thanked him and held it with both hands. He was cold, and the warm cup helped. Clint closed the door and was gone. "'When do we meet with the FBI?' he asked. "'In an hour. Why?' He sipped the cocoa, and it burned his tongue. "'I'm not sure I want to talk to them.' "'Okay. You don't have to. You know, I've explained all this. I know.' Can I ask you something? Of course, Mark. You look scared. It's been a rough morning. He took another tiny sip, then another. What would happen to me if I never told anyone what I know? You've told me. Yeah, but you can't tell. And I haven't told you everything, right? That's right. I've told you that I know where the body is, but I haven't told... I know, Mark. I don't know where it is. There's a big difference, and I certainly understand it. Do you want to know? Do you want to tell me? Not really. Not now. She was relieved, but didn't show it. Okay. Then I don't want to know. So what happens to me if I never tell? She'd thought about this for hours, and still had no answer. But she'd met Fultrick, had watched him under pressure, and was convinced he would try all legal means to extract the information from her client. 
As much as she wanted to, she could not advise him to lie. A lie would work just fine. One simple lie, and Mark Sway could live the rest of his life without regard to what happened in New Orleans. And why should he worry about Muldano and Fultrig and the late boy Boyette? He was just a kid, guilty of neither crime nor major sin. I think that an effort will be made to force you to talk. How does it work? I'm not sure. It's very rare. But I believe steps can be taken in court to force you to testify about what you know. Clinton and I have been researching it. I know what Clifford told me. But I don't know if it's the truth. But you think it's the truth, don't you, Mark? I think so, I guess. I don't know what to do. He was mumbling softly, at times barely audible, unwilling to look at her. Can they make me talk? he asked. She answered carefully. It could happen. I mean, a lot of things could happen. But, yes, a judge in a courtroom one day soon could order you to talk. And if I refused? Good question, Mark. It's a gray area. If an adult refuses a court order, he's in contempt of court and runs the risk of being locked up. I don't know what they'd do with a child. I've never heard of it before. What about a polygraph? What do you mean? Well, let's say they drag me into court and the judge tells me to spill my guts and I tell the story but leave out the most important part and they think I'm lying. What then? Can they strap me in the chair and start asking questions? I saw it in a movie one time. You saw a child take a polygraph? No. It was some cop who got caught lying. But, I mean, can they do it to me? I doubt it. I've never heard of it, and I'd be fighting like crazy to stop it. But it could happen. I'm not sure. I doubt it. These were hard questions coming at her like gunfire, and she had to be careful. Clients often heard what they wanted to hear and missed the rest. But I must warn you, Mark, if you lie in court, you could be in big trouble. He thought about this for a second and said, If I tell the truth, I'm in bigger trouble. Why? She waited a long time for a response. Every twenty seconds or so he would take a sip of the cocoa, but he was not at all interested in answering this question. The silence did not bother him. He stared at the table, but his mind whirled away somewhere else. Mark, last night you indicated you were ready to talk to the FBI and tell them your story. Now it's obvious you've changed your mind. Why? What's happened? Without a word, he gently placed the cup on the table and covered his eyes with his fists. His chin dropped to his chest, and he started crying. The door opened into the reception area, and a Federal Express lady ran in with a box three inches thick. All smiles and perfect efficiency, she handed it to Clint and showed him where to sign. She thanked him, wished him a nice day, and vanished. The package was expected. It was from Print Research, an amazing little outfit in D.C. that did nothing but scan two hundred daily newspapers nationwide and catalog the stories. The news was clipped, copied, computerized, and readily available within twenty-four hours for those willing to pay. Reggie didn't want to pay, but she needed quick background on Boyette at all. Clint had placed the order yesterday, as soon as Mark left, and Reggie had herself a new client. The search was limited to the New Orleans and Washington papers. He removed the contents a neat stack of eight-and-a-half by eleven Xerox copies of newspaper stories, headlines, and photos, all arranged in perfect chronological order, all copied with the columns straight and the photos clean. Boyette was an old Democrat from New Orleans, and he'd served several terms as an undistinguished rank-and-file member of the U.S. House, when one day Senator Dauvin, an antebellum relic from the Civil War, suddenly died in office at the age of ninety-one. Boyette pulled strings and twisted arms, and in keeping with the great tradition of Louisiana politics, rounded up some cash and found a home for it. He was appointed by the governor to fill the unexpired portion of Dauvin's term. The theory was simple. If a man had enough sense to accumulate a bunch of cash, then he would certainly make a worthy U.S. senator. 
Boyette became a member of the world's most exclusive club, and with time proved himself quite capable. Over the years he narrowly missed a few indictments and evidently learned his lessons. He survived two close re-elections and finally reached a point attained by most Southern senators where he was simply left alone. When this happened, Boyette slowly mellowed and changed from a hell-raising segregationist to a rather liberal and open-minded statesman. He lost favor with three straight governors in Louisiana, and in doing so became an outcast with the petroleum and chemical companies that had ruined the ecology of the state. So Boyd Boyette became a radical environmentalist, something unheard of among Southern politicians. He railed against the oil and gas industry, and it vowed to defeat him. He held hearings in small bayou towns devastated by the oil boom and bust, and made enemies in the tall buildings in New Orleans. Senator Boyette embraced the crumbling ecology of his beloved state and studied it with a passion. Six years ago, someone in New Orleans had floated out a proposal to build a toxic waste dump in Lafourche Parish, about eighty miles southwest of New Orleans. It was quickly killed for the first time by local authorities. As is true with most ideas created by rich corporate minds, it didn't go away, but rather it came back a year later with a different name, a different set of consultants, new promises of local jobs, and a new mouthpiece doing the presenting. It was voted down by the locals for the second time, but the vote was much closer. A year passed, some money changed hands, cosmetic changes were made to the plans, and it was suddenly back on the agenda. The folks who lived around the site were hysterical. Rumors were rampant, especially a persistent one, that the New Orleans mob was behind the dump and would not stop until it was a reality. Of course, millions were at stake. The New Orleans papers did a credible job of linking the mob to the toxic waste site. A dozen corporations were involved, and names and addresses led to several known and undisputed crime figures. The stage was set. The deal was done, the dump was to be approved. Then Senator Boyette came crashing in with an army of federal regulators. He threatened investigations by a dozen agencies. He held weekly press conferences. He made speeches all over southern Louisiana. The advocates of the waste site ran for cover. The corporations issued terse statements of no comment. Boyette had them on the ropes, and he was enjoying himself immensely. On the night of his disappearance, the senator had attended an angry meeting of local citizens at a packed high school gymnasium in Homa. He left late and alone, as was his custom, for the hour drive to his home near New Orleans. Years earlier, Boyette had grown weary of the constant small talk and incessant ass-kissing of aides, and he preferred to drive by himself whenever possible. He was studying Russian, his fourth language, and he cherished the solitude of his Cadillac and the language tapes. By noon the next day it was determined the senator was missing. The splashy headlines from New Orleans told the story. Bold headlines in the Washington Post suspected foul play. Days went by and the news was scarce. No body was found. A hundred old photos of the senator were dug up and used by the newspapers. The story was becoming old when, suddenly, the name of Barry Maldano was linked to the disappearance, and this set off a frenzy of mafia dirt and trash. A rather frightening mugshot of a young Maldano ran on page one in New Orleans. The paper rehashed its earlier stories about the waste site and the mob. The Blade was a known hitman with a criminal record, and on and on. Roy Fultrig made a grand entrance into the story when he stepped in front of the cameras to announce the indictment of Barry Maldano for the murder of Senator Boyd Boyette. He, too, got the front page in both New Orleans and Washington, and Clint remembered a similar photo in the Memphis paper. Big news, but no body. This, however, did not throttle Mr. Fultrig. He ranted against organized crime. He predicted certain victory. He preached his carefully prepared remarks with the flair of a veteran stage actor, shouting at all the right moments, pointing his finger, waving the indictment. He had no comment about the absence of a corpse, but hinted that he knew something he couldn't tell, and said he had no doubt the remains of the late senator would be found. 
There were pictures and stories when Barry Moldano was arrested, or rather turned himself into the FBI. He spent three days in jail before bail was arranged, and there were photos of him leaving just as he'd arrived. He wore a dark suit and smiled at the cameras. He was innocent, he proclaimed. It was a vendetta. There were photos of bulldozers taken from a distance as the FBI trenched its way through the soggy soil of New Orleans searching for the body. More of Foltrig performing for the press. More investigative reports of New Orleans' rich history of organized crime. The story seemed to lose steam as the search continued. The governor, a Democrat, appointed a crony to serve the remaining year and a half of Boyette's term. The New Orleans paper ran an analysis of the many politicians waiting anxiously to run for the Senate. Foltrig was one of two Republicans rumored to be interested. He sat next to her on the sofa and wiped his eyes. He hated himself for crying, but it could not be helped. Her arm was around his shoulder, and she patted him gently. "'You don't have to say a word,' she repeated quietly. "'I really don't want to. Maybe later if I have to, but not now, okay?' "'Okay, Mark.' There was a knock at the door. "'Come in,' Reggie said, just loud enough to be heard. Clint appeared, holding a stack of papers and looking at his watch. "'Sorry to interrupt, but it's almost ten, and Mr. Foltrick will be here in a minute.' He placed the papers on the coffee table in front of her. You wanted to see these before the meeting. Tell Mr. Fultrig we have nothing to discuss, Reggie said. Clint frowned at her and looked at Mark. He sat close to her as if he needed protecting. You're not going to see him? No. Tell him the meeting's been cancelled because we have nothing to say, she said, and nodded at Mark. Clint glanced at his watch again and backed awkwardly to the door. "'Sure,' he said, with a smile, as if he suddenly enjoyed the idea of telling Foltrig to take a hike. He closed the door behind him. "'Are you okay?' she asked. "'Not really.' She leaned forward and began flipping through the copies of the clippings. Mark sat in a daze, tired and drained, still frightened after talking things over with his lawyer. She scanned the pages, reading the headlines and captions, and pulling the photographs closer to her. About a third of the way through, she suddenly stopped and leaned back on the sofa. She handed Mark a close-up of Barry Moldano as he smiled at the camera. It was from the New Orleans paper. "'Is this the man?' Mark looked without touching it. "'No. Who is it?' "'It's Barry Moldano. That's not the man who grabbed me. I guess he's got a lot of friends.' She placed the copy in the stack on the coffee table and patted him on the leg. "'What are you going to do?' he asked. "'Make a few calls. I'll talk to the administrator of the hospital and arrange security around Ricky's room.' "'You can't tell him about this guy, Reggie. They'll kill us. We can't tell anybody.' "'I won't. I'll explain to the hospital that there have been some threats. It's routine in criminal cases. They'll place a few guards on the ninth floor around the room.' I don't want to tell Mom, either. She's stressed out with Ricky, and she's taken pills to sleep and pills to do this and that, and I just don't think she can handle this right now. You're right. He was a tough little kid, raised on the streets and wise beyond his years. She admired his courage. You think Mom and Ricky are safe? Of course. These men are professionals, Mark. They won't do anything stupid. They'll lay low and listen. They may be bluffing. She did not sound sincere. No, they are not bluffing. I saw the knife, Reggie. They are here in Memphis for one reason, and that's to scare the hell out of me. And it's working. I ain't talking. Chapter 15 Foltrig yelled only once, then stormed from the office, making threats and slamming the door. Maxune and Truman were frustrated, but also embarrassed at his antics. As they left, Maxune rolled his eyes at Clint as if he wanted to apologize for this pompous loudmouth. Clint relished the moment, and when the dust settled, he walked to Reggie's office. Mark had pulled a chair to the window and sat watching it rain on the street and sidewalk below. Reggie was on the phone with the hospital administrator discussing security on the ninth floor. She covered the phone, and Clint whispered that they were gone. 
He left to get more cocoa for Mark, who never moved. Within minutes, Clint took a call from George Orge, and he buzzed Reggie on the intercom. She'd never met the U.S. attorney from Memphis, but was not surprised that he was now on the phone. She allowed him to hold for one full minute, then picked up the phone. Hello? Miss Love, this is... It's Reggie, okay, just Reggie, and you're George, right? She called everyone by their first name, even stuffy judges in their proper little courtrooms. Right, Reggie. This is George Ord. Roy Fultrig is in my office, and what a coincidence, he just left mine. Yeah, and that's why I'm calling. He didn't get a chance to talk to you and your client. Give him my apologies. My client has nothing to say to him. She was talking and looking at the back of Mark's head. If he were listening, she couldn't tell. He was frozen in the chair at the window. Reggie, I think it would be wise if you at least meet with Mr. Fultrig again. I have no desire to meet with Roy, nor does my client. She could picture Ord speaking gravely into the phone with Fultrick pacing around the office waving his arms. Well, this will not be the end of it, you know. Is that a threat, George? It's more of a promise. Fine. You tell Roy and his boys that if anyone attempts to contact my client or his family, I'll have their asses. Okay, George? I'll relay the message. It was really sort of funny. It was not, after all, his case. But Ord could not laugh. He returned the receiver to its place, smiled to himself, and said, She says she ain't talking, the kid ain't talking, and if you or anyone else contacts the kid or his family, she'll uh, have your asses, as she put it. Fultrig bit his lip and nodded at every word as if this was fine, because he could play hardball with the best of them. He had regained his composure and was already implementing Plan B. He paced around the office as if in deep thought. Macthune and Truman stood by the door like sentries, bored sentries. "'I want the kid followed, okay?' Fultrig finally snapped at Macthune. "'We're leaving for New Orleans, and I want you guys to tail him twenty-four hours a day. I want to know what he does, and more importantly, he needs to be protected from Maldana and his henchmen.' Macthune did not take orders from any U.S. attorney, and at this moment he was sick of Roy Fultrig, and the idea of using three or four overworked agents to follow an eleven-year-old kid was quite stupid. But it was not worth the fight. Fultrig had a hotline to Director Voyles in Washington, and Director Voyles wanted the body, and he wanted a conviction almost as bad as Fultrig. "'Okay,' he said. "'We'll get it done.' "'Paul Gronk is already here somewhere,' Fultrig said, as though he'd just heard fresh gossip. They knew the flight number and his time of arrival eleven hours ago. They had, however, managed to lose his trail once he left the Memphis airport. They had discussed it with Ord and Fultrig and a dozen other FBI agents for two hours this morning. At this very moment, no less than eight agents were trying to find Gronke in Memphis. "'We'll find him,' McThune said, "'and we'll watch the kid.' Why don't you get your ass back to New Orleans? I'll get the van ready, Truman said officially, as if the van was in fact Air Force One. Fultrick stopped pacing in front of Ord's desk. We're leaving, George. Sorry for the intrusion. I'll probably be back in a couple of days. What wonderful news, Ord thought. He stood and they shook hands. Any time, he said. If we can help, just call. I'll meet with Judge Lamont first thing in the morning. I'll let you know. Ord offered his hand again for one final shake. Fultrick took it and headed for the door. Watch out for these thugs, he advised Macthune. I don't think he's dumb enough to touch the kid, but who knows? Macthune opened the door and waved him through. Ord followed. Muldano's heard something, Fultrick continued, and they're just snooping around here. He was in the outer office where Wally Box and Thomas Fink waited. "'But keep an eye on them, okay, George? These guys are really dangerous, and follow the kid, too, and watch his lawyer, and thanks a million. I'll call you tomorrow. Where's the van, Wally?' After an hour of watching the sidewalks, sipping hot cocoa, and listening to his lawyer practice law, Mark was ready for a move. Reggie had called Diane and explained that Mark was in her office killing time and helping with the paperwork. Ricky was much better, sleeping again. He'd consumed half a gallon of ice cream while Greenway asked him a hundred questions. 
At eleven, Mark parked himself at Clint's desk and inspected the dictating equipment. Reggie had a client, a woman who desperately wanted a divorce and they needed to plot strategy for an hour. Clint typed away on long paper and grabbed the phone every five minutes. "'Had you become a secretary?' Mark asked, very bored with this candid view of the practice of law. Clint turned and smiled at him. "'It was an accident. Did you want to be a secretary when you were a kid?' "'No, I wanted to build swimming pools. What happened?' "'I don't know. I got messed up on drugs, almost flunked out of high school, then went to college, then went to law school. You have to go to law school to be a secretary in a law office?' "'No. I flunked out of law school, and Reggie gave me a job. It's fun most of the time. Where'd you meet Reggie? It's a long story. We were friends in law school. We've been friends for a long time. She'll probably tell you about it when you meet Mama Love. Mama who? Mama Love. She hasn't told you about Mama Love? No. Mama Love is Reggie's mother. They live together, and she loves to cook for the kids Reggie represents. She fixes inside-out ravioli and spinach lasagna and all sorts of delicious Italian food. Everyone loves it. After two days of doughnuts and green jello, the mention of thick, cheesy dishes cooked at someone's home was terribly inviting. When do you think I might meet Mama Love? I don't know. Reggie takes most of her clients home, especially the younger ones. Does she have any kids? Two, but they've grown and live away. Where's Mama Love live? In Midtown, not far from here. It's an old house she's owned for years. In fact, it's the house Reggie grew up in. The phone rang. Clint took the message and returned to his typewriter. Mark watched intently. How'd you learn to type so fast? The typing stopped, and he slowly turned and looked at Mark. He smiled and said, In high school. I had this teacher who was like a drill sergeant. We hated her, but she made us learn. Can you type? A little. I've had three years of computer at school. Clint pointed to his apple next to the typewriter. We've got all sorts of computers around here. Mark glanced at it, but was not impressed. Everyone had computers. So how'd you get to be a secretary? It wasn't planned. When Reggie finished law school, she didn't want to work for anybody, so she opened this office. It was about four years ago. She needed a secretary, and I volunteered. Have you seen a male secretary before? No. Didn't know men could be secretaries. How's the money? Clint chuckled at this. It's okay. If Reggie has a good month, then I have a good month. We're sort of like partners. Does she make a lot of money? Not really. She doesn't want a lot of money. A few years ago, she was married to a doctor, and they had a big house and lots of money. Everything went to hell, and she blames the money for most of it. She'll probably tell you about it. She's very honest about her life. She's a lawyer, and she doesn't want money? Unusual, isn't it? I'll say. I mean, I've seen a lot of lawyer shows on television, and all they do is talk about money, sex and money. The phone rang. It was a judge, and Clint got real nice and chatted with him for five minutes. He hung up and returned to his typing. As he reached full speed, Mark asked, "'Who's that woman in there?' Clint stopped, stared at the keys, and slowly turned around. His chair squeaked. He forced a quick smile. "'In there with Reggie?' "'Yeah.' "'Norma Thrash? What's her problem?' "'She's got a bunch of them, really. She's in the middle of a nasty divorce. Husband's a real jerk.' Mark was curious about how much Clint knew. "'Does he beat her up?' "'I don't think so,' he answered slowly. "'They have kids and all?' Two. I really can't say much about it. It's confidential, you know.' "'Yeah, I know. But you probably know everything, don't you? I mean, after all, you type it up.' "'I know most of what goes on, sure. But Reggie doesn't tell me everything.' For example, I have no idea what you told her. I assume it's pretty serious, but she'll keep it to herself. I've read the newspaper, I've seen the FBI and Mr. Foltrick, but I don't know the details. This was exactly what Mark wanted to hear. Do you know Robert Hackstraw? I call him Hack. He's a lawyer, isn't he? Yeah. 
He represented my mother in her divorce a couple of years ago. A real moron. You weren't impressed with her lawyer. I hated Hack. He treated us like dirt. We'd go to his office and wait for two hours. Then he'd talk to us for ten minutes and tell us he was in a big hurry, had to get to court because he was so important. I tried to convince Mom to get another lawyer, but she was too stressed out. Did it go to trial? Yeah. My ex-father thought he should get one kid, didn't really care which one. But he preferred Ricky because he knew I hated him. So he hired a lawyer, and for two days my mother and my father trashed each other in court. They tried to prove each other was unfit. Hack was a complete fool in the courtroom, but my ex-father's lawyer was even worse. The judge hated both lawyers and said he wasn't about to separate me and Ricky. I asked him if I could testify. He thought about it during lunch on the second day and decided he wanted to hear what I had to say. I'd asked Hack the same question, and he said something smart like I was too young and dumb to testify. But you testified. Yeah, for three hours. How'd it go? I was pretty good, really. I just told about the beatings, the bruises, the stitches. I told him how much I hated my father. The judge almost cried. And it worked? Yeah. My father wanted some visitation rights, and I spent a lot of time explaining to the judge that I had no desire to ever see the man again once the trial was over, and that Ricky was terrified of him. So the judge not only cut off all visitation, but also told my father to stay away from us. Have you seen him since? No, but I will one day. When I grow up, we'll catch him somewhere, me and Ricky, and we'll beat the living hell out of him, bruise for bruise, stitch for stitch. We talk about it all the time. Clint was no longer bored with this little conversation. He listened to every word. The kid was so casual about his plans for beating his father. You might go to jail. He didn't go to jail when he beat us. He didn't go to jail when he stripped my mother naked and threw her in the street with blood all over her. That's when I hit him with the baseball bat. You what? He was drinking one night at home, and we could tell he was about to get out of hand. We could always tell. Then he left to buy more beer. I ran down the street and borrowed an aluminum t-ball bat from Michael Moss. I hid it under my bed, and I remember praying for a good car wreck so he wouldn't come home. But it did. Mom was in their bedroom hoping he would just pass out, which he did all the time. Ricky and I stayed in our room waiting for the explosion. The phone rang again, and Clint quickly took the message and returned to the story. About an hour later, there was all this yelling and cussing. The trailer was shaking. We locked the door. Ricky hid under the bed, crying. Then Mom started yelling for me. I was seven years old, and Mom wanted me to rescue her. He was just beating the hell out of her, throwing her around, kicking her, ripping her shirt off, calling her a whore and a slut. I didn't even know what those words meant. I walked to the kitchen. I guess I was too scared to move. He saw me and threw a beer can at me. She tried to run outside, but he caught her and tore her pants off. God, he was hitting her so hard. Then he ripped off her underwear. Her lip was busted and there was blood everywhere. He threw her outside completely naked and dragged her into the street, where, of course, the neighbors were watching. Then he laughed at her and left her lying there. It was horrible. Clint leaned forward and hung on every word. Mark was speaking in a monotone, showing absolutely no emotion. When he came back to the trailer, the door was, of course, open, and I was waiting. I pulled a kitchen chair beside the door, and I damn near took his head off with a baseball bat, a perfect shot to his nose. I was crying and scared to death, but I'll always remember the sound of the bat crunching his face. He fell on the sofa, and I hit him once in the stomach. I was trying to land a good one on the crotch because I figured that would hurt the most. Know what I mean? I was swinging like crazy. I hit him once more on the ear, and that was all she wrote. What happened? Clint snapped. He got up, slapped me in the face, knocked me down, cussed me, and started kicking me. I remember being so scared I couldn't fight. His face was a bloody mess. He smelled awful. He was growling and slapping and tearing my clothes off. 
I started kicking like crazy when it pulled up my underwear, but he got them off and threw me outside. Not a bit of clothing. I guess he wanted me in the street with my mother, but about that time she made it to the door and fell on me. He told it all so calmly, as if he'd done it a hundred times and the script was memorized. No emotion, just the facts in short, clipped sentences. He would look at the desk, then stare at the door without missing a word. What happened? Clint asked, almost out of breath. One of the neighbors had called the cops. I mean, you can hear everything in the next trailer, so our neighbors had suffered through this with us. And that was not the first fight, not by a long shot. I remember seeing blue lights in the street, and he disappeared somewhere inside the trailer. Me and Mom got up real quick and ran inside and got dressed. Some of the neighbors saw him in naked, though. We tried to wash the blood off before the cops came in. My father had settled down quite a bit and was suddenly real friendly with the cops. Me and Mom waited in the kitchen. His nose was the size of a football, and the cops were more concerned with his face than with me and Mom. He called one of the cops Frankie as if they were buddies. There were two cops, and they got everybody separated. Frankie took him to the bedroom to cool him off. The other cop sat with Mom at the kitchen table. This is what they always did. I went to our room and got Ricky out from under the bed. Mom told me later that he got real chummy with the cops, said it was just a family fight, nothing serious, and that most of it was my fault because I for no reason had attacked him with a baseball bat. The cops referred to it as just another domestic disturbance, same thing they always said. No charges were filed. They took him to the hospital where he spent the night. I had to wear this ugly white mask for a while. What did it do to you? He didn't drink for a long time after that. He apologized to us, promised it would never happen again. Sometimes he was okay when he wasn't drinking. But then it got worse. More beatings and all. Mom finally filed for divorce. And he tried to get custody? Yeah. He lied in court. And he was doing a pretty good job of it. He didn't know I was going to testify, so he denied a bunch of it and said Mom was lying about the rest. He was real cocky and cool in court, and our dumbass lawyer couldn't do anything with him. But when I testified and told about the baseball bat and getting my clothes ripped off, that's when the judge had tears in his eyes. He got real mad at my ex-father, accused him of lying, said he ought to throw his sorry ass in jail for lying. I told him I thought that's exactly what he should do. He paused for a second. The sentences were a bit slower, and Mark was losing steam. Clint was still mesmerized. Of course, Hack took full credit for another brilliant courtroom victory. Then he threatened to sue Mom if she didn't pay him. She had a bunch of bills, and he was calling twice a week wanting the rest of his fee, so she had to file for bankruptcy. Then she lost her job. So... You've been through a divorce and then a bankruptcy. Yeah, the bankruptcy lawyer was a real bozo, too. But you like Reggie. Yeah, Reggie's cool. That's good to hear. The phone rang and Clint picked it up. A lawyer from juvenile court wanted some information on a client and the conversation dragged on. Mark left to find the hot cocoa. He passed the conference room with pretty books covering the walls. He found the tiny kitchen next to the restroom. There was a sprite in the refrigerator, and he unscrewed the top. Clint was amazed by his story, he could tell. He had left out many of the details, but it was all true. He was proud of it, in a way, proud of defending his mother, and the story always amazed people. Then the tough little kid with the baseball bat remembered the knife attack in the elevator, and the folded photograph of the poor fatherless family. He thought of his mother at the hospital all alone and unprotected. He was suddenly scared again. He tried to open a package of saltines, but his hands shook and the plastic wouldn't open. The shaking got worse and he couldn't stop it. He slumped to the floor and spilled the Sprite. Chapter 16 the light rain had stopped in time for the rush of secretaries who moved in hurried groups of three and four along the damp sidewalks in pursuit of lunch. The sky was gray and the streets were wet. 
Clouds of mist boiled and hissed behind each passing car along Third Street. Reggie and her client turned on Madison. Her briefcase was in her left hand, and with her right she held his hand and guided him through the crowd. She had places to go and walked quickly. From a generic white Ford van parked almost directly in front of the Steric building, Jack Nance watched and radioed ahead. When they turned on Madison and were lost from sight, he listened. Within minutes, Cal Sis and his partner had them and was watching as they headed for the hospital as expected. Five minutes later, they were in the hospital. Nance locked the van, and Jay walked across third. He entered the Steric building, rode the elevator to the second floor, and gently turned the knob of the door with Reggie Love Lawyer on it. It was unlocked, which was a pleasant surprise. Eleven minutes had passed since noon. Virtually every lawyer with a nickel-and-dime solo practice in this city broke for lunch and locked the office. He opened the door and stepped inside as a hideous buzzer went off above his head and announced his arrival. Damn it, he'd hoped to enter through a locked door, something he was very proficient at, and dig through files without being interrupted. It was easy work. Most of these small outfits thought nothing of security. The big firms were a different story, although in the off-hours Nance could enter any one of a thousand law offices in Memphis and find whatever he wanted. He'd done it at least a dozen times. There were two things ham and egg lawyers did not have at their offices, cash and security devices. They locked their doors, and that was it. A young man appeared from the back and said, Yes, can I help you? Yeah, Nance said without a smile, all business, rough day. I'm with the Times Picayune, you know, the paper in New Orleans, looking for Reggie Love. Clint stopped ten feet away. She's not here. When might she return? Don't know. You have any identification? Nance was headed for the door. You mean like little white cards you lawyers throw on the sidewalks? No, pal, I don't carry business cards. I'm a reporter. Fine. What's your name? Arnie Carpentier. Tell her I'll catch her later. He opened the door, the buzzer worked again, and he was gone. Not a productive visit, but he'd met Clint and seen the front room and reception area. The next visit would take longer. The ride to the ninth floor was uneventful. Reggie held his hand, which normally would have irritated him, but was rather comforting under the circumstances. He studied his feet as they ascended. He was afraid to look up, afraid of more strangers. He squeezed her hand. They spilled into the lobby on the ninth floor and had taken no more than ten steps before three people rushed them from the direction of the waiting area. "'Miss Love! Miss Love!' one of them yelled. Reggie, at first, was startled, but gripped Mark's hand tighter and kept walking. One had a microphone, one a notepad, and one a camera. The one with the notepad said, "'Miss Love, just a few quick questions.' They walked faster toward the nurse's station. "'No comment.' Is it true your client is refusing to cooperate with the FBI and the police? No comment, she said, looking ahead. They followed like bloodhounds. She leaned quickly to Mark and said, Don't look at them and don't say a word. Is it true the U.S. attorney from New Orleans was in your office this morning? No comment. Doctors, nurses, patients, everybody vacated the center of the hallway as Reggie and her famous client raced along, followed by the yelping dogs. Did your client talk to Jerome Clifford before he died? She squeezed his hand harder and walked faster. No comment. As they neared the end of the hall, the clown with the camera suddenly dashed in front of them, knelt low as he backpedaled and managed to get a shot before he landed on his ass. The nurses laughed. A security guard stepped forward at the nurse's station and raised his hands at the yelpers. They had met him before. As Reggie and Mark rounded a bend in the hall, one called out, "'Is it true your client knows where boy Ed is buried?' There was a slight hesitation in her step. The shoulders jumped and the back arched. Then she was over it, and she and her client were gone. Two overweight security guards in uniform sat in folding chairs by Ricky's door. They had pistols on their hips, and Mark noticed the pistols before anything else. One had a newspaper, which he promptly lowered as they approached. The other stood to greet them. "'Can I help you?' he asked Reggie. "'Yes, I'm the attorney for the family, and this is Mark Sway, the patient's brother.' She spoke in a professional whisper, as if she had a right to be there and they didn't, 
so be quick with the questions because she had things to do. Dr. Greenway is expecting us, she said as she walked to the door and knocked. Mark stood behind her, staring at the pistol, which was remarkably similar to the one poor Romy had used. The security guard returned to his seat, and his partner returned to his paper. Greenway opened the door and stepped outside, followed by Diane, who'd been crying. She hugged Mark and placed her arm on his shoulder. "'He's asleep,' Greenway said quietly to Reggie and Mark. "'Doing much better, but very tired.' "'He was asking about you,' Diane whispered to Mark. He looked at the moist eyes and asked, "'What's the matter, Mom?' "'Nothing. We'll talk about it later.' "'What's happened?' Diane looked at Greenway, then at Reggie, then at Mark. "'It's nothing,' she said. "'Your mother was fired this morning, Mark,' Greenway said. He looked at Reggie. "'These people sent a letter by courier informing her she'd been fired. Can you believe it? Had it delivered to the nurses here on the ninth floor, and one of them delivered it about an hour ago.' "'Let me see the letter,' Reggie said. Diane pulled it from a pocket. Reggie unfolded it and read slowly. Diane hugged Mark and said, "'It'll be all right, Mark. We've managed before. I'll find another job.' Mark bit his lip and wanted to cry. "'Can I keep this?' Reggie said as she stuffed it in her briefcase. Diane nodded yes. Greenway studied his watch as if he couldn't determine the correct time. "'I'm going to grab a quick sandwich.' And I'll be back here in twenty minutes. I want to spend a couple of hours with Ricky and Mark alone. Reggie glanced at her watch. I'll be back around four. There are reporters here, and I want you to ignore them. She was talking to all three of them. Yeah, just say no comment, no comment, Mark added helpfully. It's really fun. Diane missed the fun. What do they want? Everything. They've seen the newspaper. The rumors are rampant. They smell a story, and they'll do anything to get information. I saw a television van on the street, and I suspect they're somewhere close by. I think it's best if you stay here with Mark. Okay, Diane said. Where's a telephone? Reggie asked. Greenway pointed in the direction of the nurse's station. Come on, I'll show you. I'll see you guys at four, okay? She said to Diane and Mark. Remember not a word to anyone and stay close to this room. She and Greenway disappeared around the bend. The security guards were half asleep. Mark and his mother entered the dark room and sat on the bed. A stale doughnut caught his attention, and he devoured it in four bites. Reggie called her office, and Clint answered. "'Do you remember that lawsuit we filed last year on behalf of Penny Petula? she asked softly, looking around for the bloodhounds. "'It was sex discrimination, wrongful discharge, harassment, the works. I think we threw in everything. Circuit court. Yeah, that's it. Pull the file. Change the name from Penny Petula to Diane Sway. The defendant will be Arc Lawn Fixtures. I want you to name the president individually. His name is Chester Tanfield. Yeah, make him a defendant, too, and sue for wrongful discharge, labor violations, sexual harassment. Throw in an equal rights charge and ask for a million or two in damages. Do it now and quickly. Prepare a summons and a check for the filing fee. Run over to the courthouse and file it. I'll be there in about thirty minutes to pick it up, so hurry. I'll personally deliver it to Mr. Tanfield. She hung up and thanked the nearest nurse. The reporters were loitering near the soft drink machine, but she was through the door to the stairwell before they saw her. Arc Lawn Fixtures was a series of metal-connected buildings on a street of such structures in a minimum-wage industrial park near the airport. The front building was a faded orange in color, and expansion had taken place in every direction except toward the street. The newer additions were of the same general architecture, but with different shades of orange. Trucks waited near a loading dock in the rear, and enclosed chain-link fence protected rolls of steel and aluminum. Reggie parked near the front in a space reserved for visitors. She held her briefcase and opened the door. A chesty woman with black hair and a long cigarette ignored her and listened to the phone stuck in her ear. Reggie stood before her, waiting impatiently. The room was dusty, dirty, and clouded with blue cigarette smoke. Matted pictures of beagles adorned the walls. Half the fluorescent lights were out. "'May I help you?' the receptionist asked as she lowered the phone. "'I need to see Chester Tanfield.' 
He's in a meeting. I know, he's a very busy man, but I have something for him. The receptionist placed the phone on the desk. I see. And what might that be? It's really none of your business. I need to see Chester Tanfield. It's urgent. This really pissed her off. The nameplate declared her to be Louise Chenault. I don't care how urgent it is, ma'am. You can't just barge in here and demand to see the president of this company. This company is a sweatshop, and I've just sued it for two million bucks, and I've also sued Chester Boy for a couple of million, and I'm telling you to find his sorry ass and get him out here immediately. Louise jumped to her feet and backed away from the desk. Are you some kind of lawyer? Reggie pulled the lawsuit and the summons from the briefcase. She looked at it, ignored Louise, and said, I am indeed a lawyer, and I need to serve these papers on Chester. Now find him. If he's not here in five minutes, I'll amend it and ask for five million in damages. Louise bolted from the room and ran through a set of double doors. Reggie waited a second, then followed. She walked through a room filled with tacky, cramped cubicles. Cigarette smoke seemed to ooze from every opening. The carpet was ancient shag and badly worn. She caught a glimpse of a Louise's round rump darting into a door at the right, and she followed. Chester Tanfield was in the process of standing behind his desk when Reggie barged in. Louise was speechless. "'You can leave now,' Reggie said rudely. "'I'm Reggie Love, attorney at law,' she said, glaring at Chester. "'Chester Tanfield,' he said, without offering a hand. She wouldn't have taken it. "'This is a bit rude, Miss Love. The name is Reggie, okay, Chester? Tell Louise to leave.' He nodded, and Louise gladly left, closing the door behind her. "'What do you want?' he snapped. He was wiry and gaunt around fifty, with a spotted face and puffy eyes partially hidden behind wire-rimmed glasses. A drinking problem, she thought. The clothes were Sears or Pennies. His neck was turning dark red. She threw the lawsuit and the summons on his desk. "'I'm serving you with this lawsuit.' He smirked at it, a man unafraid of lawyers and their games. For what? I represent Diane Sway. You fired her this morning, and we're suing you this afternoon. How's that for swift justice? Chester's eyes narrowed, and he looked at the lawsuit again. You're kidding. You're a fool if you think I'm kidding. It's all right there, Chester. Wrongful discharge, sexual harassment, the works, a couple of million in damages. I file these things all the time. I must say, however, that this is one of the best I've seen. This poor woman has been at the hospital for two days with her son. Her doctor says she cannot leave his bedside. In fact, he's called here and explained her situation. But no, you assholes fire her for missing work. I can't wait to explain this to a jury. It sometimes took Chester's lawyer two days to return a phone call, and this woman, Diane Sway, files a full-blown lawsuit within hours of being terminated. He slowly picked up the papers and studied the front page. "'I'm named personally?' he asked, as if his feelings were hurt. "'You fired her, Chester. Don't worry, though. When the jury returns a verdict against you individually, you can simply file for bankruptcy.' Chester pulled his chair under him and carefully sat down. "'Please, sit,' he said, waving at a chair. "'No, thanks. Who's your attorney?' "'Uh, geez, uh, Finlay and Baker.' But just wait a minute. L let me think about this. He flipped the page and scanned the pleadings. Sexual harassment? Yeah, that's a fertile field these days. Seems as though one of your supervisors has put the move on my client, always suggesting things they might do in the restroom during lunch, always telling dirty jokes, lots of crude talk. It'll all come out of the trial. Who should I call it, Finley and Baker? Just wait a minute. He flipped the pages, then laid them on the desk. She stood next to his desk, glaring down. He rubbed his temples. I don't need this. Now that I did my client. What does she want? A little dignity. You run a sweatshop here. You prey on single working mothers who can barely feed their children on what you pay. They cannot afford to complain. He was rubbing his eyes now. Skip the lecture, lady. I just don't need this. There could, well, there might be some trouble at the top. I couldn't care less about you and your troubles, Chester. A copy of this lawsuit will be hand-delivered to the Memphis Press this afternoon, and I'm sure it'll run tomorrow. The Sways are getting more than their share of ink these days. What does she want? he asked again. Are you trying to bargain? 
maybe. I don't think you can win this case, Miss Love, but I don't need the headache. It'll be more than a headache, I promise. She makes nine hundred dollars a month and takes home around six fifty. That's eleven thousand bucks a year. And I promise your legal costs on this lawsuit will run five times that much. I'll obtain access to your personnel records. I'll take the depositions of other female employees. I'll open up your financial books. I'll subpoena all your records. And if I see anything the least bit improper, I'll notify the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, the National Labor Relations Board, the IRS, OSHA, and anybody else who might be interested. I'll make you lose sleep, Chester. You'll wish a thousand times you hadn't fired my client. He slapped the table with both palms. What does she want, damn it? Reggie picked up her briefcase and walked to the door. She wants her job. A raise would be nice, say from six bucks an hour to nine, if you can spare it. And if you can't, then do it anyway. Transfer her to another section away from the dirty supervisor. Chester listened carefully. This was not too bad. She'll be in the hospital for a few weeks. She has bills, so I want the payroll checks to keep coming. In fact, Chester, I want the payroll checks delivered to the hospital, just like you clowns delivered her termination letter this morning. Every Friday I want the check delivered. Okay? He slowly nodded yes. You have thirty days to answer the lawsuit. If you behave and do as I say, I'll dismiss it on the thirtieth day. You have my word. You don't have to tell your lawyers about it. Is it a deal? Deal. Reggie opened the door. Oh, and send some flowers. Room 943. A card would be nice. In fact, send some fresh flowers every week. Okay, Chester? He was still nodding. She slammed the door and left the grungy corporate offices of Arc Lawn Fixtures. Mark and Ricky sat on the end of the fold-away bed and looked up into the bearded and intense face of Dr. Greenway less than two feet away. Ricky wore a pair of Mark's hand-me-down pajamas with a blanket draped over his shoulders. He was cold, as usual, and scared and uncertain about this first venture out of his bed, even though it was inches away. And he preferred his mother to be present, but the doctor had gently insisted on talking to the boys by themselves. Greenway had spent almost twelve hours now trying to win Ricky's confidence. He sat close to his big brother, who was bored with this little chat before it started. The shades were pulled, the lights were dim, the room was dark, except for a small lamp on a table by the bathroom. Greenway leaned forward with his elbows on his knees. Now, Ricky, I would like to talk about the other day when you and Mark went to the woods for a smoke, okay? This frightened Ricky. How did Greenway know they were smoking? Mark leaned over an inch or two and said, It's okay, Ricky. I've already told him about it. Mom's not mad at us. Do you remember going for a smoke? Greenway asked. Slowly, he nodded his head yes. Yes, sir. Why don't you tell me what you remember about you and Mark in the woods smoking a cigarette? He pulled the blanket tighter around him and knotted it with his hands at his stomach. I'm really cold, he muttered, his teeth chattering. Ricky, the temperature's almost seventy-eight degrees in here, and you've got the blanket and wool pajamas. Try and think about being warm, okay? He tried, but it didn't help. Mark gently placed his arm around Ricky's shoulder, and this seemed to help. Do you remember smoking a cigarette? I think so. Uh-huh. Mark glanced up at Greenway, then at Ricky. Okay. Do you remember seeing the big black car when it pulled up in the grass? Ricky suddenly stopped shaking and stared at the floor. He mumbled the word yes, and that would be his last word for twenty-four hours. And what did the big black car do when you first saw it? The mention of the cigarette had scared him, but the image of the black car and the fear it brought were simply too much. He bent over at the waist and placed his head on Mark's knee. His eyes were shut tightly, and he began sobbing, but with no tears. Mark rubbed his hair and repeated, It's okay, Ricky, it's okay. We need to talk about it. Greenway was unmoved. He crossed his bony legs and scratched his beard. 
He had expected this, and had warned Mark and Diane that this first little session would not be productive. But it was very important. "'Ricky, listen to me,' he said in a childlike voice. "'Ricky, it's okay. I just want to talk to you. Okay, Ricky?' But Ricky had had enough therapy for one day. He began to curl under the blanket, and Mark knew the thumb could not be far behind. Greenway nodded at him as if all was well. He stood, carefully lifted Ricky, and placed him in the bed. Chapter 17 Wally Box stopped the van in heavy traffic on Camp Street and ignored the horns and fingers as his boss and Fink and the FBI agents made a quick exit onto the sidewalk in front of the Federal Building. Foltrick walked importantly up the steps with his entourage behind. In the lobby, a couple of bored reporters recognized him and began asking questions, but he was all business and had nothing but smiles and no comments. He entered the offices of the United States Attorney for the Southern District of Louisiana, and the secretaries sprang to life. His assigned space in the building was a vast suite of small offices connected by hallways and large open areas where the clerical staff performed, and smaller rooms where cubicles allowed some privacy for law clerks and paralegals. In all, forty-seven assistant U.S. attorneys labored here under the commands of Reverend Roy, Another thirty-eight underlings plowed through the drudgery and paperwork and boring research and tedious attention to mindless details, all in an effort to protect the legal interests of Roy's client, the United States of America. The largest office, of course, belonged to Foltrig, and it was richly decorated with heavy wood and deep leather, whereas most lawyers allow themselves only one ego wall with pictures and plaques and awards and certificates for Rotary Club memberships, Roy had covered no less than three of his with framed photographs and yellow fill-in-the-blank attendance diplomas from a hundred judicial conferences. He threw his jacket on the burgundy leather sofa and headed directly for the main library where a meeting awaited him. He'd called six times during the five-hour trip from Memphis, there had been three faxes. Six assistants were waiting around a thirty-foot oak conference table covered with open law books and countless legal pads. All jackets were off and all sleeves rolled up. He said hello to the group and took a chair at the center of the table. They each had a copy of a summarization of the FBI's findings in Memphis. The note, the fingerprints, the gun, everything. There was nothing new Foltrig or Fink could tell them, except that Gronky was in Memphis and this was irrelevant to this group. "'What do you have, Bobby?' Foltrig asked dramatically, as if the future of the American legal system rested upon Bobby and whatever he'd uncovered in his research. Bobby was the dean of the assistants, a thirty-two-year veteran who hated courtrooms but loved libraries. In times of crisis, when answers were needed for complex questions, they all turned to Bobby. He rubbed his thick gray hair and adjusted his black-rimmed glasses six months until retirement, when he would be through with the likes of Roy Fultrick. He'd seen a dozen of them come and go, most never heard from again. "'Well, I think we've narrowed it down,' he said, and most of them smiled. He began every report with the same line. To Bobby, legal research was a game of clearing away the piles of debris heaped upon even the simplest of issues, and narrowing the focus to that which is quickly grasped by judges and juries. Everything got narrowed down when Bobby handled the research. There are two avenues, neither very attractive, but one or both might work. First, I suggest the juvenile court approach in Memphis. Under the Tennessee Youth Code, a petition can be filed with the juvenile court alleging certain misconduct by the child. There are various categories of wrongdoing, and the petition must classify the child either as a delinquent or a child in need of supervision. A hearing is held, the juvenile court judge hears the proof and makes a determination as to what happens to the child. The same can be done for abused or neglected children. Same procedure, same court. Who can file the petition? Foltrick asked. Well, the statute is very broad, and I think it's a terrible flaw in the law, but it plainly says a petition can be filed by, and I quote, any interested party, end of quote. Can that be us? Maybe. It depends on what we allege in our petition. And here's the sticky part. We must allege the kid has done or is doing something wrong, violating the law in some way. 
and the only violation even remotely touching this kid's behavior is, of course, obstruction of justice. So we must allege things we're not sure of, such as the kid's knowledge of where the body is. This could be tricky since we're not certain. The kid knows where the body is, Fultrig said flatly. Fink studied some notes and pretended not to hear, but the other six repeated the words to themselves. Did Fultrig know things he hadn't yet told them? There was a pause as this apparent statement of fact settled in around the table. "'Have you told us everything?' Bobby asked, glancing at his cohorts. "'Yes,' Fultrig replied. "'But I'm telling you the kid knows. It's my gut feeling.' Typical Fultrig, creating facts with his guts and expecting those under him to follow on faith. Bobby continued. A juvenile court summons is served on the child's mother, and a hearing is held within seven days. The child must have a lawyer, and I understand one has already been obtained. The child has a right to be at the hearing, and may testify if he so chooses. Bobby wrote something on his legal pad. Frankly, this is the quickest way to get the kid to talk. What if he refuses to talk on the witness stand? Very good question, Bobby said, like a professor pandering a first-year law student. It is completely discretionary with the judge. If we put on a good case and convince the judge the kid knows something, he has the authority to order the kid to talk. If the kid refuses, he may be in contempt of court. Let's say he's in contempt. What happens then? Difficult to say at this point. He's only eleven years old. But the judge could, as a last resort, incarcerate the child in a youth court facility until he purges himself of contempt. In other words until it talks. It was so easy to spoon-feed Fultrick. That is correct. Mind you, this would be the most drastic course the judge could take. We have yet to find any precedent for the incarceration of an eleven-year-old child for contempt of court. We haven't checked all fifty states, but we've covered most of them. It won't go that far, Fultrick predicted calmly. If we file a petition as an interested party, serve the kid's mother with papers, drag his little buddy into court with his lawyer in tow, then I think he'll be so scared he'll tell what he knows. What about you, Thomas? Eh, yeah, I think it'll work. What if it doesn't? What's the downside? There's little risk, Bobby explained. All juvenile court proceedings are closed. We can even ask that the petition be kept under lock and key. If it's dismissed initially for lack of standing or whatever, no one will know it. If we proceed to the hearing, and A, the kid talks but doesn't know anything, or B, the judge refuses to make him talk, then we haven't lost anything. And C, if the kid talks out of fear or under threat of contempt, then we've gotten what we wanted, assuming the kid knows about Boyette. He knows, Fultrake said. The plan would not be so attractive if the proceedings were made public. We would look weak and desperate if we lost. It could, in my opinion, seriously undermine our chances at trial here in New Orleans if we try this and fail, and if it's in some way publicized. The door opened, and Wally Box, fresh from having successfully parked the van, entered and seemed irritated that they'd proceeded without him. He sat next to Fultrick. But you're certain it can be done in private, Fink gasped. That's what the law says. I don't know how they apply it in Memphis, but the confidentiality is explicit in the code sections. There are even penalties for disclosure. We'll need local counsel, someone in Ord's office, Fultrick said to Fink, as if the decision had already been made. Then he turned to the group. I like the sound of this. Right now the kid and his lawyer are probably thinking it's all over. This will be a wake-up call. They'll know we're serious. They'll know they're headed for court. We'll make it plain to his lawyer that we'll not rest until we have the truth from the kid. I like this. Little downside risk. It'll take place three hundred miles from here, away from these morons with cameras we have around here. If we try it and fail, no big deal. No one will know. I like the idea of no cameras and no reporters. He paused as if deep in thought, the field marshal surveying the plains, deciding where to send his tanks. To everyone except Box and Fultrick, the humor in this was delicious. 
The idea of the reverend plotting strategies that did not include cameras was unheard of. He, of course, did not realize it. He bit his lip and nodded his head. Yes, yes, this was the best course. This would work. Bobby cleared his throat. There is one other possible approach, and I don't like it, but it's worth mentioning. A real long shot. If you assume the kid knows, he knows, thank you. Assuming this, and assuming he has confided in his lawyer, there is the possibility of a federal indictment against her for obstruction of justice. I don't have to tell you the difficulty in Pearson, the attorney-client privilege. It's virtually impossible. The indictment would, of course, be used to sort of scare her into cutting some deal. I don't know, as I said, a real long shot. Fultrig chewed on this for a second, but his mind was still churning over the first plan, and it simply couldn't digest the second. A conviction might be difficult, Fink said. Yep, Bobby agreed. But a conviction would not be the goal. She would be indicted here, a long way from home, and I think it would be quite intimidating. Lots of bad press. Couldn't keep this one quiet, you know. She'd be forced to hire a lawyer. We could string it out for months, you know, the works. You might even consider obtaining the indictment, keeping it sealed, breaking the news to her, and offering some deal in return for its dismissal. Just a thought. I like it, Fultrig said, to no one's surprise. It had the stench of the government's jackboot, and these strategies always appealed to him. And we can always dismiss the indictment at a time we want. Ah, yes, the Roy Fultrig special. Get the indictment, hold the press conference, beat the defendant to the ground with all sorts of threats, cut the deal, then quietly dismiss the indictment a year later. He'd done it a hundred times in seven years. He'd also eaten a few of his specials when the defendant and or his lawyer refused to deal and insisted on a trial. When this happened, Fultrig was always too busy with more important prosecutions, and the file was thrown at one of the younger assistants, who invariably got his ass kicked. Invariably, Fultrig placed the blame squarely on the assistant. He'd even fired one for losing the trial brought about by a Roy Fultrig special. That's plan B. Okay, on hold for right now, he said, very much in control. Plan A is to file a petition in juvenile court first thing tomorrow morning. How long will it take to prepare it? An hour, answered Tank Mozingo, a burly assistant with the ponderous name of Thurston Alomar Mozingo, thus known simply as Tank. The petition is set out in the code. We simply add the allegations and fill in the blanks. Get it done, he turned to Fink. Thomas, you'll handle this. Get on the phone to Ord and ask him to help us. Fly to Memphis tonight. I want the petition filed first thing in the morning after you talk to the judge. Tell him how urgent this is. Papers shuffled around the table as the research group began cleaning its mess. Their work was over. Fink took notes as Box darted for a legal pad. Fultrig spewed forth instructions like King Solomon dictating to his scribes. Ask the judge for an expedited hearing. Explain how much pressure is behind this. Ask for complete confidentiality, including the closing of the petition and all other pleadings. Stress this, you understand. I'll be sitting by the phone in case I'm needed. Bobby was buttoning his cuffs. Look, Roy, there's something else we need to mention. What is it? We're playing hardball with this kid. Let's not forget the danger he's in. Muldano is desperate. There are reporters everywhere. A leak here, and a leak there, and the mob could silence the kid before it talks. There's a lot at stake. Roy flashed a confident smile. I know that, Bobby. In fact, Muldano's already sent his boys to Memphis. The FBI up there is tracking them, and they're also watching the boy. Personally, I don't think Muldano's stupid enough to try something, but we're not taking chances. Roy stood and smiled around the room. Good work, man. I appreciate it. They mumbled their thanks and left the library. On the fourth floor of the Radisson Hotel in downtown Memphis, two blocks from the Sterrick Building and five blocks from St. Peter's, Paul Grunke played a monotonous game of gin rummy with Mac Bono, a Moldano grunt from New Orleans. 
A heavily marked score sheet was on the floor under the table, abandoned. They had been playing for a dollar a game, but now no one cared. Gronky's shoes were on the bed. His shirt was unbuttoned. Heavy cigarette smoke clung to the ceiling. They were drinking bottled water because it was not yet five, but almost, and when the magic hour hit they'd call room service. Gronky checked his watch. He looked through the window at the buildings across Union Avenue. He played a card. Gronky was a childhood friend of Moldano's, a most trusted partner in many of his dealings. He owned a few bars and a tourist t-shirt shop in the quarter. He'd broken his share of legs and had helped the blade to do the same. He did not know where Boyd Boyette was buried, and he wasn't about to ask, but if he pressed hard, his friend would probably tell him. They were very close. Gronky was in Memphis because the blade had called him and he was bored as hell sitting in this hotel room playing cards with his shoes off, drinking water and eating sandwiches, smoking camels and waiting on the next move by an eleven-year-old kid. Across the double beds an open door led to the next room. It, too, had two beds and a cloud of smoke whirling around the ceiling vents. Jack Nance stood in the window watching the rush-hour traffic leave downtown. A radio and a cellular phone stood ready on a nearby table. Any minute Cal Sisson would call from the hospital with the latest about Mark Sway. A thick briefcase was open on one bed, and Nance, in his boredom, had spent most of the afternoon playing with his bugging devices. He had a plan to drop a bug in room 943. He had seen the lawyer's office, absent of special locks on the door, absent of cameras overhead, absent of any security devices. Typical lawyer. Wiring it would be easy. Cal Sisson had visited the doctor's office and found pretty much the same, a receptionist at a front desk, sofas and chairs for the patients to wait for their shrink, a couple of drab offices down a hall, no special security. The client, this clown who liked to be called the Blade, had approved the wiring of the telephones in both the doctor's and lawyer's office. He also wanted files copied. Easy work. He also wanted a bug planted in Ricky's room. Easy work, too but the difficult part was receiving the transmission once the bug was in place. Nance was working on this. As far as Nance was concerned, it was simply a surveillance job, nothing more or less. The client was paying top dollar in cash. If he wanted a child followed, it was easy. If he wanted to eavesdrop, no problem, as long as he was paying. But Nance had read the newspapers, and he had heard the whispers in the room next door. There was more here than simple surveillance. Broken legs and arms were not being discussed over gin rummy. These guys were deadly, and Gronky had already mentioned calling New Orleans for more help. Cal Sisson was ready to bolt. He was fresh off probation, and another conviction would send him back for decades. A conviction for conspiracy to commit murder would send him away for life. Nance had convinced him to hold tight for one more day. The cellular phone rang. It was Sisson. The lawyer had just arrived at the hospital. Mark sways in room 943 with his mother and lawyer. Nance placed the phone on the table and walked into the other room. Who was it? Gronky asked with a camel in his mouth. Cal, kid still at the hospital, now with his mother and his lawyer. Where's the doctor? He left an hour ago. Nance walked to the dresser and poured a glass of water. Any sign of the feds? Grunky grunted. Yeah, same two are hanging around the hospital, doing the same thing we are, I guess. The hospital's keeping two security guards by the door and another one close by. You think the kid told them about meeting me this morning? Grunky asked for the hundredth time of the day. He told someone. Why else would they suddenly surround his room with security guards? Yeah, but the security guards are not fibbies, are they? If he told the fibbies, then they'd be sitting in the hall, don't you think? Yeah. This conversation had been repeated throughout the day. Who did the kid tell? Why were there suddenly guards by the door? And on and on. Gronky couldn't get enough of it. Despite his arrogance and street punk posture, he seemed to be a man of patience. Nance figured it went with the territory. Killers had to be cold blooded and patient. Chapter 18 they left the hospital in her Mazda RX-7. 
his first ride in a sports car. The seats were leather, but the floor was dirty. The car was not new, but it was cool, with a stick shift that she worked like a veteran race car driver. She said she liked to drive fast, which was fine with Mark. They darted through traffic as they left downtown and headed east. It was almost dark. The radio was on, but barely audible, some FM station specializing in easy listening. Ricky was awake when they left. He was staring at cartoons, but saying little. A sad little tray of hospital food sat on the table, untouched by either Ricky or Diane. Mark had not seen his mother eat three bites in two days. He felt sorry for her, sitting there on the bed, staring at Ricky, worrying herself to death. The news from Reggie about the job and the raise had made her smile. Then it made her cry. Mark was sick of the crying and the cold peas and the dark, cramped room, and he felt guilty for leaving, but was delighted to be here in this sports car, headed, he hoped, for a plate of hot, heavy food with warm bread. Clint had mentioned inside-out ravioli and spinach lasagna, and for some reason visions of these rich, meaty dishes had stuck in his mind. Maybe there would be a cake and some cookies. But if Mama Love served green jello, he might throw it at her. He thought of these things as Reggie thought of being trailed. Her eyes went from the traffic to the mirror and back again. She drove much too fast, zipping between cars and changing lanes, which didn't bother Mark one bit. "'You think Mom and Ricky are safe?' he asked, watching the cars in front. "'Yes. Don't worry about them. The hospital promised to keep guards at the door.' She had talked to George Ord, her new pal, and explained her concern about the safety of the Sway family. She did not mention any specific threats, though Ord had asked. The family was getting unwanted attention, she'd explained, lots of rumors and gossip, most of it generated by a frustrated media. Ord had talked to Macthune, then called her back and said the FBI would stay close to the room but out of sight. She thanked him. Ord and Macthune were amused by it. The FBI already had people in the hospital. Now they had been invited. She suddenly turned to the right at an intersection, and the tires squealed. Mark chuckled, and she laughed as though it was all fun, but her stomach was flipping. They were on a smaller street with old homes and large oaks. "'This is my neighborhood,' she said. It was certainly nicer than his. They turned again to another narrower street, where the houses were smaller, but still two and three stories tall, with deep lawns and manicured hedgerows. "'Why do you take your clients home?' he asked. "'I don't know. Most of my clients are children who come from awful homes. I feel sorry for them, I guess. I get attached to them.' "'You feel sorry for me?' "'A little. But you're lucky, Mark. Very lucky. You have a mother who's a good woman and who loves you very much.' Yeah, I guess so. What time is it? Almost six. Why? Mark thought a second and counted the hours. Forty-nine hours ago, Jerome Clifford shot himself. I wish we'd simply run away when we saw his car. Why didn't you? I don't know. It was like I just had to do something once I realized what was going on. I couldn't run away. He was about to die, and I just couldn't ignore it. Something kept pulling me to his car. Ricky was crying and begging me to stop, but I just couldn't. This is all my fault. Maybe, but you can't change it, Mark. It's done. She glanced at her mirror and saw nothing. You think we're going to be okay? I mean, Ricky and me and Mom, when this is all over, will things be like they were? She slowed and turned into a narrow driveway lined with thick, untrimmed hedges. Ricky will be fine. It might take time, but he'll be all right. Kids are tough, Mark. I see it every day. What about me? Everything will work out, Mark. Just trust me. The Mazda stopped beside a large two-story house with a porch around the front of it. Shrubs and flowers grew to the windows. Ivy covered one end of the porch. Is this your house? he asked, almost in awe. My parents bought it fifty-three years ago, the year before I was born. This is where I grew up. My daddy died when I was fifteen, but Mama Love, bless her heart, is still here. You call her Mama Love? Everybody calls her Mama Love. She's almost eighty and in better shape than me. 
She pointed to a garage straight ahead behind the house. You see those three windows above the garage? That's where I live. Like the house, the garage needed a good coat of paint on the trim. Both were old and handsome, but there were weeds in the flower beds and grass growing in the cracks of the driveway. They entered through a side door, and the aroma from the kitchen hit Mark hard. He was suddenly starving. A small woman with gray hair and a tight ponytail and dark eyes met them and hugged Reggie. "'Mama Love, meet Mark's way,' Reggie said, waving at him. He and Mama Love were exactly the same height, and she gently hugged him and pecked him on the cheek. He stood stiff, uncertain how to greet a strange eighty-year-old woman. "'Nice to see you, Mark,' she said in his face. Her voice was strong and sounded much like Reggie's. She took his arm and led him to the kitchen table. "'Have a seat right here, and I'll get you something to drink.' Reggie grinned at him as if to say, "'Just do as she says, because you have no choice.' She hung her umbrella on a rack behind the door and laid her briefcase on the floor. The kitchen was small and cluttered with cabinets and shelves along three walls. Steam rose from the gas stove. A wooden table with four chairs sat squarely in the center of the room with pots and pans hanging from a beam above it. The kitchen was warm and created instant hunger. Mark took the nearest chair and watched Mama Love scoot around, grabbing a glass from the cabinet, opening the refrigerator, filling the glass with ice, pouring tea from a pitcher. Reggie kicked off her shoes and was stirring something in a pot on the stove. She and Mama Love chatted back and forth, the usual routine of how the day went and who'd called. A cat stopped at Mark's chair and examined him. "'That's Axel,' Mama Love said, as she served the iced tea with a cloth napkin. She's seventeen years old and very gentle. Mark drank the tea and left Axel alone. He was not fond of cats. How's your little brother? Mama Love asked. He's doing much better, he said, and suddenly wondered how much Reggie had told her mother. Then he relaxed. If Clint knew very little, Mama Love probably knew even less. He took another sip. She waited for a longer answer. He started talking today. "'That's wonderful!' she exclaimed, with a huge smile, and patted him on the shoulder. Reggie poured her tea from a different pitcher and doctored it with sweetener and lemon. She sat across from Mark at the table, and Axel jumped into her lap. She sipped tea, rubbed the cat, and began slowly removing her jewelry. She was tired. "'Are you hungry?' Mama Love asked, suddenly darting around the kitchen, opening the oven, stirring the pot, closing a drawer— "'Yes, ma'am. It's so nice to hear a young man with manners,' she said, as she stopped for a second and smiled at him. "'Most of Reggie's kids have no manners. I haven't heard a yes, ma'am, in this house in years.' Then she was off again, wiping out a pan and placing it in the sink. Reggie winked at him. "'Mark's been eating hospital food for three days, Mama Love, so he wants to know what you're cooking.' "'It's a surprise,' she said, opening the oven and releasing a thick aroma of meat and cheese and tomatoes. "'But I think you'll like it, Mark.' He was certain he would like it. Reggie winked at him again as she twisted her head and removed a set of small diamond earrings. The pile of jewelry in front of her now included half a dozen bracelets, two rings, a necklace, a watch, and the earrings. Axel was watching it, too. Mama Love was suddenly hacking away with a large knife on a cutting board— she whirled around and laid a basket of bread, hot and buttery, in front of him. "'I bake bread every Wednesday,' she said, patting his shoulder again, then off to the stove. Mark grabbed the biggest slice and took a bite. It was soft and warm, unlike any bread he'd eaten. The butter and garlic melted instantly on his tongue. "'Mama Love is full-blooded Italian,' Reggie said, stroking Axel. Both her parents were born in Italy and immigrated to this country in 1902. I'm half Italian. Who was Mr. Love? Mark asked, chomping away, butter on his lips and fingers. A Memphis boy. They were married when she was sixteen. Seventeen, Mama Love corrected without turning around. Mama Love was now setting the table with plates and flatware. Reggie and her jewelry were in the way, so she gathered it all up and kicked and nudged Axel to the floor. "'When do we eat, Mama Love?' she asked. 
in a minute. I'm going to run and change clothes, she said. Axel sat on Mark's foot and rubbed the back of her head on his shin. I'm very sorry about your little brother, Mama Love said, glancing at the door to make sure Reggie was indeed gone. Mark swallowed a mouthful of bread and wiped his mouth with the napkin. He'll be okay. We've got good doctors. And you've got the best lawyer in the world, she said sternly, with no smile. She waited for verification. We sure do, Mark said slowly. She nodded her approval and started for the sink. What on earth did you boys see out there? Mark sipped his tea and stared at the gray ponytail. This could be a long night with plenty of questions. It would be best to stop it now. Reggie told me not to talk about it. He bit into another piece of bread. Oh, Reggie always says that. But you can talk to me, all her kids do. In the last forty-nine hours he'd learned much about interrogation. Keep the other guy on his heels. When the questions get old, dish out a few of your own. How often does she bring a kid home? She slid the pot off the burner and thought a second. Maybe twice a month. She wants them to eat good food, so she brings them to Mama Loves. Sometimes they spend the night. One little girl stayed a month. She was so pitiful. Name was Andrea. The court took her away from her parents because they were Satan worshippers, doing animal sacrifices and all that mess. She was so sad. She lived upstairs here in Reggie's old bedroom, and she cried when she had to leave. Broke my heart, too. I told Reggie no more kids after that. But Reggie does what Reggie wants. She really likes you, you know. What happened to Andrea? Her parents got her back. I pray for her every day. Do you go to church? Sometimes. Are you a good Catholic? No. It's a little... Well, I'm not sure what kind of church it is, but it's not Catholic. Baptist, I think. We go every now and then. Mama Love listened to this with deep concern, terribly puzzled by the fact that he wasn't sure what kind of church he attended. Maybe I should take you to my church, St. Luke's. It's a beautiful church. Catholics know how to build beautiful churches, you know. He nodded but could think of nothing to say. In a flash she'd forgotten about churches and was back to the stove, opening the oven door and studying the dish with the concentration of Dr. Greenway. She mumbled to herself, and it was obvious she was pleased. "'Go wash your hands, Mark, right down the hall there. Kids nowadays don't wash their hands enough. Go along.' Mark crammed the last bit of bread into his mouth and followed Axel to the bathroom. When he returned, Reggie was seated at the table, flipping through a stack of mail. The bread basket had been replenished. Mama Love opened the oven and pulled out a deep dish covered with aluminum foil. "'It's lasagna,' Reggie said to him with a trace of anticipation. Mama Love launched into a brief history of the dish while she cut it into sections and dug out great hunks with a large spoon. Steam boiled from the pan. The recipe has been in my family for centuries, she said, staring at Mark as if he cared about the lasagna's pedigree. He wanted it on his plate. Came over from the old country. I could make it for my daddy when I was ten years old. Reggie rolled her eyes a bit and winked at Mark. It has four layers, each with a different cheese. She covered their plates with perfect squares of it. The four different cheeses ran together and oozed from the thick pasta. The phone on the countertop rang, and Reggie answered. Go on and eat, Mark, if you want, Mama Love said, as she majestically set his plate in front of him. She nodded at Reggie's back. She might talk forever. Reggie was listening and talking softly into the phone. It was obvious they were not supposed to hear. Mark cut a huge bite with his fork, blew on it just enough to knock off the steam, and carefully raised it to his mouth. He chewed slowly, savoring the rich meat sauce, the cheeses, and who knew what else. Even the spinach was divine. Mama Love watched and waited. She'd poured herself a second glass of wine and held it halfway between the table and her lips as she waited for a response to her great-grandmother's secret recipe. "'It's great,' he said, going for the second bite. "'Just great!' 
His only experience with lasagna had been a year or so earlier when his mother had pulled a plastic tray from the microwave and served it for dinner, Swanson's Frozen or something like that. He remembered a rubbery taste, nothing like this. You like it? Mama Love said, taking a sip of her wine. He nodded with a mouthful, and this pleased her. She took a small bite. Reggie hung up and turned to the table. Gotta run downtown. The cops just picked up Ross Scott for shoplifting again. He's in jail, crying for his mother, but they can't find her. How long will you be gone? Mark asked, his fork still. Couple of hours. You finish eating and visit with Mama Love. I'll take you to the hospital later. She patted his shoulder, and then she was out the door. Mama Love was silent until she heard Reggie's car start. Then she said, What on earth did you boys see out there? Mark took a bite, chewed forever as she waited, then took a long drink of tea. Nothing. How do you make this stuff? It's great. Well, it's an old recipe. She sipped the wine and rattled on for ten minutes about the sauce, then the cheeses. Mark didn't hear a word. He finished the peach cobbler and ice cream while she cleared the table and loaded the dishwasher. He thanked her again, said it was delicious for the tenth time, and stood with an aching stomach. He'd been sitting for an hour. Dinner at the trailer was usually a ten-minute affair. Most of the time they ate microwave meals on trays in front of the television. Diane was too tired to cook. Mama Love admired his empty bowl and sent him to the den while she finished cleaning. The TV was color, but without remote control. No cable. A large family portrait hung above the sofa. He noticed it, then walked closer. It was an old photograph of the Love family, matted and framed by thick curly wood. Mr. and Mrs. Love were on a small sofa in some studio, with two boys in tight collars standing beside them. Mama Love had dark hair and a beautiful smile. Mr. Love was a foot taller and sat rigid and unsmiling. The boys were stiff and awkward, obviously not happy to be dressed in starched shirts and ties. Reggie was between her parents in the center of the portrait. She had a wonderful, smirky smile, and it was obvious she was the center of the family's attention and enjoyed this immensely. She was ten or twelve, about Mark's age, and the face of this pretty little girl caught his attention and took his breath. He stared at her face, and she seemed to laugh at him. She was full of mischief. Beautiful children, huh? It was Mama Love, easing beside him and admiring her family. When was this? Mark asked, still staring. Forty years ago, she said, slowly, almost sadly. We were all so young and happy then. She stood next to him, their arms touching, shoulder to shoulder. Where are the boys? Joey on the right there is the oldest. He was a test pilot for the Air Force and was killed in 1964 in a plane crash. He's a hero. I'm very sorry, Mark whispered. Benny on the left is a year younger than Joey. He's a marine biologist in Vancouver. He never comes to see his mother. He was here about two years ago for Christmas, then off again. He's never married, but I think he's okay. No grandkids by him, either. Reggie's got the only grandkids. She was reaching for a framed five-by-seven next to a lamp on an end table. She handed it to Mark. Two graduation photos with blue caps and gowns. The girl was pretty. The boy had mangy hair, a teenager's beard, and a look of sheer hatred in his eyes. These are Reggie's kids, Mama Love explained, without the slightest trace of either love or pride. The boy was in prison last time we heard anything, selling dope. He was a good boy when he was little, but then his father got him and just ruined him. This was after the divorce. The girl's out in California trying to be an actress, a singer, or something, or so she says, but she'd had drug problems, too, and we don't hear much. She was a sweet child, too. I haven't seen her in almost ten years. Can you believe it? My only granddaughter? It's so sad. Mama Love was now sipping her third glass of wine, and the tongue was loose. If she could talk about her family long enough, then maybe she'd get around to his, and once they'd covered the families, perhaps they might discuss 
exactly what on earth the boys saw out there. "'Why haven't you seen her in ten years?' Mark asked, but only because he needed to say something. It was really a dumb question, because he knew the answer might take hours. His stomach ached from the feast, and he wanted to simply lie on the couch and be left alone. Regina, I mean Reggie, lost her when she was about thirteen. They were going through this nightmare of a divorce. He was chasing other women and had girlfriends all over town. They even caught him with a cute little nurse at the hospital. But the divorce was a horrible nightmare, and Reggie got to where she couldn't handle it. Joe, her ex-husband, was a good boy when they got married, but then made a bunch of money and got the doctor's attitude, you know, and he changed. Money went to his head. She paused and took a sip. Awful. Just awful. I do miss them, though. They're my only grandbabies. They didn't look like grandbabies, especially the boy. He was nothing but a punk. What happened to him? Mark asked after a few seconds of silence. Well, she sighed as if she hated to tell, but would do it anyway. He was sixteen when his father got him, wild and rotten already. I mean, his father was an OBGYN and never had time for the kids. And a boy needs a father, don't you think? And the boy, Jeff is his name, and he was out of control early. Then his father, who had all the money and all the lawyers, got Regina sent away and took the kids. And when this happened, Jeff was pretty much on his own. With his father's money, of course. He finished high school almost at gunpoint, and within six months got caught with a bunch of drugs. She stopped suddenly, and Mark thought she was about to cry. She took a sip. The last time I hugged him was when he graduated from high school. I saw his picture in the newspaper when he got in trouble, but he never called or anything. It's been ten years, Mark. I know I'll die without ever seeing them again. She quickly rubbed her eyes and marked, looked for a hole to crawl in. She took his arm. Come with me. Let's go sit on the porch. He followed through a narrow foyer through the front door, and they sat in the swing on the front porch. It was dark and the air was cool. They rocked gently in silence. Mama Love sipped the wine. She decided to continue the saga. You see, Mark, once Joe got the kids, he just ruined them. Gave them plenty of money, kept his old sleazy girlfriends around the house, flaunted it in front of the kids, bought them cars. Amanda got pregnant in high school, and he arranged the abortion. Why did Reggie change her name? he asked politely. Maybe when she answered, this saga would be finished. She spent several years in and out of institutions. This was after the divorce, and bless her heart, she was in bad shape. Mark, I cried myself to sleep every night worrying about my daughter. She lived with me most of the time. It took years, but she finally came through. Lots of therapy, lots of money, lots of love. And then she decided one day that the nightmare was over, that she would pick up the pieces and move on, and that she would create a new life. That's why she changed her name. She went to court and had it done legally. She fixed up the apartment over the garage. She gave me all these pictures because she refuses to look at them. She went to law school. She became a new person with a new identity and a new name. Is she bitter? She fights it. She lost her children, and no mother can ever recover from that. But she tries not to think about them. They were brainwashed by their father, so they have no use for her. She hates him, of course, and I think it's probably healthy. She's a very good lawyer, he said, as if he'd personally hired and fired many. Mama Love moved closer, too close to suit Mark. She patted his knee, and this irritated the hell out of him, but she was a sweet old woman and meant nothing by it. She'd buried a son and lost her only grandson, so he gave her a break. There was no moon. A soft wind gently rustled the leaves of the huge black oaks between the porch and the street. He was not anxious to return to the hospital, and so he decided this was pleasant after all. 
He smiled at Mama Love, but she was staring blankly into the darkness, lost in some deep thought. A heavy folded quilt padded the swing. He assumed she would work her way back to the shooting of Jerome Clifford, and this he wanted to avoid. Why does Reggie have so many kids for clients? She kept patting his knee. Because some kids need lawyers, though most of them don't know it. And most lawyers are too busy making money to worry about kids. She wants to help. She'll always blame herself for losing her kids, and she just wants to help others. She's very protective of her little clients. I didn't pay her very much money. Don't worry, Mark. Every month Reggie takes at least two cases for free. They're called pro bono, which means the lawyer does the work without a fee. If she didn't want your case, she wouldn't have taken it. He knew about pro bono. Half the lawyers on television were laboring away on cases they wouldn't get paid for. The other half were sleeping with beautiful women and eating in fancy restaurants. Reggie has a soul, Mark, a conscience, she continued, still patting gently. The wine glass was empty, but the words were clear and the mind was sharp. She'll work for no fee if she believes in the client, and some of her poor clients will break your heart, Mark. I cry all the time over some of these little fellas. You are very proud of her, aren't you? I am. Reggie almost died, Mark, a few years ago when the divorce was going on. I almost lost her. Then I almost went broke trying to get her back on her feet. But look at her now. Will she ever get married again? Maybe. She's dated a couple of men, but nothing serious. Romance is not at the top of her list. Her work comes first, like tonight. It's almost eight o'clock, and she's at the city jail talking to a little troublemaker they picked up for shoplifting. Wonder what'll be in the newspaper in the morning. Sports, obituaries, the usual. Mark shifted uncomfortably and waited. It was obvious he was supposed to speak. Who knows? What was it like having your picture on the front page of the paper? I didn't like it. Where'd they get those pictures? They're school pictures. There was a long pause. The chains above them squeaked as the swing moved slowly back and forth. What was it like walking up on that dead man who just shot himself? Pretty scary. But to be honest, my doctor told me not to discuss it because it stresses me out. Look at my little brother, you know, so I'd better not say anything. She patted harder. Of course, of course. Mark pressed with his toes, and the swing moved a bit faster. His stomach was still packed, and he was suddenly sleepy. Mama Love was humming now. The breeze picked up, and he shivered. Reggie found them on the dark porch in the swing, rocking quietly back and forth. Mama Love sipped black coffee and patted him on the shoulder. Mark was curled in a knot beside her, his head resting in her lap, a quilt over his legs. "'How long has he been asleep?' she whispered. "'An hour or so. He got cold, then he got sleepy. He's a sweet child. He sure is. I'll call his mother at the hospital and see if he can stay here tonight. He ate until he was stuffed. I'll fix him a good breakfast in the morning.' Chapter 19 The idea was Truman's, and it was a wonderful idea, one that would work and thus would be snared immediately by Foltrig and claimed as his own. Life with Reverend Roy was a series of stolen ideas and credits when things worked, and when things went to hell Truman and his office took the blame along with Foltrig's underlings, and the press and the jurors and the corrupt defense bar, everybody but the great man himself. But Truman had quietly massaged and manipulated the egos of prima donnas before, and he could certainly handle this idiot. It was late, and as he picked at the lettuce in his shrimp remoulade in the dark corner of a crowded oyster bar, the idea hit him. He called Fultrig's private office number. No answer. He dialed the number in the library, and Wally Box answered. 
It was 9.30, and Wally explained he and his boss were still buried deep in the law books, just a couple of workaholics slaving over the details and enjoying it, all in a day's work. Truman said he'd be there in ten minutes. He left the noisy café and walked hurriedly through the crowds on Canal Street. September was just another hot, sticky summer month in New Orleans. After two blocks he removed his jacket and walked faster. Two more blocks and his shirt was wet and clinging to his back and chest. He darted through the crowds of tourists lumbering along Canal with their cameras and gaudy T-shirts and wondered for the thousandth time why these people came to this city to spend hard-earned money on cheap entertainment and overpriced food. The average tourist on Canal Street wore black socks and white sneakers, was forty pounds overweight, and Truman figured these people would return home and brag to their less fortunate friends about the delightful cuisine they'd uniquely discovered and gorged themselves on in New Orleans. He bumped into a hefty woman with a small black box stuck in her face. She was actually standing near the curb and filming the front of a cheap souvenir store with suggestive street signs displayed for sale in the window. What sort of person would watch a video of a tacky souvenir shop in the French Quarter? Americans no longer experience vacations. They simply sony them so they can ignore them for the rest of the year. Truman was in for a transfer. He was sick of tourists, traffic, humidity, crime, and he was sick of Roy Fultrick. He turned by Rubenstein Brothers and headed for Poitras. Fultrig was not afraid of hard work. It came natural to him. He realized in law school that he was not a genius and that to succeed he'd need to put in more hours. He studied his ass off and finished somewhere in the middle of the pack. But he'd been elected president of the student body, and there was a certificate declaring this achievement framed in oak somewhere on one of his walls. His career as a political animal started at the moment when his law school classmates chose him as their president, a position most did not know existed and couldn't have cared less about. Job offers had been scarce for young Roy, and at the last minute he jumped at the chance to be an assistant city prosecutor in New Orleans, fifteen thousand bucks a year in 1975. In two years he handled more cases than all the other city prosecutors combined. He worked. He put in long hours in a dead-end job because he was going places. He was a star, but no one noticed. He began dabbling in local Republican politics, a lonely hobby, and learned to play the game. He met people with money and clout and landed a job with a law firm. He put in incredible hours and became a partner. He married a woman he didn't love because she had the right credentials and a wife brought respectability. Roy was on the move. There was a game plan. He was still married to her, but they slept in different rooms. The kids were now twelve and ten, a pretty family portrait. He preferred the office to his home, which suited his wife just fine, because she didn't like him, but did enjoy his salary. Roy's conference table was once again covered with law books and legal pads. Wally had shed his tie and jacket. Empty coffee cups littered the room. They were both tired. The law was quite simple. Every citizen owes to society the duty of giving testimony to aid in the enforcement of the law, and a witness is not excused from testifying because of his fear of reprisal threatening his and or his family's lives. It was black-letter law, as they say, carved in stone over the years by hundreds of judges and justices. No exceptions, no exemptions, no loopholes for scared little boys. Roy and Wally had read dozens of cases. Many were copied and highlighted and thrown about on the table. The kid would have to talk. If the juvenile court approach in Memphis fell through, Foltrick planned to issue a subpoena for Mark Sway to appear before the grand jury in New Orleans. It would scare the little punk to death and loosen his tongue. Truman walked through the door and said, You guys are working late. Wally Box pushed away from the table and stretched his arms mightily above his head. Yeah, a lot of stuff to cover, he said, exhausted, waving his hand proudly at the piles of books and notes. Have a seat, Foltrick said, pointing at a chair. We're finishing up. He stretched, too, then cracked his knuckles. He loved his reputation as a workaholic, a man of importance, unafraid of painful hours, a family man whose calling went beyond wife and kids. The job meant everything. His client was the United States of America. 
Truman had heard this eighteen-hour-a-day crap for seven years now. It was Voltrig's favorite subject, talking about himself and the hours at the office and the body that needed no sleep. Lawyers wear their loss of sleep like a badge of honor, real macho machines grinding it out around the clock. I've got an idea, Truman said, sitting across the table. You told me earlier about the hearing in Memphis tomorrow, in juvenile court. We're filing a petition, Roy corrected. I don't know when the hearing will take place, but we'll ask for a quick one. Yeah, well, what about this? Just before I left the office this afternoon, I talked to K.O. Lewis, Voyle's number one deputy. I know K.O., Foltrig interrupted. Truman knew this was coming. In fact, he paused just a split second so Foltrig could interrupt and set him straight about how close he was to K.O. Not Mr. Lewis, but simply K.O. Right. Well, he's in St. Louis attending a conference, and he asked about the Boyette case and Jerome Clifford and the kid. I told him what we knew. He said feel free to call if he could do anything. Said Mr. Voyles wants daily reports. I know all this. Right. Well, I was just thinking, St. Louis is an hour's flight from Memphis, right? What if Mr. Lewis presented himself to the juvenile court judge in Memphis first thing in the morning when the petition is filed? And what if Mr. Lewis has a little chat with the judge and leans on him? We're talking about the number two man in the FBI. He tells the judge what we think this kid knows. Foltrig began nodding his approval, and when Wally saw this, he began nodding too, only faster. Truman continued. And there's something else. We know Gronky is in Memphis, and it's safe to assume he's not there to visit Elvis's grave, right? He's been sent there by Moldano. So I was thinking, what if we assume the kid is in danger, and Mr. Lewis explains to the juvenile court judge that it's in the best interest of the kid for us to take him into custody, you know, for his own protection? I like this, Fultrig said softly. Wally liked it, too. The kid'll crack under the pressure. First he's taken into custody by order of the juvenile court, same as any other case, and that'll scare the hell out of him. Might also wake up his lawyer. Hopefully the judge orders the kid to talk. At that point the kid'll crack, I believe. If not, he's in contempt, maybe, don't you think? Yeah, he's in contempt, but we can't predict what the judge will do at that point. Right. So Mr. Lewis tells the judge about Gronky and his connections with the mob, and that we believe he's in Memphis to harm the kid. Either way, we get the kid in custody away from his lawyer. A bitch. Fultrig was wired now. He scribbled something on a legal pad. Wally stood and began pacing thoughtfully around the library, deep in thought, as if things were conspiring to force him to make a significant decision. Truman could call her a bitch here in the privacy of an office in New Orleans, but he remembered the tape, and he would be happy to remain in New Orleans, far away from her, let McThune deal with Reggie in Memphis. "'Can you get K.O. on the phone?' Foltry gasped. "'I think so.' Truman pulled a scrap of paper from a pocket and began punching numbers on the phone. Foltrick met Wally in the corner, away from the agent. "'It's a great idea,' Wally said. "'I'm sure this juvenile court judge is just some local yokel who listen to K.O. and do whatever he wants, don't you think?' Truman had Mr. Lewis on the phone. Foltrick watched him while listening to Wally. "'Maybe. But regardless, we get the kid in court quickly, and I think he'll fold. If not, he's in custody, under our control, and away from his lawyer. I like it. They whispered for a while as Truman talked to K.O. Lewis. Truman nodded at them, gave the OK sign with a big smile, and hung up. "'He'll do it,' he said proudly. "'He'll catch an early morning flight to Memphis and meet with Fink. Then they'll get with George Ord and descend on the judge.' Truman was walking toward them, very proud of himself. "'Think about it. The U.S. attorney on one side, K.O. Lewis on the other, and Fink in the middle, first thing in the morning when the judge gets to the office. They'll have the kid talking in no time. Fultrig flashed a wicked smile. He loved those moments when the power of the federal government shifted into high gear and landed hard on small, unsuspecting people. Just like that, with one phone call, the second in command of the FBI had entered the picture. It just might work, he said to his boys. It just might work. In one corner of the small den above the garage, Reggie flipped through a thick book under a lamp. 
It was midnight, but she couldn't sleep, so she curled under a quilt and sipped tea, while reading a book Clint had found titled Reluctant Witnesses. As far as law books go, it was quite thin, but the law was quite clear. Every witness has a duty to come forth and assist those authorities investigating a crime. A witness cannot refuse to testify on the grounds that he or she feels threatened. The vast majority of the cases cited in the book dealt with organized crime. Seems the Mafia has historically frowned on its people schmoozing with the cops and has often threatened wives and children. The Supreme Court has said more than once that wives and children be damned. A witness must talk. At some point in the very near future, Mark would be forced to talk. Fultrig could issue a subpoena and compel his attendance before a grand jury in New Orleans. She, of course, would be able to attend. If Mark refused to testify before the grand jury, a quick hearing would be held before the trial judge, who would undoubtedly order him to answer Fultrig's questions. If he refused, the wrath of the court would be severe. No judge tolerates being disobeyed, but federal judges can be especially nasty when their orders fall on deaf ears. There are places to put eleven-year-old kids who find themselves in disfavor with the system. At the moment she had no less than twenty clients scattered about in various training schools in Tennessee. The oldest was sixteen. All were secured behind fences with guards pacing about. They were called reform schools not long ago. Now they're training schools. When ordered to talk, Mark would undoubtedly look to her, and this was why she couldn't sleep. To advise him to disclose the location of the senator's body would be to jeopardize his safety. His mother and brother would be at risk. These were not people who could become instantly mobile. Ricky might be hospitalized for weeks. Any type of witness protection program would be postponed until he was healthy again. Diane would be a sitting duck if Maldonado were so inclined. It would be proper and ethical and moral to advise him to cooperate, and that would be the easy way out. But what if he got hurt? He would point a finger at her. What if something happened to Ricky or Diane? She, the lawyer, would be blamed. Children make lousy clients. The lawyer becomes much more than a lawyer. With adults, you simply lay the pros and cons of each option on the table. You advise this way and that. You predict a little, but not much. Then you tell the adult it's time for a decision, and you leave the room for a bit. When you return, you're handed a decision, and you run with it. Not so with kids. They don't understand lawyerly advice. They want a hug and someone to make decisions. They're scared and looking for friends. She'd held many small hands in courtrooms. She'd wiped many tears. She imagined this scene, a huge empty federal courtroom in New Orleans with the doors locked and two marshals guarding it, Mark on the witness stand, Fultrig in all his glory, strutting around on his home turf, prancing back and forth for the benefit of his little assistants and perhaps an FBI agent or two, the judge in a black robe. He was handling it delicately, and he probably disliked Fultrig immensely because he was forced to see him all the time. He, the judge, asks Mark if he in fact refused to answer certain questions before the grand jury that very morning in a room just a short distance down the hall. Mark, looking upward at his honor, answers yes. What was the first question, the judge asks Fultrig, who's on his feet with a legal pad strutting and prancing as if the room were filled with cameras? I asked him, Your Honor, if Jerome Clifford, prior to the suicide, said anything about the body of Senator Boyd Boyette, and he refused to answer, Your Honor. Then I asked him if Jerome Clifford, in fact, told him where the body is buried, and he refused to answer this question as well, Your Honor. And the judge leans down even closer to Mark. There is no smile. Mark stares at his lawyer. Why didn't you answer these questions, the judge asks. "'Because I don't want to,' Mark answers, and it's almost funny. "'But there are no smiles. "'Well,' the judge says, "'I am ordering you to answer these questions before the grand jury. "'Do you understand me, Mark? "'I am ordering you to return to the grand jury room right now "'and answer all of Mr. Fultrick's questions. "'Do you understand this?' "'Mark says nothing and doesn't move a muscle. "'He stares at his trusted lawyer thirty feet away.' What if I don't answer the questions, he finally asks, and this irritates the judge. You have no choice, young man. You must answer, because I'm ordering it. And if I don't? Mark asks, terrified. 
Well, then, I'll find you in contempt, and I'll probably incarcerate you until you do as I say. For a very long time, the judge growls. Axel rubbed against the chair and startled her. The courtroom scene was gone. She closed the book and walked to the window. The best advice to Mark would be simply to lie. Tell a big one. At the critical moment, just explain how the late Jerome Clifford said nothing about Boyd Boyette. He was crazy and drunk and stoned and said nothing, really. Who in the world could ever know the difference? Mark was a cool liar. He awoke in a strange bed between a soft mattress and a heavy layer of blankets. A dim lamp from the hallway cast a narrow light through the slit in the doorway. His battered Nikes were in a chair by the door, but the rest of his clothing was still on. He slid the blankets to his knees, and the bed squeaked. He stared at the ceiling, and vaguely remembered being escorted to this room by Reggie and Mama Love. Then he remembered the swing on the porch, and being very tired. Slowly he swung his feet from the bed and sat on the edge of it. He remembered being led and pushed up the stairs. Things were clearing up. He sat in the chair and laced his sneakers. The floor was wooden and creaked softly as he walked to the door and opened it. The hinges popped. The hallway was still. Three other doors opened into it, and they were all closed. He eased to the stairway and tiptoed down in no hurry. A light from the kitchen caught his attention, and he walked faster. The clock on the wall gave the time as two-twenty. He now remembered that Reggie didn't live here. She was above the garage. Mama Love was probably sound asleep upstairs, so he stopped the creeping along and crossed the foyer, unlocked the front door, and found his spot in the swing. The air was cool, and the front lawn was pitch black. For a moment he was frustrated with himself for falling asleep and being put to bed in this house. He belonged at the hospital with his mother, sleeping on the same crippling bed, waiting for Ricky to snap out of it so they could leave and go home. He assumed Reggie had called Diane, so his mother probably wasn't worried. In fact, she was probably pleased that he was here at this moment, eating good food and sleeping well. Mothers are like that. He'd missed two days of school, according to his calculations. Today would be Thursday. Yesterday he'd been attacked by the man with the knife in the elevator, the man with the family portrait, and the day before that, Tuesday, he'd hired Reggie. That, too, seemed like a month ago. And the day before that, Monday, he had awakened like any normal kid and gone off to school with no idea all this was about to happen. There must be a million kids in Memphis, and he would never understand how and why he was selected to meet Jerome Clifford just seconds before he put the gun in his mouth. Smoking. That was the answer. Hazardous to your health. You could say that again. He was being punished by God for smoking and harming his body. Damn, what if he'd been caught with a beer? A silhouette of a man appeared on the sidewalk and stopped for a second in front of Mama Love's house. The orange glow of a cigarette flared in front of his face, then he walked very slowly out of sight. A little late for an evening stroll, Mark thought. A minute passed and he was back. Same man, same slow walk. Same hesitation between the trees as he looked at the house. Mark held his breath. He was sitting in darkness, and he knew he could not be seen. But this man was more than a nosy neighbor. At exactly 4 a.m., a plain white Ford van with the license plates temporarily removed eased into Tucker Wheel Estates and turned onto East Street. The trailers were dark and quiet. The streets were deserted. The little village was peacefully asleep and would be for two more hours until dawn. The van stopped in front of number 17. The lights and engine were turned off. No one noticed it. After a minute, a man in a uniform opened the driver's door and stood in the street. The uniform resembled that of a Memphis cop. Navy trousers, navy shirt, wide black belt with black holster, some type of gun on the hip, black boots, but no cap or hat. A decent imitation, especially at four in the morning when no one was watching. He held a rectangular cardboard container about the size of two shoe boxes. He glanced around, then carefully watched and listened to the trailer next door to number 17. Not a sound, not even the bark of a dog. He smiled to himself 
and walked casually to the door of number 17. If he detected movement in a nearby trailer, he would simply knock slightly on the door and go through the routine of being a frustrated messenger looking for Mrs. Sway. But it wasn't necessary. Not a peep from the neighbors. So he quickly sat the box against the door, got in the van, and drove away. He had come and gone without a trace, leaving behind his little warning. Exactly thirty minutes later the box exploded. It was a quiet explosion, carefully controlled. The ground didn't shake and the porch didn't shatter. The door was blown open and the flames were directed at the interior of the trailer. Lots of red and yellow flames and black smoke rolling through the rooms. The matchbox construction of the walls and floors was nothing more than kindling for the fire. By the time Rufus Bibbs next door could punch 911, the Sway trailer was engulfed and beyond help. Rufus hung up the phone and ran to find his garden hose. His wife and kids were running wild, trying to dress and get out of the trailer. Screams and shouts echoed on the street as the neighbors ran to the fire in an amazing array of pajamas and robes. Dozens of them watched the fire as garden hoses came from all directions and water was applied to the trailers next door. The fire grew and the crowd grew and windows popped in the Bibbs trailer. The domino effect. More screams as more windows popped then sirens and red lights. The crowd moved back as the firemen laid lines and pumped water. The other trailers were saved. But the sway home was nothing but rubble. The roof and most of the floor were gone. The rear wall stood with a solitary window still intact. More people arrived as the firemen sprayed the ruins. Walter Deevil, a loudmouth from South Street, started babbling about how cheap these damn trailers were with aluminum wiring and all. Hell, we all live in fire traps, he said, with the pitch of a street preacher, and what we ought to do is sue that son of a bitch Tucker and force him to provide safe housing. He just might see his lawyer about it. Personally, he had eight smoke and heat detectors in his trailer because of the cheap aluminum wiring and all, and he just might talk to his lawyer. By the Bibbs trailer a small crowd gathered and thanked God the fire didn't spread. Those poor sways! What else could happen to them? Chapter 20 After a breakfast of cinnamon rolls and chocolate milk, they left the house and headed for the hospital. It was 7.30, much too early for Reggie, but Diane was waiting. Ricky was doing much better. "'What do you think will happen today?' Mark asked. "'For some reason this struck her as being funny. "'You poor child,' she said when she finished chuckling. "'You've been through a lot this week. "'Yeah. "'I hate school, but it'd be nice to go back. "'I had this wild dream last night. "'What happened? "'Nothing. "'I dreamed everything was normal again, "'and I made it through a whole day with nothing happening to me. "'It was wonderful.' Well, Mark, I'm afraid I have some bad news. I knew it. What is it? Clint called a few minutes ago. You've made the front page again. It's a picture of both of us, evidently taken by one of those clowns at the hospital yesterday when we got off the elevator. Great. There's a reporter at the Memphis Press by the name of Slick Moeller. Everyone calls him the Mole. Mole Moeller. He covers the crime beat, sort of a legend around town. He's hot on this case. He wrote the story yesterday. That's right. He has a lot of contacts within the police department. It sounds as if the cops believe Mr. Clifford told you everything before he killed himself, and now you're refusing to cooperate. Pretty accurate, wouldn't you say? She glanced at the rearview mirror. Yeah, it's spooky. How does he know this stuff? The cops talk to him off the record, of course, and he digs and digs until he puts the pieces together. And if the pieces don't fit perfectly, then Slick just sort of fills in the gaps. According to Clint, the story is based on unnamed sources within the Memphis Police Department, and there's a great deal of suspicion about how much you know. The theory is that since you've hired me, you must be hiding something. Let's stop and get a newspaper. We'll get one at the hospital. We'll be there in a minute. Do you think those reporters will be waiting again? Probably. I told Clint to find a back entrance somewhere and to meet us in the parking lot. I'm really sick of this. Just sick of it. 
All my buddies are in school today having a good time, being normal, fighting with girls during recess, playing jokes on the teacher, you know, the usual stuff. And look at me, running around town with my lawyer, reading about my adventures in the newspapers, looking at my face on the front page, hiding from reporters, dodging killers with switchblades. It's like something out of a movie, a bad movie. I'm just sick of it. I don't know if I can take it anymore. It's just too much. She watched him between glances at the street and traffic. His jaws were tight. He stared straight ahead, but saw nothing. I'm sorry, Mark. Yeah, me too. So much for pleasant dreams, huh? This could be a very long day. What else is new? They were watching the house last night. Did you know that? I beg your pardon? Yes, yeah, somebody was watching the house. I was on the porch at 2.30 this morning. I saw a guy walking along the sidewalk. He was real casual, you know, just smoking a cigarette and looking at the house. Could be a neighbor. Right, at 2.30 in the morning. Maybe someone out for a walk. Then why did he walk by the house three times in 15 minutes? She glanced at him again and hit her brakes to avoid a car in front of them. Do you trust me, Mark? she asked. He looked at her as if surprised by the question. Of course I trust you, Reggie. She smiled and patted his arm. Then stick with me. One advantage of an architectural horror like St. Peter's was the existence of lots of doors and exits few people knew about. With additions stuck here and wings added over there as an afterthought, there had been created over the course of time little nooks and alleys seldom used and rarely discovered by lost security guards. When they arrived, Clint had been hustling around the hospital for thirty minutes with no success. He'd managed to become lost himself three different times. He was sweating and apologizing as they met at the parking lot. "'Just follow me,' Mark said, and they darted across the street and entered through the emergency gate. They wove through heavy rush-hour hall traffic and found an ancient escalator going down. "'I hope you know where you're going,' Reggie said, obviously in doubt and half-jogging in an effort to keep up with him. Clint was sweating even harder. "'No problem,' Mark said, and opened a door leading to the kitchen. "'We're in the kitchen, Mark,' Reggie said, looking around. "'Just be cool. Act like you're supposed to be here.' He punched a button by a service elevator, and the door opened instantly. He punched another button on the inside panel, and they lurched upward, headed for floor number ten. There are eighteen floors in the main section, but this elevator stops at number ten. It will not stop at nine. Figure it out. He watched the numbers above the door and explained this like a bored tour guide. What happens on ten? Clint asked between breaths. Just wait. The door opened on ten, and they stepped into a huge closet with rows of shelves filled with towels and bedsheets. Mark was off, darting between the aisles. He opened a heavy metal door, and they were suddenly in the hallway with patient rooms right and left. He pointed to his left, kept walking, and stopped before an emergency exit door with red and yellow alarm warnings all over it. He grabbed the bar handle across the front of it, and Reggie and Clint stopped cold. He pushed the door open, and nothing happened. Alarms don't work he said nonchalantly, and bounded down the steps to the ninth floor. He opened another door, and suddenly they were in a quiet hallway with thick industrial carpet and no traffic. He pointed again, and they were off, past patient rooms, around a bend, and by the nurse's station, where they glanced down another hall and saw the loiterers by the elevators. "'Good morning, Mark,' Karen the Beautiful called out as they hurried by, but she said this without a smile. Hi, Karen, he answered, without slowing. Diane was sitting in a folding chair in the hall with a Memphis cop kneeling before her. She was crying, and had been for some time. The two security guards were standing together twenty feet away. Mark saw the cop and the tears and ran for his mother. She grabbed him, and they hugged. What's the matter, Mom? he asked, and she cried harder. Mark, your trailer burned last night, the cop said just a few hours ago. Mark glared at him in disbelief, then squeezed his mother around the neck. She was wiping tears and trying to compose herself. How bad? Mark asked. Real bad, the cop said sadly as he stood and held his cap with both hands. Everything's gone. 
What started the fire? Reggie asked. Don't know right now. The fire inspector will be on the scene this morning. Could be electrical. I need to talk to the fire inspector, okay? Reggie insisted, and the cop looked her over. And who are you? he asked. Reggie Love, attorney for the family. Ah, yes, I saw the paper this morning. She handed him a card. Please ask the fire inspector to call me. Sure, lady. The cop carefully placed the hat on his head and looked down again at Diane. He was sad again. Miss Way, I'm very sorry about this. Thank you, she said, wiping her face. He nodded at Reggie and Clint, backed away and left in a hurry. A nurse appeared and stood by just in case. Diane suddenly had an audience. She stood and stopped crying, even managed to smile at Reggie. This is Clint Van Hooser. He works for me, Reggie said. Diane smiled at Clint. I'm very sorry, he said. Thank you, Diane said softly. A few seconds of awkward silence followed as she finished wiping her face. Her arm was around Mark, who was still dazed. Did he behave? Diane asked. He was wonderful. He ate enough for a small army. That's good. Thanks for having him over. How's Ricky? Reggie asked. He had a good night. Dr. Greenway stopped by this morning, and Ricky was awake and talking. Looks much better. Does he know about the fire? Mark asked. No. And we're not telling him, okay? Okay, Mom. Could we go inside and talk? Just me and you? Diane smiled at Reggie and Clint and led Mark into the room. The door was closed, and the tiny Sway family was all alone with all its worldly possessions. The Honorable Harry Roosevelt had presided over the Shelby County Juvenile Court for twenty-two years now, and despite the dismal and depressing nature of the court's business, he had conducted its affairs with a great deal of dignity. He was the first black juvenile court judge in Tennessee, and when he'd been appointed by the governor in the early seventies, his future was brilliant, and there were glowing predictions of higher courts for him to conquer. The higher courts were still there, and Harry Roosevelt was still here, in the deteriorating building known simply as Juvenile Court. There were much nicer courthouses in Memphis. On Main Street, the federal building, always the newest in town, housed the elegant and stately courtrooms. The federal boys always had the best, rich carpet, thick leather chairs, heavy oak tables, plenty of lights, dependable air conditioning, lots of well-paid clerks and assistants. A few blocks away the Shelby County Courthouse was a beehive of judicial activity, as thousands of lawyers roamed its tiled and marbled corridors and worked their way through well-preserved and well-scrubbed courtrooms. It was an older building, but a beautiful one, with paintings on the walls and a few statues scattered about. Harry could have had a courtroom over there, but he said no. And not far away was the Shelby County Justice Center, with a maze of fancy new modern courtrooms with bright fluorescent lights and sound systems and padded seats. Harry could have had one of those, too, but he turned it down. He remained here, in the juvenile court building, a converted high school blocks away from downtown, with little parking and few janitors and more cases per judge than any other docket in the world. His court was the unwanted stepchild of the judicial system. Most lawyers shunned it. Most law students dreamed of plush offices in tall buildings and wealthy clients with thick wallets. Never did they dream of slugging their way through the roach-infested corridors of juvenile court. Harry had turned down four appointments, all to courts where the heating systems worked in the winter. He had been considered for these appointments because he was smart and black, and he turned them down because he was poor and black. They paid him sixty thousand a year, lowest of any court in town, so he could feed his wife and four teenagers and live in a nice home. But he'd known hunger as a child, and those memories were vivid. He would always think of himself as a poor black kid. And that's exactly the reason the once-promising Harry Roosevelt remained a simple juvenile court judge. To him it was the most important job in the world. By statute he had exclusive jurisdiction over delinquent, unruly, dependent, and neglected children. He determined paternity of children born out of wedlock and enforced his own orders for their support and education. 
and in a county where half the babies were born to single mothers, this accounted for most of his docket. He terminated parental rights and placed abused children in new homes. Harry carried heavy burdens. He weighed somewhere between three and four hundred pounds and wore the same outfit every day, black suit, white cotton shirt, and a bow tie, which he tied himself, and did so poorly. No one knew if Harry owned one black suit or fifty. He always looked the same. He was an imposing figure on the bench, glaring down over his reading glasses at deadbeat fathers who refused to support their children. Deadbeat fathers, black and white alike, lived in fear of Judge Roosevelt. He would track them down and throw them in jail. He found their employers and tapped their paychecks. If you messed with Harry's subjects, or Harry's kids as they were known, you could find yourself handcuffed and standing pitifully before him with a bailiff on each side. Harry Roosevelt was a legend in Memphis. The county fathers had seen fit to give him two more judges to help with the caseload, but he maintained a brutal work schedule. He usually arrived before seven and made his own coffee. He started court promptly at nine, and God helped the lawyer who was late for court. He'd thrown several of them in jail over the years. At eight-thirty his secretary hauled in a box of mail and informed Harry that there was a group of men waiting outside who desperately needed to speak with him. "'What else is new?' he asked, eating the last bit of an apple Danish. "'You might want to meet with these gentlemen.' "'Oh, really? Who are they?' "'One is George Ord, our distinguished U.S. attorney.' "'I taught George in law school.' "'Right. That's what he said. Twice. "'There's also an assistant U.S. attorney from New Orleans, a Mr. Thomas Fink, and a Mr. K. O. Lewis, deputy director of the FBI, and a couple of FBI agents.' Harry looked up from a file and thought about this. A rather distinguished group. What do they want? They wouldn't say. Well, show them in. She left, and seconds later Ord, Fink, Lewis, and Maxune filed into the crowded and cluttered office and introduced themselves to his honor. Harry and the secretary moved files from the chairs, and everyone looked for a seat. They exchanged brief pleasantries, and after a few minutes of this, Harry looked at his watch and said, "'Gentlemen, I am scheduled to hear seventeen cases today. What can I do for you?' Ord cleared his throat first. "'Well, Judge, I am sure you've seen the papers the last two mornings, especially the front-page stories about a boy by the name of Mark Sway. Very intriguing.' Mr. Fink here is prosecuting the man accused of killing Senator Boyette, and the case is scheduled for trial in New Orleans in a few weeks. I am aware of this. I have read the stories. We are almost certain that Mark Sway knows more than he's telling. He's lied to the Memphis police on several occasions. We think he talked at length with Jerome Clifford before the suicide. We know, without a doubt, he was in the car. We tried to talk to the kid, but he's been very uncooperative. Now he's hired a lawyer, and she's stonewalling. Reggie Love is a regular in my court, a very competent attorney, sometimes a bit overprotective of her clients, but there's nothing wrong with that. Yes, sir. We're very suspicious of the boy, and we feel quite strongly that he's withholding valuable information. Such as? Such as the location of the senator's body. How can you assume this? There's a lot to the story, Your Honor, and it would take a while to explain it. Harry played with his bow tie and gave Ord one of his patented scowls. He was thinking. So you want me to bring the kid in and ask him questions? Sort of. Mr. Fink has brought with him a petition alleging the child to be a delinquent. This did not sit well with Harry. His shiny forehead was suddenly wrinkled. A rather serious allegation. What type of offense has the child committed? obstruction of justice. You got any law? Fink had a file open, and he was on his feet, handing a thin brief across the desk. Harry took it and began reading slowly. The room was silent. K.O. Lewis had yet to say anything, and this bothered him because he was, after all, the number two man at the FBI, and this judge seemed not to care. Harry flipped a page and glanced at his watch. I'm listening, he said in Fink's direction. It's our position, Your Honor, that through his misrepresentations, Mark Sways obstructed the investigation into this matter. Which matter? The murder or the suicide? 
excellent point, and as soon as he heard the question, Fink knew Harry Roosevelt would not be a pushover. They were investigating a murder, not a suicide. There was no law against suicide, nor was there a law against witnessing one. Well, Your Honor, the suicide has some very direct links to the murder of Boyette, we think, and it's important for the kid to cooperate. What if the kid knows nothing? We can't be certain until we ask him. Right now he is impeding the investigation, and as you well know, every citizen has a duty to assist law enforcement officials. I'm well aware of that. It just seems a bit severe to allege the kid is a delinquent without any proof. The proof will come, Your Honor. If we can get the kid on the witness stand under oath in a closed hearing and ask some questions, that's all we're trying to do. He tossed the brief into a pile of papers and removed his reading glasses. He chewed on a stem. Ord leaned forward and spoke solemnly. Look, Judge, if we can take the kid into custody, then have an expedited hearing, we think this matter will be resolved. If he states under oath that he knows nothing about Boyd Boyette, then the petition is dismissed, the kid goes home, and the matter is over. It's routine. No proof, no finding of delinquency, no harm. But if he knows something relevant to the location of the body, then we have a right to know, and we think the kid will tell us during the hearing. There are two ways to make him talk, Your Honor, Fink added. We can file this petition in your court and have a hearing, or we can subpoena the kid to face the grand jury in New Orleans. Staying here seems to be the quickest and best route, especially for the kid. I do not want this kid subpoenaed before a grand jury, Harry said sternly. Is that understood? They all nodded quickly, and they all knew full well that a federal grand jury could subpoena Mark Sway any time it chose, regardless of the feelings of a local judge. This was typical of Harry, immediately throwing his protective blanket around any child within reach of his jurisdiction. "'I'd much rather deal with it in my court,' he said, almost to himself. "'We agree, Your Honor,' Fink said. They all agreed. Harry picked up his daily calendar. As usual, it was filled with more misery than he could possibly handle in one day. He studied it. "'These allegations of obstruction are rather shaky, in my opinion. But I can't prevent you from filing the petition.' I suggest we hear this matter at the earliest possible time. If the kid in fact knows nothing, and I suspect this to be the case, then I want it over and done with, quickly. This suited everyone. Let's do it during lunch today. Where is the kid now? At the hospital, Ord said. His brother will be there for an unspecified period of time. The mother's confined to the room. Mark just sort of roams about. Last night he stayed with his lawyer. That sounds like Reggie, Harry said with affection. I see no need to take him into custody. Custody was very important to Fink and Fultrick. They wanted the kid picked up, hauled away in a police car, placed in a cell of some sort, and in general frightened to the point of talking. Your Honor, if I may, K.O. finally said, we think custody is urgent. Oh, do you? I'm listening. Macthune handed Judge Roosevelt a glossy eight by ten. Lewis handled the narration. The man in the picture is Paul Gronke. He's a thug from New Orleans and a close associate of Barry Muldano. He's been in Memphis since Tuesday night. That photo was taken as he entered the airport in New Orleans. An hour later he was in Memphis, and unfortunately we lost him when he left the airport here. Macthune produced two smaller photos. The guy with the dark shades is Mac Bono, a convicted murderer with strong mob ties in New Orleans. The guy in the suit is Gary Perini, another mafia thug who works for the Solari family. Bono and Perini arrived in Memphis last night. They didn't come here to eat barbecued ribs. He paused for dramatic effect. The kid's in serious danger, Your Honor. The family home is a house trailer in North Memphis, in a place called Tucker Wheel Estates. I'm very familiar with the place, Harry said, rubbing his eyes. About four hours ago, the trailer burned to the ground. The fire looks suspicious. We think it's intimidation. The kid has been roaming at will since Monday night. There's no father, and the mother cannot leave the younger son. It's very sad, and it's very dangerous. 
So you've been watching him? Yes, sir. His lawyer asked the hospital to provide security guards outside the brother's room. And she called me, Ord added. She is very concerned about the kid's safety and asked me to request FBI protection at the hospital. And we complied, added Macthune. We've had at least two agents near the room for the past 48 hours. These guys are killers, Your Honor, and they're taking orders from Moldano, and the kid's just roaming around, oblivious to the danger. Harry listened to them carefully. It was a well-rehearsed full-court press. By nature he was suspicious of police and their kind, but this was not a routine case. Our laws certainly provide for the child to be taken into custody after the petition is filed, he said to no one in particular. What happens to the kid if the hearing does not produce what you want, if the kid is in fact not obstructing justice? Lewis answered, We've thought about this, Your Honor, and we would never do anything to violate the secrecy of your hearings. But we have ways of getting word to these thugs that the kid knows nothing. Frankly, if he comes clean and knows nothing, the matter is closed, and Moldano's boys will lose interest in him. Why should they threaten him if he knows nothing? That makes sense, Harry said. But what do you do if the kid tells you what you want to hear? He's a marked little boy at that point, don't you think? If these guys are as dangerous as you say, then our little pal could be in serious trouble. We're making preliminary arrangements to place him in the witness protection program, all of them, Mark, his mother, and brother. Have you discussed this with his attorney? No, sir, Fink answered. The last time we were in her office, she refused to meet with us. She's been difficult, too. Let me see your petition. Fink whipped it out and handed it to him. He carefully put on his reading glasses and studied it. When he finished, he handed it back to Fink. I don't like this gentleman. I just don't like the smell of it. I've seen a million cases, and never one involving a minor and a charge of obstructing justice. I have an uneasy feeling. We're desperate, Your Honor, Lewis confessed, with a great deal of sincerity. We have to know what the kid knows, and we fear for his safety. This is all on the table. We're not hiding anything, and we're damn sure not trying to mislead you. I certainly hope not, Harry glared at them. He scribbled something on scratch paper. They waited and watched his every move. He glanced at his watch. I'll sign the order. I want the kid taken directly to the juvenile wing and placed in a cell by himself. He'll be scared to death, and I want him handled with velvet gloves. I'll personally call his lawyer later in the morning. They stood in unison and thanked him. He pointed to the door, and they left quickly, without handshakes or farewells. Chapter 21 Karen knocked lightly and entered the dark room with a basket of fruit. The card brought get-well messages from the congregation of Little Creek Baptist Church. The apples and bananas and grapes were wrapped in green cellophane and looked pretty sitting next to a rather large and expensive arrangement of colorful flowers sent by the concerned friends at Arklon Fixtures. The shades were drawn, the television was off, and when Karen closed the door to leave, none of the sways had moved. Ricky had changed positions and was now lying on his back with his feet on the pillows and his head on the blankets. He was awake, but for the last hour had been staring blankly at the ceiling without saying a word or moving an inch. This was something new. Mark and Diane sat next to each other on the fold-away bed with their feet tucked under them and whispered about such things as clothing and toys and dishes. There was fire insurance, but Diane didn't know the extent of the coverage. They spoke in hushed voices. It would be days or weeks before Ricky knew of the fire. At some point in the morning, about an hour after Reggie and Clint left, the shock of the news wore off, and Mark started thinking. It was easy to think in this dark room, because there was nothing else to do. The television could be used only when Ricky wanted it. The shades remained closed if there was a chance he was sleeping. The door was always shut. Mark had been sitting in a chair under the television eating a stale chocolate chip cookie when it occurred to him that maybe the fire was not an accident. Earlier, the man with the knife had somehow entered the trailer and found the portrait. His intent had been to wave the knife and wave the portrait and forever silence little Mark's way, and he'd been most successful. 
What if the fire was just another reminder from the man with the switchblade? Trailers were easy to burn. The neighborhood was usually quiet at four in the morning. He knew this from experience. This thought had stuck like a thick knot in his throat, and his mouth was suddenly dry. Diane didn't notice she'd been sipping coffee and patting Ricky. Mark had wrestled with it for a while, then had taken a short walk to the nurse's station where Karen showed him the morning paper. The thought was so horrible it seared itself into his mind, and after two hours of thinking about it he was convinced the fire was intentional. "'What will the insurance cover?' he asked. "'I'll have to call the agent. There are two policies, if I remember correctly. One is paid by Mr. Tucker on the trailer because he owns it, and the other is paid by us for the contents of the trailer. The monthly rent is supposed to include the premium for the insurance on the contents. I think that's how it works.' This worried Mark immensely. There were many awful memories from the divorce, and he remembered his mother's inability to testify about any of the financial affairs of the family. She knew nothing. His ex-father paid the bills and kept the checkbook and filed the tax returns. Twice in the past two years the telephone had been cut off because Diane had forgotten to pay the bills, or so she said. He suspected each time that there was no money to pay the bills. "'But what will the insurance pay for?' he asked. Furniture, clothes, kitchen utensils, I guess. That's what it usually covers. There was a knock on the door, but it did not open. They waited, then another knock. Mark opened it slightly and saw two new faces peering through the crack. Yes, he said, expecting trouble because the nurses and security guards allowed no one to get this far. He opened the door a bit wider. Looking for Diane Sway, said the nearest face. There was volume to this, and Diane started for the door. "'Who are you?' Mark asked, opening the door and walking into the hall. The two security guards were standing together to the right, and three nurses were standing together to the left, and all five appeared frozen, as if witnessing a horrible event. Mark locked eyes with Karen and knew instantly something was terribly wrong. "'Detective Nasser, Memphis P.D., this is Detective Clickman.' Nasser wore a coat and tie, and Clickman wore a black jogging suit with sparkling new Nike Air Jordans. They were both young, probably early thirties, and Mark immediately thought of the old Starsky and Hutchery runs. Diane opened the door and stood behind her son. "'Are you Diane Sway?' Nasser asked. "'I am,' she answered quickly. Nasser pulled papers from his coat pocket and handed them over Mark's head to his mother. These are from juvenile court, Miss Sway. It's a summons for a hearing at noon today. Her hands shook wildly, and the papers rattled as she tried hopelessly to make sense of this. Can I see your badges? Mark asked, rather coolly under the circumstances. They both grabbed and reached and presented their identification under Mark's nose. He studied them carefully and sneered at Nasser. Nice shoes, he said to Clickman. Nasser tried to smile. Miss Sway, the summons requires us to take Mark Sway into custody at this time. There was a heavy pause of two or three seconds as the word custody settled in. What? Diane yelled at Nasser. She dropped the papers. The what echoed down the hallway. There was more anger in her voice than fear. It's right here on the front page, Nasser said, picking up the summons. Judge's orders. You what? She yelled again, and it shot through the air like the crack of a bullwhip. You can't take my son. Diane's face was red, and her body, all hundred and fifteen pounds, was tense and coiled. Great, thought Mark, another ride in a patrol car. Then his mother yelled, You son of a bitch! And Mark tried to calm her. Mom, don't yell. Ricky can hear you. Over my dead body! She yelled at Nasser, just inches away. Clickman backed away one step, as if to say this wild woman belonged to Nasser. But Nasser was a pro. He'd arrested thousands. Look, Miss Sway, I understand how you feel, but I have my orders. Whose orders? Mom, please don't yell, Mark pleaded. Judge Harold Roosevelt signed the order about an hour ago. We're just doing our job, Miss Sway. Nothing's going to happen to Mark. We'll take care of him. What's he done? Just tell me what he's done. Diane turned to the nurses. Can somebody help me here? She pleaded and sounded so pitiful. Karen, do something, would you? Call Dr. Greenway. Don't just stand there. But Karen and the nurses just stood there. The cops had already warned them.
Nasser was still trying to smile. If you'll read these papers, Ms. Sway, you'll see that a petition's been filed in juvenile court alleging Mark here to be a delinquent because it won't cooperate with the police and FBI. And Judge Roosevelt wants to have a hearing at noon today. That's all. That's all? You asshole! You show up here with your little papers and take away my son and you say that's all? Not so loud, Mom, Mark said. He hadn't heard such language from her since the divorce. Nasser stopped trying to smile and pulled at the corners of his mustache. Clickman, for some reason, was glaring at Mark as if he were a serial killer they'd been tracking for years. There was a long pause. Diane kept both hands on Mark's shoulders. You can't have him. Finally, Clickman said his first words. Look, Miss Sway, we have no choice. We have to take your son. Go to hell, she snapped. If you take him, you whip me first. Clickman was a meathead with little finesse, and for a split second his shoulders flinched as if he would accept this challenge. Then he relaxed and smiled. It's okay, Mom. I'll go. Call Reggie and tell her to meet me at the jail. She'll probably sue these clowns by lunch and have them fired by tomorrow. The cops grinned at each other. Cute little kid. Nasser then made the very sad mistake of reaching for Mark's arm. Diane lunged and struck like a cobra. She slapped him on his left cheek and screamed, Don't touch him! Don't touch him! Nasser grabbed his face and Clickman instantly grabbed her arm. She wanted to strike again, but was suddenly spun around and somehow in the midst of this her feet and Mark's feet became tangled and they hit the floor. You son of a bitch! she kept screaming. Don't touch him! Nasser reached down for some reason and Diane kicked him on the thigh, but she was barefoot and there was little damage. Clickman was reaching down, and Mark was scrambling to get up, and Diane was kicking and swinging and yelling, Don't touch him! The nurses rushed forward, and the security guards joined in as Diane got to her feet. Mark was pulled from the fracas by Clickman. Diane was held by the two security guards. She was twisting and crying. Nasser was rubbing his face. The nurses were soothing and consoling and trying to separate everyone. The door opened, and Ricky stood in it, holding a stuffed rabbit. He stared at Mark, whose wrists were being held by Clickman. He stared at his mother, whose wrists were being held by the security guards. Everyone froze and stared at Ricky. His face was as white as the sheets. His hair stuck out in all directions. His mouth was open, but he said nothing. Then he started the low, mournful groan that only Mark had heard before. Diane yanked her wrists free and picked him up. The nurses followed her into the room, and they tucked him in the bed. They patted his arms and legs, but the groaning continued. Then the thumb went in his mouth, and he closed his eyes. Diane lay beside him in the bed and began humming Winnie the Pooh and patting his arm. "'Let's go, kid,' Clickman said. "'You gonna handcuff me?' "'No, this is not an arrest. "'Now what the hell is it?' "'Watch your language, kid. "'Kiss my ass, you big stupid jock!' Clickman stopped cold and glared down at Mark. "'Watch your mouth, kid,' Nasser warned. "'Look at your face, hot shot. I think it's turning blue. Mom cold-cocked you. <laughs> I hope she broke your teeth.' Clickman bent over and put his hands on his knees. He stared Mark directly in the eyes. "'Are you going with us, or should we drag you out of here?' Mark snorted and glared at him. "'You think I'm scared of you, don't you? Let me tell you something, meathead.' I've got a lawyer who'll have me out in ten minutes. My lawyer is so good that by this afternoon you'll be looking for another job. I'm scared to death. Now let's go. They started walking, a cop on each side of the defendant. Where are we going? Juvenile Detention Center. Is it sort of a jail? It could be, if you don't watch your smart mouth. You knocked my mother down, you know that. She'll have your job for that. She can have my job, Clickman said. It's a rotten job, because I have to deal with little punks like you. Yeah, but you can't find another one, can you? There's no demand for idiots these days. They passed a small crowd of orderlies and nurses, and suddenly Mark was a star, the center of attention. He was an innocent man being led away to the slaughter. He swaggered a bit. They turned the corner, and then he remembered the reporters. And they remembered him. A flash went off as they got to the elevators, and two of the loiterers with pencils and pads were suddenly standing next to Clickman. They waited for the elevator. "'Are you a cop?' one of them asked, staring at the glow-in-the-dark Nikes. "'No comment.' "'Hey, Mark, where are you going?' another asked, from just a few feet behind. There was another flash. "'To jail!' he said loudly, without turning around. "'Shut up, kid!' 
Nasser scolded. Clickman put a heavy arm on his shoulder. The photographer was beside them, almost to the elevator door. Nasser held up an arm to block his view. Get away, he growled. Are you under arrest, Mark? One of them yelled. No, Clickman snapped, just as the door opened. Nasser shoved Mark inside while Clickman blocked the door until it started to close. They were alone in the elevator. That was a stupid thing to say, kid. Really stupid. Clickman was shaking his head. Then arrest me. Really stupid. Is it against the law to talk to the press? Just keep your mouth shut, okay? Why don't you just beat the hell out of me, okay, meathead? I'd love to. Yeah, but you can't, right? Because I'm just a little kid and you're a big stupid cop, and if you touch me, you'll get fired and sued and all that. You knocked my mother down, meathead, and you haven't heard the last of it. Your mother slapped me, Nasser said. Good for her. You clowns have no idea what she's been through. You show up to get me and act like it's no big deal, like just because you're cops and you got this piece of paper, then my mother's supposed to get happy and send me off with a kiss? A couple of morons. Just big, dumb, meathead cops. The elevator stopped, opened, and two doctors entered. They stopped talking and looked at Mark. The door closed behind them and they continued down. Can you believe these clowns are arresting me? He asked the doctors. They frowned at Nasser and Clickman. Juvenile court offender, Nasser explained. Why couldn't the little punk just shut up? Mark nodded at Clickman. This one here with the cute shoes knocked my mother down about five minutes ago. Can you believe it? Both doctors looked at the shoes. Just shut up, Mark, Clickman said. Is your mother okay? One of the doctors asked. Oh, she's great. My little brother's in the psychiatric ward. Our trailer burned to the ground a few hours ago, and then these thugs show up and arrest me right in front of my mother. Bigfoot here knocks her to the floor. She's doing great. The doctors stared at the cops. Nasser watched his feet, and Clickman closed his eyes. The elevator stopped, and a small crowd boarded. Clickman stayed close to Mark. When all was quiet and they were moving again, Mark said loudly, My lord, you'll sue you jerks. You know that, don't you? You'll be unemployed this time tomorrow. Eight sets of eyes looked down in the corner, then up at the pained face of Detective Clickman. Silence. Just shut up, Mark. And what if I don't? You gonna rough me up like you did my mother? Throw me down? Kick me a few times? You're just another meathead cop. You know that, Clickman? Just another fat cop with a gun? Why don't you lose a few pounds? Neat rows of sweat broke out across Clickman's forehead. He caught the eyes darting at him from the crowd. The elevator was barely moving. He could have strangled Mark. Nasser was pressed into the other rear corner, and his ears were now ringing from the slap to the head. He couldn't see Mark's way, but he could certainly hear him. "'Is your mother all right?' a nurse asked. She was standing next to Mark, looking down and very concerned. "'Yeah, she's having a great day. She'd be a lot better, of course, if these cops would leave her alone. They're taking me to jail, you know that?' "'What for?' "'I don't know. They won't tell me.' I was just minding my own business, trying to console my mother because our trailer burned to the ground this morning and we lost everything we own, when they showed up with no warning, and here I am on the way to jail. How old are you? Only eleven. But that's not important to these guys. They'd arrest a four-year-old. Nasser groaned softly. Clickman kept his eyes closed. This is awful, the nurse said. You should have seen it when they had me and my mother on the floor. Happened just a few minutes ago on the psychiatric wing. It'll be on the news tonight. Watch the papers. These clowns will be fired tomorrow. Then the lawsuit. They stopped on the ground floor, and the elevator emptied. He insisted on riding in the rear seat like a real criminal. The car was an unmarked Chrysler, but he spotted it a hundred yards away in the parking lot. Nasser and Clickman were afraid to speak to him. They rode in the front seat in complete silence, hoping he might do the same. They were not so lucky. "'You forgot to read me my rights,' he said as Nasser drove as fast as possible. No response from the front seat. "'Hey, you clowns up there, you forgot to read me my rights.' No response. Nasser drove faster. "'Do you know how to read me my rights?' No response. "'Hey, meathead. Yeah, you with the shoes. Do you know how to read me my rights?' Clickman's breathing was labored, but he was determined to ignore him. Oddly, Nasser had a crooked little smile, barely noticeable under the moustache. He stopped at a red light, looked both ways, then gunned the engine. "'Listen to me, meathead, okay? I'll do it myself, okay? I have the right to remain silent. Did you catch that? And if I say anything, you clowns can use it against me in court. Get that, meathead? 
Of course, if I said anything, you dumbasses would forget it. Then there's something about the right to a lawyer. Can you help with this one, Meathead? Yo, Meathead, what's the bit about the lawyer? I've seen it on television a million times. Meathead Clickman cracked his window so he could breathe. Nasser glanced at the shoes and almost laughed. The criminal sat low in the rear seat with his legs crossed. Poor Meathead, can't even read me my rights. This car stinks, Meathead. Why don't you clean this car? It smells like cigarette smoke. I hear you like cigarette smoke, Clickman said, and felt much better about himself. Nasser giggled to help his friend. They'd taken enough crap off his brat. Mark saw a crowded parking lot next to a tall building. Patrol cars were parked in rows next to the building. Nasser turned into the lot and parked in the driveway. They rushed him through the entrance doors and down a long hallway. He had finally stopped talking. He was on their turf. Cops were everywhere. Signs directed traffic to the DUI holding tank, the jail, the visitor's room, the receiving room. Plenty of signs and rooms. They stopped at a desk with a row of closed-circuit monitors behind it, and Nasser signed some papers. Mark studied the surroundings. Clickman almost felt sorry for him. He looked even smaller. They were off again. The elevator took them to the fourth floor, and again they stopped at a desk. A sign on the wall pointed to the juvenile wing, and Mark figured he was getting close. A uniformed lady with a clipboard and a plastic tag declaring her name to be Doreen stopped them. She looked at some papers, then at the clipboard. It says here Judge Roosevelt wants Mark Sway in a private room, she said. I don't care where you put him, Nasser said. Just take him. Of course, Roosevelt wants all juveniles in private rooms. Thinks this is the Hilton. It's not. She ignored this and pointed at a piece of paper for Nasser to sign. He scribbled his name hurriedly and said, He's all yours, God help you. Clickman and Nasser left without a word. Empty your pockets, Mark, the lady said as she handed him a large metal container. He pulled out a dollar bill, some change, and a pack of gum. She counted it and wrote something on a card, which she then inserted on the end of the metal box. In a corner above the desk, two cameras captured Mark, and he could see himself on one of the dozen screens on the wall. Another lady in a uniform was stamping papers. Is this a jail? Mark asked, cutting his eyes in all directions. We call it a detention center she said. What's the difference? This seemed to irritate her. Listen, Mark, we get all kinds of smart mouths up here, okay? You'll get along much better if you keep your mouth shut. She leaned into his face with these words of warning, and her breath was stale cigarettes and black coffee. I'm sorry, he said, and his eyes watered. It suddenly hit him. He was about to be locked in a room far away from his mother, far away from Reggie. "'Follow me,' Doreen said, proud of herself for restoring a little authority to the relationship. She whisked away with a ring of keys dangling and rattling from her waist. They opened a heavy wooden door and started through a hallway with grey metal doors spaced evenly apart on both sides of the corridor. Each little room had a number beside it. Doreen stopped at number 16 and unlocked it with one of her keys. "'In here,' she said. Mark walked in slowly. The room was about twelve feet wide and twenty feet long. The lights were bright and the carpet was clean. Two bunk beds were to his right. Doreen patted the top bunk. "'You can have either bed,' she said, ever the hostess. "'Walls are cinder block and windows are non-breakable, so don't try anything.' There were two windows, one in the door and one above the lavatory, and neither was big enough to stick his head through. "'Toilets over there, stainless steel.' Can't use ceramic any more. Had a kid break one and slice his wrist with a piece of it. But that was in the old building. This place is much nicer, don't you think? It's gorgeous, Mark almost said, but he was sinking fast. He sat on the bottom bunk and rested his elbows on his knees. The carpet was pale green, the same type of commercial blend he'd been studying at the hospital. You okay, Mark? Doreen asked, without the slightest trace of sympathy. This was her job. Can I call my mother? Not yet. You can make a few calls in about an hour. Well, can you call her and just tell her I'm okay? She's worried sick. Doreen smiled and the makeup cracked around her eyes. She patted his head. Can't do it, Mark. Regulations, but she knows you're fine. My goodness, you'll be in court in a couple of hours. How long do kids stay in here? 
Not long, a few weeks occasionally, but this is sort of a holding area until the kids are processed and either sent back home or to a training school. She was rattling her keys. Listen, I have to go now. The door locks automatically when it's closed, and if it opens without my little key here, then an alarm goes off and there's big trouble. So don't get any ideas, okay, Mark? Yes, ma'am. Can I get you anything? A telephone. In just a little while, okay? Doreen closed the door behind her. There was a loud click, then silence. He stared at the doorknob for a long time. This didn't seem like jail. There were no bars on the windows. The beds and floor were clean. The cinder block walls were painted a pleasant shade of yellow. He'd seen worse in the movies. There was so much to worry about. Ricky groaning like that again. The fire, Diane slowly unraveling, cops and reporters glued to him. He didn't know where to start. He stretched on the top bunk and studied the ceiling. Where in the world was Reggie? Reggie. 